Um, there are a couple of preliminary things that I'd like to talk about just before we get started. Yes, um, thing one, um, as I was returning home from the, yesterday's hearing, I got an email that was one of these contact things for my own personal website, not something sent from the court, but somebody had gone on to my website to send a comment. And I looked at it, and I believe the words it began with was, I was an election worker in Georgia, at which point I stopped reading it. So I don't know where it came from. I don't know who sent it. I don't know what it went on to say, but I just wanted to tell people that I received this. Um, obviously, my job and our plan is to decide this case based on what took place at the hearing and not on outside emails or contacts like that, but I was just reporting it to people, so they're aware of it. Um, the second thing I wanted to raise really re related to some thoughts that uh, we had about Ms. Voyle's testimony, um, and I wanted to do something that I think as counsel knows, knows. I, I like to try to tell counsel not, I, you know, we haven't made any decisions, but sort of where our head is at, because one of the frustrations from the other side of the bench that I have, you know, my career as a lawyer is the stone-faced judge who smiles politely and, and doesn't tell you what's going on in his or her mind. And then you have no idea and you don't know how to, and you're guessing at what's of interest or importance or how they're reacting. Um, so I had three, you know, basic concern about Ms. Voyle's testimony, which was, I didn't hear any question that connected it to Mr. Clark or connected it to the time period that was involved in the case in so far as what he knew at the time or what he was considering at the time. Um, and that concerns me, um, because, first of all, if I don't get how con it's connected to the case, I wanted to find out what I'm missing. So that's you know, one question to, to do it, because if I'm missing someone, it's something I want to give you the opportunity to explain to me what I'm missing. The, so that's one of the concerns. Because, as you know, you know, made a ruling that post-January 3rd evidence would be excluded, this is not post-January 3rd. However, the point of that ruling was that we're focused on what Mr. Clark knew, relied upon, did, and, and what response to the charges that disciplinary counsel made. And that other things went on all over the country at various times and various circumstances that without any evidence connecting it up to what Mr. Clark did, it's very hard for us to say, okay, well, you know, how did this animate his decision? He didn't didn't know about it. And uh, I didn't see that connection and I didn't know whether it was coming. Um, the, the second reason it concerns me mm -hmm. is um, if, you know, I assume you'll explain to me why you believe it to be relevant, but if we're not buying it, I mean, if we're not, you know, agreeing with you on that, you know, we've scheduled this for eight days, and I want to give you a heads up of what's moving the needle or not so that you can make efficient use of your time. I'm very concerned generally about the efficient use of everyone's time. You've probably heard me in various times and just thank people for their for their time and, and committing to it. Um, and... It's a general concern that I have that we use all of our time effectively here to focus on what the you know the charges are and what the defenses are to the charges so that we can decide this case. Um, we've set aside this time, um, and I think I've indicated, look, I will consider the possibility of scheduling additional days if there's genuine testimony that's relevant to this that you know couldn't be presented in the time. But if there's testimony I'm not following the relevance of that's consuming our time, you know, that, you know, I'm going to say, look, you had your time, you presented this, this is what you decided to present. So I want to give you an opportunity to focus on what moves the needle as opposed to what might not be moving the needle. And honestly, the third thing is just sort of a personal thing that follows on my concern about people's time, which is 
I thanked Ms. Voiles yesterday for coming up here. I genuinely appreciated the fact that she, she apparently on her own nickel came here to testify. And if in fact her testimony ends up being not really relevant to what we have to decide, it really fundamentally bothers me that she was put to that inconvenience, you know, to come up and do this. You know, her testimony may be extremely relevant to a civil proceeding, you know, in, in, in Georgia or concerns about how Georgia operates and, and it may be extremely important, but if it doesn't really relate to our proceeding, I don't want to see other people put to that inconvenience, you know, so I wanted to give you that reaction and find out more generally, how are you connecting this type of thing up as you put on witnesses? With respect to Ms. Voiles, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, she testified to the Ligon Committee. Her testimony to the Ligon Committee was summarized in the Ligon Committee report that is in evidence. I believe it's R42. <clears throat> and the draft letter cites to that report. So it is directly linked to what Mr. Clark knew and what he relied on in preparation of the draft letter. So that's why it's relevant. Can I help you pause right there? Okay. Um, first of all, I don't know that R42 has been admitted. It might not be objected to, but I'm not sure it's been offered. But that's that's a separate question you could certainly offer. And I may have the exhibit number wrong. Okay. But my, it was admitted yesterday. Okay. Secondly, um, okay. Without objection. But there isn't a connection, as I understand it. There isn't evidence that, Ms., that she spoke with Mr. Clark or with the Justice Department or with anyone else. So I understand why admitting the Ligon report is relevant. But I, I'm not quite sure why, in addition, It's relevant to, I, I assume, the Ligon report involved the testimony of many witnesses. I, I, I haven't read it. And if all of them are going to come testify, what they're doing is trying that issue, not this one. Okay. So I'm not quite sure what the additional testimony adds to what was in the Ligon report. I'm perfectly willing to accept that, mm -hmm. that you know, that. If the Ligon report was referenced in Mr. Clark's letter, the report is certainly relevant to what information he had, but he didn't speak with, uh, if there's no evidence he spoke with her, what she said wasn't part of his determination, or determination is the wrong word, but, and, you know, affecting his actions in a just general way. Well, um, <clears throat> it was my thinking, Mr. Hurst, perhaps naive, perhaps wrong, that having Ms. Voiles testify under oath in person subject to cross-examination to explain what she observed would be more persuasive than the recitation of her testimony in the Ligon Committee report, which Mr. Fox uh, commented was not approved by the full committee. So I wanted to make sure that I had evidence in the record as to what her testimony was that was admissible evidence to support what's in the Ligon Committee report, and to support Mr. Clark's reliance on the Ligon Committee report in drafting the letter. That's one, and there's a second dimension of this, <clears throat> which is the absentee ballot question in Fulton County. Okay? And you heard me in opening talk about the issues surrounding absentee ballot signature verification in Fulton County. And you have seen, and it has been admitted into evidence, that the president asked Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue about absentee ballot signature verification, that Mr. Meadows wrote an email to Mr. Rosen about absentee ballot signature verification in Fulton County. You heard testimony that Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue blew that off and did not follow mm -hmm. it up. <clears throat> so... And you will hear from Mr. Wingate about his testimony that he voted against certification twice, in part, because there was no signature verification in Fulton County. And you've seen the statistics on that. So we have got a uh, continuous chain 
from a firsthand witness, Ms. Voiles, observing that something was wrong with a batch of absentee ballots that she personally examined during the hand recount in Fulton County. Then we have Wingate. Then we have the statistics. Then we have Rosen and Donahue blowing off the president's inquiries about the topic. It's a very significant topic. In large part, the uh, issue in this case is whether there was a sufficient factual basis for recommending further investigation of this election. And that chain of evidence on absentee ballots shows that very powerfully. Okay. Mr. McDougall, I understand the point you're making. I, you know, and I understood the point you were making in the in your opening argument, I thought too. Okay. The question isn't whether, and you know, I'm I'm not neither accepting nor rejecting your characterization, of blow it off. There was differing testimony about exactly that email chain. I'm, you know, I'm just I'm accepting for the sake of discussion that that's okay. what, what you're doing. Um testimony about what information came in the process to the Justice Department and the people who were looking at it, and in particular, Mr. Clark, um, about this process and how it was handled. I get it. Okay. I understand why that part is relevant. Testimony about, now let's go and prove each of these individual allegations based on the primary, you know, the witnesses who nobody spoke with at the time is your position, I guess. I mean, or at least we have no, no, we have no way of knowing whether anyone, you know, whether they spoke with the FBI or not, if they did. I mean, I assume if, if Ms. Voyles had provided information to the Justice Department, you would have elicited that. And I did not hear that testimony. So, um, but that the question is what does it add to what you already have to have people go back and say well information that he didn't know might have led to x x stuff he knew what he had but he didn't know you know the he didn't speak with ms foils i guess okay and so it's as compelling as it is it, the question is what's the marginal addition to the compelling thing to go back and i'm concerned that based on what we heard in the testimony, I mean, there could be hundreds of different things that were floating around with thousands of different people who could come in right. and do this. And in a real forum, or, you know, in a forum where that was the issue, okay? Well, you know, should we do something about the Fulton County vote, right? You would have a full dress trial of, of, you know, with a competing argument as to why these weren't significant or why it didn't change it or any number of possible arguments that are really very far afield from what we have in front of us, which is a limited part of this world. And so my concern is, okay, we need to, to I, I want to, to tell you to, tell you is the wrong word. I want to tell you where the mindset is so that you focus your attention on what will most help your client, what we need to hear, you know, and and so the the you know so the gold standard on this is stuff that Mr. Clark knew, not stuff other people would say who Mr. Clark didn't speak with. Can I put it that way? Um, I I hear uh, what the chairman is saying, but and uh, I don't know if you want me to respond to that. But what what sure, I, you, you can what respond what I would to say that. to you is that Mr. Clark cited the Ligon Committee report in his letter. And the challenge is to the factual sufficiency of the draft letter. And so I should, and it was attacked over and over and over again by Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue. And I should be able to put in evidence to show that the uh, Ligon Committee report presented legitimate, meaningful issues. And, let, and Mr. Clark obviously was aware of the Ligon Committee report because he cited it in his letter. And I've only focused on one element of that, which is the absentee ballot signature mm -hmm. verification issue, because it's connected up to the questions that the president himself was asking and asking for Mr. Clark to look into. And so I can connect Ms. Voiles all the way up to the Meadows email around the question of absentee ballots in Fulton County, which is a very significant 
uh, election issue, an election irregularity issue okay. that had been identified by Mr. Clark in reviewing the Ligon Committee report. Okay. And so I don't see how that could not be relevant to establish an adequate factual foundation to make the recommendation that he made. I, I think we're talking past each other, Mr. McDougall. I apologize if we are. Uh, and the Ligon Committee report is relevant, beyond a doubt, okay? And and I, I may have been mistaken, a number or whatever, admitting it. Make, I did recall that it was admitted. I just didn't think that was the number, but maybe I'm wrong, okay? Um, so, but I, yeah, obviously it's relevant. Everything he cited in that letter is relevant, you know, and where it goes, That's those are all absolutely relevant things. The question is whether information not known to him at the time, which is her oral testimony, Ms. Voyle's oral testimony, right, adds to the Ligon report, okay? And, and you know, that's that requires, you know, wh whether those things, you know, uh, you know, whether those things, I'm deciding this based on the evidence here, okay? Right. Honestly, I didn't, I've never read the details of all the other litigation about the election, okay? You know, you see things in the newspaper, I knew they existed. It's a big stack. It's a big yeah, it's stack. It's a big stack, mm -hmm. okay? Right. And, you know, my guess is people presented arguments about all kinds of particular things that were done wrong in this county mm -hmm. or this court or this circumstance or this whatever. And there were responses made to the arguments and courts that had responsibility for deciding and decided those cases, right? Um, and so every single one of these could be the subject of a side trial about here are other things that Mr. Clark and the Justice Department didn't know that you think are very compelling and other people think are not so compelling or they have counter arguments or they have their array of experts who will, who will explain against the other array of experts of what they're doing. And for us, is that actually helping to defend him? I understand why, why the Ligon report is relevant um, and things he reviewed are relevant. I'm not understanding why the separate independent attempt to prove these side cases, you know, assists your case. And, and uh, you know, I'm not preventing you from arguing it. I'm concerned about how we're using our time and what and, and things that you could focus your case on that are much more of top of mind of the uh, of of us in deciding it. So it, to some extent, it's up to you, you know, um, on this. But I guess I'd like to know how you're connecting it. And if the point is, well, this wasn't something anybody knew, but this is other stuff we think that make that supports the conclusion that the election was, you know, vote was wrong in some way. I'm telling you, it's hard to see how much that adds to the case from my standpoint. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll make just a couple, two short comments in response. Okay. Number one, if the Ligon Committee report, excuse me, is relevant, then by the transitive property, live testimony from Ms. Voiles uh, uh, putting into evidence is also relevant. I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. If that's the case, then every statement by every thousands of people that Mr. Clark didn't know is relevant because if he re read the final, read the report, and and um, and and the report was, you know, I don't need where it fits, but it does not follow that that because it's relevant that I've read Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, I need to read every single testimony of all the trials that went into Brown versus Topeka Board of Education. That is not true, okay? The point is, he had the information he had, and saying, here's a bunch of information he didn't have that we think justified his decision is not automatically relevant. And if it is relevant, it's at the periphery of tertiary, tertiary relevance. And the question is, okay, what's the stuff that's basically deals with the fundamental charges that we're getting as opposed to, you know, what's on the periphery and, and you know, tertiary part of it. So even if it's relevant in the sense that we'll sit and we'll watch it and we'll consider it in evidence, the question, it's a different question for you. How much does it move the needle, right? How much does it affect the types, you know, the, the defense of your case? And so 
even relevant testimony may not be super compelling. Okay. And so, as I said, my second purpose, right, is to give you an idea so that, you know, now when you're starting your case and not at the end of it, say, well, you wasted your time with all the stuff we're going to ignore, you know, and that's an overstatement. We're not going to ignore anything. We're going to decide this and, you know, and we have to do a report and a recommendation that shows our work, you know, that shows what it is we considered and, and why, why we considered it, right? I want to give you a heads up because I, you know, I know you're a good and intelligent lawyer and I'm trying to give you something, something that, that I had always wanted people deciding my cases to do saying, well, what are you thinking about? So what can I focus on to help convince you? And I, I appreciate that very much, Chair Birch. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and as I alluded to earlier, <clears throat> I thought it would be helpful to the committee to have live testimony to uh, validate uh, what the committee report says she said. And that was the reason so you could hear a live witness under oath, admissible testimony uh, to support that. And then the other thing that I would, uh, that seemed very important for our case, Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue testified over and over and over and over again that they looked into everything and there wasn't anything to any of it. That was their testimony. They said, this is not true because we've investigated this and there ain't nothing to it. All right. But they couldn't figure out Rosen and Donahue. They couldn't get their story straight about whether they looked into absentee ballot signature verification in Georgia. One minute, it was outside the scope of what they would look into at the Department of Justice. The next minute, it was inside the scope. And then at the end, it was back outside the scope, depending on what kind of pressure they felt under cross-examination. So they're flipping and flopping all over the place about that. So the testimony will be that despite the inquiries from the president, despite the testimony at the Ligon Committee report, and contrary to the testimony of Rosen and Donahue, there was no inquiry by the Department of Justice into the absentee ballot signature verification issue. And that is important for our defense, because it rebuts one of the premises asserted by those witnesses for the disciplinary council that there was no factual foundation of what Mr. Clark said. So it's rebuttal, it's relevant. Uh, again, without saying whether I agree or disagree with your characterization of the testimony, is that something we'll consider afterwards? Uh, I understand that point, okay? And I can appreciate that argument. Again, the issue is how much does it add to it having the live testimony as opposed to what you're developing as to what they did did and didn't do, which I recognize is absolutely relevant, what they yeah. did and didn't do. And, okay. no, obviously, y'all may disagree, but I, I think it's highly relevant. So would you like me to call my next witness? Mm -hmm. Mr. Fox, yeah, I, do, do you want to address this? I want to give him a chance. Oh, well, him. that's fair. Um, um. I had anticipated that we were going to discuss the adequacy of expert reports uh, uh, initially, and I was going to make a preliminary report, uh, uh, sorry, comment about that, which I think is perhaps relevant to the dialogue that uh, you and Mr. McDougall just had, which is that it seems to me that the fact that the, that the foundation for most of these experts reports, not the first one he's going to call today, because he's a lawyer, I want to come back to him, but uh, but most of the other experts uh, has to be that Mr. Clark was aware of this information uh, and relied on it uh, when in the events between December 28th and January 3. And I don't think you know, I, I don't think unless that foundation is laid uh, that this test, this testimony ought to be admitted. Now, yesterday, one of the things that I asked Mr. Clark and one of the things he declined to answer was what did he rely on? Uh, I specifically asked that question for that purpose. So it does not seem to me that this committee ought to be hearing expert testimony about um, from some rather sketchy witnesses about um, uh, supposed irregularities in the uh, 2020 election 
unless there is some way to tie that to Mr. Clark's knowledge. Uh, so that's the first point that I wanted to make. Uh, and then before we, uh, uh, maybe I should stop and let somebody address it, but I do want to say something about the scope of the uh, expert testimony and first witness before that witness uh, is in the courtroom. All right. Mr. Fox, I'll give you the same comment I gave Mr. McDougall. I mean, and he was at least providing his characterization of testimony we've had. Your description of sketchy is, you know, obviously. I don't know whether the testimony person is sketchy or testimony is sketchy or whatever. And, you know, I assume someone coming here comes with a presumption that they're going to if they take an oath, they're going to tell the truth. And, you know, so um, as far as this is concerned, I think the way I generally want to deal with these types of situations here, you know, I, you know, you saw my colloquy with Mr. Mr. McDougall. I am, I think it's fair to say skeptical that he needs to put on some of the stuff that he is talking about. But I also don't have a monopoly of wisdom. Okay? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear I also don't have a monopoly on wisdom, you know, and it's possible, and I really meant what I said to him, you know, at the beginning, maybe they can convince me this has more relevance than I'm seeing. And that was part of my reason for raising it. I think the best way to deal with this is I'm presuming that we're going to get through this hearing by the end of next week. And I'm going to allow, by and large, unless, you know, there are limits, okay? And we, you know, uh, but by and large, I'm expecting to give what they used to say in Perry Mason, you know, leeway, <laughs> um, whatever, um, you know, for Mr. Clark to present the defense he wants to present. But the point is that that there's kind of a clock running on what's what's happening in this. And if there are other things that are more to the point than stuff that like, he wants to offer, it works to his detriment. He needs to 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 focus on things that may affect us more um, or, you know, hope that we'll change our mind on this stuff. I understand. So, you know, it may help as as Mr. McDougall calls witnesses, if he, you know, makes a proffer on the connection with Mr. Clark, so we at least understand where it's going. But I don't, I'm not going to declare an absolute rule that something he believes is relevant for presenting his case on this stuff, um, you know, is going to be automatically excluded. Just, I hope that all of you take my comments to heart because you have no choice. <laughs> um, but all of you take my comments to heart, hard and try to focus on it because I'm trying to be as honest as I can about where you know what I'm looking at. Right now, is there switching to the first witness? We we had our discussion yeah. yesterday. Yeah. This morning there was a filing of about 200 pages of stuff related to witnesses. And I confess I have not committed this to memory. <laughs> um, I, I apologize. 180 pages of that was one of the witnesses' CVs. Yes, I know. One of the witnesses has a CV that, um, uh, but but you know, even if it's 20 pages, I can't say I committed the 20 pages to me memory that I you know saw on the subway coming in here today. I wasn't really yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you know, so. I can't say I've internalized it, all right? It may be helpful to have an understanding of what the witness is being called to do. Because, well, you know. The, the first witness that uh, Mr. McDougall had told me that he's going to call, told me this morning, and I have no objection to that, I'm not, uh, uh, is a lawyer named Donald Elliott. Mm -hmm. And there was an adequate um expert witness disclosure for the lawyer. So I have no objection um, on those grounds to his testimony. My concern is that he, he has two areas of expertise, one of which I'm happy to voir dire him about. But the, 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 the first area of alleged expertise is that he's going to give an opinion as to the scienter element of uh, uh, the d dishonesty uh, uh, disciplinary charges that involve dishonesty. And I don't think that's appropriate expert testimony. I don't think it's uh, appropriate for an expert to come in here. I'm not, I'm not sure about his expertise. Anyhow, he's taught professional responsibility law at a, a time or two. But but to come in here and, and uh, say this is what the 
law ought to be with respect to this, something that's scienter element of dishonesty. That's the, you know, that's like having a, uh, in, a in a contracts dispute case, having a contracts law professor come in and lecture the court on the law of contracts. But, you know, that's your job. And uh, it, it's, it's not appropriate for um, an expert testimony. The second area of expert testimony, I, I think I need to voir dire him about, but um, the, the first area I just don't think is a, is a proper subject of expert testimony. All right. Um, Mr. McDougall, do you want to address the... the yes. Uh, the, he's going to testify about what the standard for his state of mind ought to be? He, he's going to testify about whether... Uh, as a matter of the rules of professional responsibility, Mr. Clark had a sufficient basis for making the proposal that he made. He's going to testify about the effect on the legal profession if lawyers were disciplined for making confidential internal proposals that are not approved and not sent out. And he's going to testify about uh, Hold on a second, let me get my, get my notes. So these are, and that's all talked about in his uh, expert report. Now, the objection that he would give a legal opinion as a per se objection to a witness uh, is not a good objection. The rule on expert testimony does not bar legal opinion testimony, nor does it bar ultimate issue testimony. The criterion is whether it is helpful to the finder of fact. And we have a lay person on this committee, and it would be helpful to hear a Yale Law School professor explain what, what's prohibited, what's permitted, whether the uh, letter violates a rule of professional conduct, whether the, I mean, we heard a lot of testimony uh, the last two days about Mr. Clark not being in his lane. That's not charged in this case. Uh, he talked about there's no rule on that. And so there are a number of matters that were covered in the direct uh, in the case in chief of disciplinary counsel that Professor Elliott would talk about and rebut. Now, disciplinary counsel put up an expert uh, lawyer witness to give legal opinions in the bar trial of Mr. Giuliani. And so it seems that disciplinary counsel blows hot and cold on whether uh, legal opinion testimony ought to be admissible in a bar discipline case. If, it's, if he can put it in in that case, we should be able to put it in in this case. And the witnesses, Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue, testified to dozens and dozens and dozens of legal opinions about what was legally appropriate for an assistant attorney general uh, to do, say, or think. And we have to be allowed to put up uh, rebuttal evidence uh, regarding those opinions. All right. Um, I'm not going to rule again uh, on this in the abstract. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is testimony, and, you know, I. I think there is something to be said for for both the points you're making. Okay. I think there's something you said, Mr. Fox, that if he's going to get up and tell us this is what, you know, you know, the X, you know, XYZ case from the DC Court of Appeals says that that's really something lawyers tell us in briefs and we read the cases and make our decisions on it. Um, but I can't say that there's nothing he's going to provide that doesn't provide some insight into into oh. the case without hearing it. I suspect some of the stuff may not be very you know relevant to us, and some of it might be conceivably. So I'll allow his testimony, you know, not per se exclude it. Uh, right. And hear may, what he has I, to say. Do, do I just wonder, well, uh, there is case law in the District of Columbia that says it is not appropriate, and that's not what I think the judge is going to do, yeah. but uh, it is not appropriate for an expert witness to testify to all the issues. That's the Tyron Moore case, mm -hmm. the Marvel case. Um, so that, that, that is not a fair statement of the law. 
Look, I, I understand that. I mean, but part of the reason, but part of the concern about expert testimony is when you have juries, you know, and you have, and so to the question is when you have jury trial, for yes, example, yes. you know, there, there's a serious question what a jury gets told and whether they're going to get confused by this. Uh, you know, in this proceeding, I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree, Mr. McDougall, with your premise that because there's a public member of this, the public member can't properly assess the case, okay? Um, which, I, I didn't I, say that. I said and, it would be helpful. Uh, or, or that they need they need it, that type of assistance in a particular way. But, but, okay, you know, the thing is, it's as relevant to us as is relevant to us. We will issue a decision that says, here's what, you know, we consider. And if you, if we agree with your witness, we would have agreed with your brief saying the same thing. And if we disagree with your witness, then it doesn't really matter, you know. <laughs> so, and honestly, it doesn't ultimately matter so far as issues of law are concerned. At least, you know, I mean, it goes up to the board who can tell us we didn't get the law right either, you know. So there's a limited way this goes, right? You know it. You understand I me mean, we're, we're to some extent a whistle stop on that part of the process and so if the board says you know uh, hearing committee you you got the raw law completely wrong the standard for this is a and for that matter if the dc court of appeals tells the board they got the standard wrong they're the people who decide this so you, you know okay but all right may i fetch the witness go fetch <laughs> All right. And you want to call the witness? Call Ian Donald Elliott to the stand. Mr. Elliott, do you want to uh, swear or affirm? I want to swear, sir. Okay. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God? I do. All right. Could you please state your full name for the record? Edwin Donald Elliott. Junior. Thank you very much, Mr. Elliott. Please proceed, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Uh, Mr. Elliott, how are you employed? Well, at the moment, I have uh, three separate uh, part-time jobs. I'm a partner at Earth and Water Law, uh, which is a law firm here in DC. Uh, I also teach as a, an adjunct professor at Yale Law School. Uh, Yale uses the term adjunct differently than other places. It means that you were formerly tenured, but now you're doing it part time. And I'm, uh, for the last five years, been a distinguished adjunct professor uh, at the Antonin Scalia Law School in Arlington. 
All right, sir. And uh, what is your educational background? I graduated, uh, well, first I was uh, educated in public high school in Evansville, Indiana, in Southern Indiana. Uh, and because I, I did well on standardized tests, uh, Yale's uh, idea of diversity at the time was to take public high school boys from uh, Indiana if they'd uh, done well on standardized tests. So I, I got into uh, Yale. I graduated from Yale College in 1970. Uh, I had a fellowship to teach in the English department at Yale for a year. Uh, and then I went to uh, a law school and graduated in uh, 1974. And what was the law school? Yale, Yale Law School. Okay. And how'd you do in uh, academically in, in Yale Law School? Um, I did pretty well. I got an award for being first in my class at Yale. <clears throat> and uh, once you graduated from law school, what's your uh, professional background? If you could walk us through that. Well, I, I clerked for Gerhard Gazelle in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia Circuit. Um, I then clerked for... I mean, uh, the District Court or the... Court? District Court. District Court, okay. Sorry, I may have I, misspoken. I yeah, the U.S. District Court. Um, and then uh, following that, I, I clerked for uh, David Bazelon, the Chief Judge of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which was at that time the... Uh, highest court of the District of Columbia because it was before the reorganization. All right, sir. And then after the uh, D.C. Circuit clerkship for Judge Bazelon, what did you do? Uh, I went to work for a uh, law firm here in uh, D.C., a medium-sized law firm called Weaver Hawes, Symington, Martin, and Oppenheimer because I wanted to get uh, trial experience, which I did. Um, and uh, my, my uh, former mentor at uh, Yale Law School, Harry Wellington, the dean, uh, kept calling me up and inviting me to uh, join the faculty. Harry was a very wise man, and one year he said, "Don, this is the last year we're gonna we're gonna invite you." So I said, "Okay, I'll come." Um, and um, I, I joined the faculty there in uh, 1981, and I've been on the faculty ever since. Uh, are you admitted to the DC bar? Yes, I am. And since when? Uh, November of 1975. Have you ever worked in government? Yes, uh, I was uh, nominated by President George Herbert Walker Bush and confirmed unanimously by the United States Senate to be the general counsel and assistant administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1989. And how long did you serve in that position? Just about two years. My my wife had been admitted to Yale Medical School and she wanted to go back to New Haven. And uh, in brief, in brief, can you describe the role of the general counsel of the EPA while you were there? Well, it's the uh, uh, it's the chief legal officer of the uh, of the of the agency, and so it uh, it among other things. Uh, Councils the various uh, programs on uh, what uh, they are uh, thinking about doing. Uh, it also works with the Department of Justice to defend the agency uh, in court. We had 250 lawyers when I was when I was there. Um, All right, sir. And while you were in government, who was the most senior government official to whom you gave? legal advice. Well, before we before we move on to that, uh, let me uh, go back and add one thing that may be relevant, Please. and that is when I was general counsel of EPA, I was also the deputy designated ethics official. So I, I counseled uh, uh, a number of people within within the agency on, on ethical issues, including working with the uh, Office of Government Ethics in the White House on some difficult problems, which we can get into if you, uh, if you right. want. Uh, so it's fair to say that while you were in government, uh, you worked on professional responsibility, ethics issues pertaining to lawyers in government service? Yes, and I had some difficult ones that uh, came before me. All right, sir. Now, uh, <clears throat> the question that I asked a minute ago, uh, who, was the, who or what was the most senior government official to whom you gave legal advice during your tenure? Well, in my experience, um, who is uh, most senior changes from administration to administration. And the administration in which I served uh, designated the White House counsel, C. Boyden Gray, who recently died, 
uh, as the coordinator of all of the domestic agencies through the general councils. So I was uh, I was the uh, really essentially the White House contact at at the EPA when I was there, but uh, uh, through Boyden and uh, uh, and through him uh, to the president, a number of pieces of advice that I gave to Boyden. He said, "Well, I'll, I'll talk to the president about that." All right. Well, that's uh... and also the EPA administrator, Bill, William Riley. But I would consider uh, during that administration, I would consider the White House counsel to have been superior to uh, to the EPA administrator. However, you slice it pretty tall. Huh? All right, sir. <clears throat> uh, in your private practice career, have you had responsibility for dealing with professional responsibility or ethics issues? Yes, um, I've been a, a partner in uh, in four law firms. I developed a uh, specialty in in uh, creating uh, environmental departments at law firms that didn't didn't have them. And in the last two law firms that I was uh, was with, uh, one was the uh, D.C. office of a New York law firm called Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. Uh, and then uh, after Wilkie. Uh, I was at Covington and Burling, which is the largest law firm in uh, in, in in DC. Um, and in both of those, I served on the ethics committee, which dealt primarily with conflicts issues uh, in a big law firm, but also with other uh, issues as they came up. Uh, what uh, going back to your current work as a law professor? Uh, what subjects do you teach? Well, I teach a. Uh, a variety of subjects. Uh, I'm kind of a, a dilettante in the sense that I'm interested in the relationship between various areas of law as opposed to narrowly specialized. So I've actually taught more different courses than anybody else in the history of the Yale Law School. Um, but I, I was originally hired to teach uh, in the civil procedure area and administrative law. I taught for many years a course that I invented called Complex Civil Litigation about complex cases. And in that, in that, uh, in that capacity, uh, and I've taught that course off and on. Uh, I, the last time I taught it was in 2021 at Scalia Law School, and in that court, in that course, we would confront a number uh, of uh, of ethical issues. Um, Yale uh, uh, has what they call the pervasive method of teaching legal ethics, uh, and that is you're supposed to teach legal ethical issues uh, in all of the classes. Um, but certain classes are certified as, as meeting the ABA's requirement. And my complex civil litigation course was certified as meeting that requirement. Um, I'll teach a course uh, in the fall, uh, in the coming fall at Yale uh, on uh, torts and regulation, which is a new course putting the two together. And that will also be certified as meeting the professional responsibility requirement. Although Yale has uh, broadened it somewhat to call it the uh, professional identity uh, requirements so that we're supposed to teach uh, issues of uh, lawyers' duties that go beyond those in the in the rules of professional responsibility. Are there, uh, Professor, are there any particular topics in the law on which you consider yourself an expert among lawyers? Um, I am particularly an expert in uh, in government. I teach administrative law. I teach uh, energy and environmental law. Those are the substantive uh, areas that I've tended to concentrate on. But as I've said, it, it, you know, it varies from year to year. And I've taught, a, I've taught a variety of different subjects. All right, sir. Have you written any books in your field? I've been the author or co-author, uh, mostly co-author of eight chapters in, in nine books. And uh, the topics covered in those chapters? Our, our legal topics, um, mostly about how government works and how it should work better. That's been my primary interest. All right, sir. And uh, have you written or published any law review articles? A few. Uh, and well, before you go in any further, could you explain to the committee uh, what a law review article is? Well, uh, there's a great line by uh, Dean Wigmore, who is the dean at uh, Northwestern, who said, uh, Law review articles are not written to be read, they're written to be written. Um, and uh, these are typically student edited journals about technical legal topics. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's, that's basically it. There are some now, now some faculty edited journals, uh, but uh, 
that's what a law review is. And is that the predominant method for publishing legal scholarship? Yes. All right, sir. Uh, well, in recent years, I've decided to write more in popular publications and less in law reviews. Mm -hmm. But I, I lost count with how many uh, law review articles uh, I'd written at about 70. And, uh, you know, it's higher than that now. All right, sir. You made reference to uh, administrative law. Right. Uh, what is that? Well, the best definition I know of it is one that they use in England, and that is it's the law that governs the actions of government officials. A lot of it in the U.S. focuses on the relationship between courts and administrative agencies. But my work has tended um, under one, one, of my, uh, one of my mentors at Yale was a fellow named Jerry Mishaw, who pointed out that we weren't spending enough time on the uh, what he called internal administrative law. That's how, how things work within the government. And following his example, a lot of my work has been focused on, on that aspect, less so on judicial review, but I've written about both. Are there any uh, particular works by scholars of administrative law that you believe have relevance to this case? Yes, I, I do. Um, one of the leading scholars of, uh, well, he was really a polymath. So he was an expert on a lot of things, was a fellow named Herbert Simon, who was at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and uh, he wrote a, a very, very famous and important book called uh, Administrative Behavior. And that was first published in 1947. It, it had several other subsequent issues. He ultimately won the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics. Um, I believe that was in 1976, but don't hold me to that. It could have been a year or two either, either way. But Herbert Simon's basic insight was that we all have limited cognitive capacity, which is what he called bounded rationality. This was a really revolutionary idea in economics. Um, and his, his notion was that as the world had gotten more complicated, it was impossible for people to uh, know everything about an area. So there's no person, certainly not me, that's read all of the environmental laws. But Herbert Simon's idea, and it was really revolutionary, was that in, uh, in, in agencies, that administrative agencies and bureaucracy generally is uh, a way of overcoming the limits of any individual's uh, expertise by combining a bunch of people into an organization. Uh, and uh, so there's an intelligence in the organization that's greater, according to him, than that in any single individual. The reason that I see that as being highly relevant to this case um, is that uh, uh, it, it indicates, which was certainly my experience in government and in teaching administrative law for 40 years, that it's very important to have a number of people consulting on various decisions who have different perspectives uh, because they know they know different things. And just to give an example, um, in this in this case, based on the testimony, and I have listened to the testimony on the excuse me, getting into the test, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. We'll get to Fair that later. Fair point. Uh, Based on your uh, background, education, training, and experience, are you familiar with questions of professional responsibility as they arise in the context of senior government lawyers giving advice to senior leadership of federal agencies? Yes. Have you wrestled with analogous questions as a law professor or in private practice? Yes, in both. Uh, it's one of the subjects that I... I teach, I teach in particular in complex civil litigation, what kind of factual support uh, a lawyer has to have uh, in order to m make certain allegations, particularly in litigation. And when I do that, um, I do that based on the DC rules of professional responsibility. Because that's, I'm admitted in DC and those are the ones that I understand the best. When you were in government service, Professor, uh, was it your understanding that your internal deliberations about legal positions with agency leadership or DOJ lawyers 
were confidential and privileged. Yes, that was my understanding. And uh, do you have an appreciation for the importance of those privileges in the uh, in carrying out those kinds of internal deliberations? Yes, I think it's very important that there be a free Again, exchange of ideas. He's, um, he's going to object government. that this is the testimony. But my question for you is you're familiar with that. Yes, I am. Okay, I have a lot of experience with that. And uh, it was very important to me when I was at EPA to try to create a culture in the general counsel's office uh, in which there was a, a free exchange of ideas. Uh, when uh, lawyers used to come in to brief me, um, they would have already met and reached a consensus view. And I objected to that and insisted that I wanted to hear the back and forth and the various uh, opinions, not just a single consensus view. Why? Because I think sometimes uh, there is group think in any organization and people are used to doing what they've been doing. Uh, and it was important to, to me, I remember uh, my administrator, uh, Bill Riley, always used to say to us, well, Don, we are reformers. And I we think are what? We are reformers. We're reforming things. And I think that's one of the rules of political appointees is to uh, question the conventional wisdom that develops in any uh, organization, because organizations tend to develop, uh, and there, there are lots of great books about this, about how, how organizations uh, develop a consensus view, and that's not necessarily the best view or the only view. So I tried to encourage the free exchange of ideas so that the agency leadership could uh, could could decide. I think we're again getting in substance testimony. I, I'll move on, Mr. Hirsch. Okay. Uh, okay. I, uh, are you going to move his his uh, very short as an expert? Okay. Very shortly. Oh. Uh, have you reviewed the draft letter that this case revolves around? Yes. Um, I've that, reviewed that's it. all you need to say right now. Well, I want to say I've reviewed both versions of it. Okay. And have you reviewed the specification of charges in this case? Yes, I have. Now, before I tender you as an expert, do you happen to know Mr. Clark? Yes, but only a little bit. Um, for example, I don't. I don't know whether he's married or if he has kids or anything like that. Should I describe how I know him? If you would. Yeah, in the in the 1990s, his law firm and my law firm uh, were co-counsel in, in an environmental case. And I was a young partner and, and Jeff was at that time uh, an associate at Kirkland and Ellis. Um, and then I didn't see him for many, many years uh, when he was the head of the uh, uh, Environment and Natural Resources uh, Department at uh, at the Department of Justice. He gave a lecture at Scalia Law School that I attended, and then we exchanged pleasantries thereafter. And when I heard about this uh, case, um, I was uh, concerned, and I called him up, and we had lunch once. Uh, are you being compensated? Well, let me ask you this. Does your relationship with Mr. Clark, as you've described it, affect your opinion or testimony in this case? No. Are you being compensated for your testimony? No, I'm doing it pro bono. And why is that? Because I'm very concerned that a precedent in this case could, could really adversely affect uh, the free exchange of ideas within government, which I think is very important based on my experience and also my, my academic uh, writing. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Hirsch, I tender... Professor E. Donald Elliott as an expert on professional responsibility in government. Mr. Fox? No, may I go off? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Elliott, my name is Hamilton Fox. Um, the You've taught professional responsibility, I believe, at the early part of your career at Yale Law School. Is that fair? Yes, but I taught it most recently in 2021. Okay. Where, and was that at Scalia Law School? That was. Yeah. And um, do you keep, uh, you, you are primarily an environmental lawyer, is that correct? Correct. All right. And your government service was limited to two years in 1989 and 1991, correct? Correct. Um, do you keep abreast of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals 
opinions and ethics? I try to, yes. I consult the uh, website periodically and particularly in areas of my uh, professional interest, um, I, I do. And I uh, also look at some of the uh, uh, opinions by the uh, by the ABA. I know they're not binding, but I but I, I try to follow primarily DC, but also in other other developed jurisdictions. What would you say is the leading opinion in the District of Columbia on Rule Eight Point Four C? I think that um, opinion three twenty three is well, I, I'm particular sorry, opinion. I, I didn't mean ethics opinion. I meant the uh, DC Court of Appeals opinion. I'm not familiar with the DC Court of Appeals opinion on eight point four. Any opinion? Any. I've, I've looked primarily at the advisory opinions by the D.C. Bar, which, as you know, build on and cite the D.C. the D.C. Court of Appeals opinions, but I haven't followed the D.C. Court of Appeals. So you are not aware of what the D.C. Court of Appeals has said about the scienter element for Rule 8, 8.4c, correct? That is correct. Um. I would, could, I, could I add something to that answer? Um, I, I believe, though, that the, the rule itself, as, as cited in my uh, expert uh, report, uh, requires that uh, it has to be knowingly false. I think that's the text of the rule. Actually, Mr. Elliott, you didn't cite Rule 8.4c in your expert report, did you? I would stand corrected. You cited Rule 3.3a which concerned knowingly making a false statement to a tribunal, correct? Correct. And you cited Rule 8.4c, which concerned, uh, with, or sorry, you did not cite Rule 8.4c, correct? I believe that I did, but you, I could stand corrected. Are, I, you, are you aware of what the Court of Appeals has said about the concept of reckless dishonesty in the context of Rule 8.4c? I'm familiar with the concept, but not the DC, not the DC Court of Appeals opinion. Now, uh, the opinions that you are going to give with respect to the ethical obligations of a lawyer in government service, um, what is the legal basis for those opinions? I, I know you have opinions. We have, I have opinions. Sure. But what about, what's the legal basis? Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's three things. Uh, primarily, it's the text of the DC rules of professional responsibility. Uh, secondly, it's the opinions that have been issued construing the rules. And thirdly, it's the uh, a practice that I've seen, not just in the two years I was in government, but in the 40 plus years that I've practiced before multiple agencies, not just the EPA, but, but many others as well. Um, but is there, is, can you cite me Articles, texts, anything that bear on that? Yes, uh, there's a, a very recent article that I found very interesting by uh, uh, Renee Jefferson, uh, a law professor uh, who just really teaches legal ethics in the Yale Law Journal, uh, calling upon uh, uh, the development of a change in law that would subject the statements by lawyers about uh, fraud in elections to a higher standard. And I found that very interesting because she admits in that 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 would be a change in the, in the, in, in the law uh, and that that's not the current law. So I find that a very interesting uh, article. With, with her, and, and that's with respect to lawyers in government. Uh, it applies to lawyers in government, but also applies to other lawyers. She she argues that the standards that apply to uh, representations to a court should also apply to representations that lawyers make regarding the subject uh, of uh, potential fraud in elections to the public uh, as well as to courts. I want to hand you a copy of your expert report, which has been marked as uh, response 331. I, I don't have the ability to put this up. I think Mr. McDougal does, but I, I stay here. But I am only going to ask him a, a question, which I don't necessarily think I need to show the report to you. And the question is, 
where in this report he cites Rule 8.4C. I believe that I am referring to 8.4 in paragraphs 5, 6, 7, and 8. Do you um, cite it, sir? But, may I finish, sir? Uh, no. The question I asked you is where did you cite it? I did I'll, not, I'll allow him to finish his answer, uh, Mr. Fox. I did not cite it. But, for example, um, uh, in paragraph 8, uh, I refer to a uh, comparison to rule point four point one, uh, by comparison to uh, the standards in eight point four. So I should have cited eight point four, but I was referring to the uh, specification of charges in eight point four throughout my opinion. All right, I object to this uh, witness's testimony. He is not an expert in the um, ethics law of the District of Columbia. He should not be permitted to testify on that subject. Uh, which I don't think is a proper subject of expert testimony in any case. And secondly, uh, he's simply giving his own opinions with respect to uh, what a lawyer to government service should do. That has no, you know, aside from spending two years at the EPA 30 years ago, that has nothing, What uh, he has no expertise in that area and, it, and should not be allowed to give an opinion on it. Mr. McTougal. Professor Elliott has impeccable qualifications to testify as an expert on the subjects for which he is being offered. He's described them in detail. He's an eminent academic. He's a professor at either the number one or number two law school in the country. And uh, he's done a very careful analysis and all these objections go to weight, not admissibility. Um. I will treat these as objections going to the weight and allow his testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor, referring to the draft letter, do you think that it was a good idea to send that letter? No. Um, I would have uh, sided with uh, Donahue and Rosen and uh, my former student, Steve Engel, uh, in opposing sending the letter. All right, sir. Uh, in light of that, uh, and in light of the fact you're not being compensated, why are you willing to testify as an expert for Mr. Clark in this case? Because I think it's important that we have the free and open exchange of ideas within agencies. I think uh, about many uh, ideas that uh, are ultimately not accepted, but I think that uh, even, you know, the, one of the traditions in the United States is that even, even false ideas are, are protected when they, when they contribute to the debate. And I heard many things uh, when I was in government or subsequently, which uh, challenged the conventional wisdom uh, and were not part of the agency's consensus view. But the, uh, but the agency's uh, approaches, and I could give you some examples, but I won't belabor it unless you ask for it, but there are uh, numerous instances in which ideas that were thought crazy at one time uh, actually become accepted later. So the reason I volunteered to testify is that I'm concerned that if Jeff Clark is... Uh, is disciplined in this matter, particularly if he's disbarred, um, that would have really a devastating effect on uh, the kind of dialogue that needs to take place inside agencies. And lawyers would say, well, I can't discuss that with you, sir, because I don't know that I have the, the facts to back it up. And I, I do believe that the rules say that in counseling, which is a lot of what we do, 
Uh, we are supposed to take the factual claims of clients uh, as uh, at face value. And we only need to have uh, support so that the allegations are not frivolous, which is not necessarily the same as true. But if they're not frivolous, uh, that applies when we get involved in making representations to a court. And I think that by analogy, it should apply uh, if the Department of Justice uh, had actually sent the letter to uh, uh, to 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 the state. Um, I think that it's it's a fair analogy to say that the same standard that applies to a representation to a court. So I would come out differently if the letter had actually been sent, I think, um, depending on whether or not it was supported. But I think discussing it inside the government uh, and and uh, and I could get into details, but I, I think that Jeff uh, welcomed that kind of discussion from his colleagues. And ultimately the issue was, was elevated for the president to decide. And in my view, that's how the system is supposed to work. And I can cite numerous examples in my experience where there were disagreements among lawyers. Uh, Bill Barr and I had a, had a yeah. disagreement. Tell that story. All right. Well, uh, in about, uh, well, I have to go back a little bit. Um, uh, Representative Dingell had subpoenaed various documents from my administrator, Bill, Bill Riley. And I knew that- Let me interrupt you uh, and explain to the committee who Representative Dingell was. Well, he was a, a, a prominent member of Congress from Michigan who had particular expertise uh, in, in environmental matters because of the automobile industry. He died a few years ago. He had a, a really excellent uh, career uh, staffer, and they were uh, they were uh, all over us at uh, at EPA. And he brought down the um, the previous administrator of, uh, of of EPA, then named Ann, Ann Burford, and later Ann Gorsuch, by subpoenaing those documents. And my administrator told me that um, Dingle had said to him, "If if he." Riley didn't didn't do what Mingle wanted him to do on some matter that he could bring him down to. And um, so I had been on the job for only a couple of weeks. And uh, Bill Barr at that time was head of the Office of Legal Counsel. And uh, he he objected, uh, the Office of Legal Counsel objected to our producing the documents. And uh, Bill and I ended up in the uh, in the West Wing of the White House to uh, argue that out in front of uh, in front of Boyd and Gray, um, and uh, Boyd ruled against me on every single one of the legal issues, as I knew he would. Um, and uh, then at the end of the meeting, uh, just as we were breaking up, I, I said, "Well, why don't we deliver these documents to our lawyer, Mr. Barr, and let him negotiate with the Congress?" And a kind of a wry smile spread across Boyden's face because he realized what I was doing. And he said, yeah, we can do that. Um, and uh, uh, so we I drafted a letter for the administrator saying we're delivering all these documents to our lawyer and this discusses with Mr. Park. Well, this became uh, actually the bane of his existence. Um, and uh, over a year, he gradually gave up every single one of the documents in, in question. So I lost the legal argument, but I, I won the issue. Professor Elliott, in your career in and out of government, have you ever been in a situation where you or a colleague prepared a draft document, such as a letter, a memo, a brief, or something like that, uh, that was the subject of internal debate and disagreement? Pretty much always. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, you By the way, could, I, could I add something to that? Oh, of course. So um, I actually created a, a two uh, institutions uh, to make sure that um, we had all of the issues raised in front of us. The career staff at EPA had a had a pretty consistent view, and. Uh, um, the White House wanted me to uh, take a very conservative lawyer who now practices in Washington, writes a lot for the 
Wall Street Journal named David Rivkin as my deputy. And I, I said to him, look, I can't really bring him in as a deputy. If I do, there'll be kind of a rebellion by the staff. Mr. Chairman, this testimony, as interesting as it may be, has nothing whatsoever to do with issues in this case. It does to any of this. Um, it goes to resolving disagreements among lawyers in government. I, okay. I'll certainly allow some of it, you know, Mr. To also give you sort of some back, you know, some background. I mean, look, I, I am perfectly willing to accept that there are different disagreements among lawyers in government. I, as you probably know, served in government myself. Um, Actually, I did not. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, maybe take a point off of the, when you told, said I was sharp the other day, <laughs> take a point off of it. Okay. Yeah. But in any event, so, you know, I, I recognize there are predecisional things. I recognize there's a process of discussion in government. And so, I don't know, this is, you know, I express some skepticism about some of your things, some of the things you're, you're focusing a lot of attention on things that I don't know are really disputed. I don't know that Mr. Fox disputes that there are discussions in government and that people may disagree over policy and that there are pre-decisional things that are done in government before decisions are made. So I don't know whether that's an issue of dispute in this case. So it's more of a question of, okay, you know, does it do it? I, you know, uh, but that, that's kind of my reaction. Mr. Fox, is that truly in dispute that, that, oh. okay. no, that, that government lawyers should be free to disagree with each other on policy issues? No. Okay. And, and that they have discussions between themselves before final decisions are made. And some people may disagree with, with uh, each other and they may ultimately disagree with the final decision as part of that process. Is that something in dispute? No. Okay. Well, we, we go back to uh, the point I made in opening about crawfish number one. Well, if that's his position, why are we here? All right. Mr. McDougall, here's another insight. Okay. Several times during this case, you have cited um, the first sentence of a paragraph in a brief that Mr. Fox filed in October 2022. OK, and I don't have the brief in front of me, but the the sentence was along the line of if, if all he did was make a suggestion, we wouldn't be here. OK, I mean, I'm completely paraphrasing and probably butchering the sentence, but that's the basic gist. Of, you know, you just send it. Be, and then I think the second sentence of the paragraph says it isn't an ethical violation to propose a bad idea. OK, then there's the remainder of the paragraph in which Mr. Fox stated why he thought that wasn't this case, okay? Why he thought that he was doing it. Now, I anticipate during our closing argument, we're gonna explore that, but every time you do this, you cite the first sentence of the paragraph and you don't confront the rest of the paragraph in which he purported to state his argument, okay? I understand you disagree with the rest of the paragraph too, but telling me that that you agree with him that we wouldn't be here if all he did was make a suggestion doesn't respond to the rest. But our focus is on the whole of the argument and, and whether you think he changed positions or not, which we can debate or whatever over the course of two years in connection with the case, okay? Certainly in October, 2022, I understood the whole paragraph was relevant, okay? With, was where Mr. Fox was stating it. And honestly, I had focused on that paragraph before you even brought, you know, repeatedly to her the attention. So I, I I don't want to, you know, the fact that some things are not disputed doesn't mean there aren't disputes that are worth addressing. That's what I'm trying to to focus you on. And and putting a lot of time and testimony to reinforce what isn't disputed doesn't, you know, is doesn't deal with that problem. Okay. Mr. Chair. Could, could I respectfully clarify my previous answer? I was trying to make a different point, and that is that in my experience, both inside and outside government, uh, a consensus view tends to develop within the career staff particularly. And uh, it's very hard to uh, get other 
points of view raised. And I took two measures when I was at EPA to make sure that we, we heard the other side. I was also the liaison to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, the so-called regulatory czar in, in the White House. And I kept going over to the White House and hearing arguments uh, at Orira that I hadn't heard within the general counsel's office. And I was very upset about that uh, with my staff. And I, I told them that I, I needed to hear the other side of things. If I was gonna hear it at the White House, I needed to hear it here first. And I set up two mechanisms, which I won't describe, to make sure that I heard both sides of things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I was in that situation, somewhat like what I think the president was in, in this situation, of wanting to hear both sides so he could make a decision. Okay. All right. Um, look, the, the nature of the objection was that the testimony was more anecdotal than directed to, to you know, uh, whatever. I, I'll allow you to offer the witness's testimony in the in the form that it comes, you know. And so, in that sense, I'm overruling the objection, but it would kind of help to focus okay. a little bit. Uh, and I'll try to keep it shorter, Mr. Chair. No, I, I appreciate it. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, pe people speak in their own way. And I appreciate that some people will yeah. describe things through examples as opposed to. to that's that's setting, me. That's how I think that way. So, And and he is a law professor. Yeah. So well, I, I, I was I, resisting the temptation. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh. My, my ex-wife once said I speak in 55 minute sound bites. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> when uh, lawyers advising a senior official disagree amongst each other, um, the method of resolving the disagreement is what? Well, it's generally to uh, elevate it to a to a higher level. Does a lawyer uh, in that situation have an ethical obligation in the advice that they give to the decision maker? Yes, I think they have an ethical obligation. For purposes of the bar rules, Professor, uh, was Mr. Clark's role here in confidential internal deliberations different or the same than that of a lawyer appearing in court? I think it was. Uh, I think it was different. I think we'd have a different case if they had actually sent the letter. And and how is it different? Well, I think that uh, we want to have free and open debate within the within the executive branch, and that's why we've created various privileges. And I think it would be extremely unfortunate if. Uh, uh, the standards of dishonesty applied to uh, debates among lawyers within the government. Yeah, yeah, lots of lots of arguments I heard in government that turned out not to be factually supported. In the end. In the end, that's right. Uh, now, if a lawyer sincerely believed there was something wrong with the election, uh, at the time, even if it later proved to be wrong, what would their duty be? Well, uh, could you rephrase the question or restate yeah. it? Yes, sir. I, I'm not sure I understand it. I apologize for asking the poor question. If a lawyer sincerely believed there was something wrong with the election, what would their duty be? I think they would have a duty to um, investigate to the point that they determined that it was not a frivolous concern. I don't think lawyers within government can uh, uh, can can uh, uh, simply because they are personally concerned about something. I, I do think they have a, an obligation of doing a certain amount of due diligence, but I believe that the uh, professional rules in the commentary state the mere fact that a lawyer thinks that a uh, a position is not going to ultimately prevail in court. Does not make it does not make it frivolous. The other provision, this is in comment two to uh, rule three point one, um, 
says that the mere fact, and this is one of the things I teach about quite a lot because it comes up in, in complex litigation, says specifically the fact that um, further discovery is necessary. Discovery process is the exchange of information in a, in a court case. That further investigation and discovery is necessary to support something doesn't mean that it's frivolous. So neither the fact that you think you may lose the argument nor the fact that there are strong arguments on the other side prevents you from raising an issue with a court. Um, and that's a higher standard than I believe applies with to deliberations within 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 the government. But I I, I think that um, it was perfectly appropriate to raise these issues and to uh, uh, as long as there was some some support for them. All right, sir. Uh, to your knowledge, excuse me a second, Mr. McDougal. About how much longer do you have with with uh, Mr. Elliot? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say maybe fifteen minutes, fifteen to twenty. You want to okay. take a break? Yeah, I'd like to take. Okay. A break. Um, why don't we take a break for fifteen minutes and we'll conclude? It's very good. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, Eleven fifteen.
Okay, are we ready to go back on YouTube? All right. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. McDougall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Professor Elliott, uh, to your knowledge and in your experience as a lawyer of 50 years, have you ever heard of a bar discipline case being brought Let against a lawyer? Leading nature, leading nature of these questions. Well, first of all, he hasn't finished the question. Okay. And, and secondly, I think he's trying to give the conditions of the question he's asking. So uh, I, I don't know how he's, it's possible for him to answer the question exactly, but I'll let him finish the question and then decide whether it's, it's unduly okay. Um To your knowledge and in your experience as a lawyer for 50 years, have you ever heard of a bar discipline case being brought against a lawyer who prepared a draft document that was not approved and was never sent out or recommended a position that was not adopted? Objection to the incomplete and misleading hypothetical. Um, look, I agree that's an incomplete hypothetical. It's also not a perfectly worded question because people can be subject to discipline who at some point wrote a memo. Okay, so your, your question didn't say that where the discipline was limited to writing a memo, right? Um, I'll rephrase the question. Um, go ahead. To your knowledge and in your experience as a lawyer for 50 years, have you ever heard of a bar discipline case being brought against a lawyer for attempted dishonesty? over positions taken in a draft document that was not approved and was never sent out. Objection to incomplete yeah. hypothetical. Mr. McDougall, I think you need the word solely in that question. Solely? Yes. Um, please consider the question amended by addition of the word solely. Okay. That, that solely for the positions taken, and then that's where the word would go. No, I have not. Professor Elliott, having read the letter and the charges, do you have an opinion on whether there was sufficient factual support for Mr. Clark to make the proposal that he did? Objection. What's the basis of the objection? He, this is not in, but part of his expertise, whether, uh, I mean, um, He's asking for a factual opinion on whether he had uh, an opinion on whether he has factual support. It's, it's not anywhere within the expertise that this gentleman's to put up for. Can you rephrase this one too, Mr. McDougal? Because he, Mr. Fox is right about the way the question is asked. It seems to be asking the witness whether whether Mr. Clark had factual support, which is a fact issue that the witness doesn't, you know, he doesn't know exactly what facts Mr. Clark has. All he can do is do it. As I understand it, what you're driving at is whether the factual support that he observed based on the testimony that he's seen today, what's the consequence of it? Whether that support is, is sufficient under some other standard or whatever is what I understand you're driving. Let me, uh, let me back up a little bit. Okay. Mr. Professor Elliott, have you watched the this hearing? Yes, except for a few moments where I had technical difficulties for five or 10 minutes, but I've watched the two previous days in the fall. <clears throat> and uh, having done that, and having read the letter, the draft letter and the charges, and in light of your prior testimony about the standards applicable uh, to internal deliberations. Do you have an opinion on whether Mr. Clark had sufficient factual support for the proposal that he made? I do. What is that opinion? My opinion is that the two sources that were cited in the letter are sufficient to render his activity 
in suggesting it for discussion within the Department of Justice appropriate. And I do not think that the fact that there was a quote, Department of Justice consensus otherwise changes that, nor do I think that the fact that there was contrary evidence changes that. Having watched the testimony of Mr. Donahue and of Mr. Rosen, does any of their testimony cause you to change that thing? No, quite the contrary. I think that uh, they both testified that the inquiry by the Department of Justice had been quite limited. And Jeff Clark in the Civil Division, looking at the allegations in the pending cases, had access to a different set of information than the information that Mr. Donahoe was relying upon. And I understand that he and his conclusions were what was relayed to Mr. Rosen and, and Mr. Barr. If I can go further, I also believe that Mr. Barr's statements uh, in the AP interview uh, were supportive of what Mr. Clark was doing. All right. He, um, I want to I yeah, show you an okay. exhibit. And I'm now putting on the screen uh, Respondents Exhibit R186. <clears throat> Can you uh, tell us what R186 is? It is the uh, USA Today story dated December 1, 2020, that purports to quote, then Attorney General Barr. And is that the statement uh, that you were just referring to, uh, Mr. Barr? Yes. Um, and you were uh, about to say that this, Mr. Barr's statement <clears throat> was actually supportive of Mr. Clark's proposal in some way? Yes, I believe that Mr. Barr was stating the view that he got from Mr. Donahoe and Mr. Rosen, that it was not the role of the Department of Justice to investigate all issues of election irregularities, uh, and that Mr. Barr uh, specifically called for uh, an investigation by, by states. He said that the only appropriate remedy was uh, uh, full-scale audits by the by the states, not just relying on individual complaints. So I, I believe that the statements by Mr. Barr, which were already hearsay in this article, but I think they were taken out of context and cherry-picked. Mr. Chair, I move to strike this testimony. There's nothing in the expert report about this. There's nothing in the expert report that says he was going to offer opinions as to whether there was a truthful basis for Mr. Um, uh, Clark's statements. Uh, this is all completely outside of the report. We get testimony uh, during the case in chief from Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue about the inappropriateness of Mr. Clark's proposal based on the public statements that Attorney General Barr made, and the witness is responding to that. I understand that, but that's not the objection. So, so can you meet his objection that it wasn't a subject that was part of the report? It goes to the propriety of the draft letter, which is a topic of the report. Can I add something, Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair, can I object to this witness yeah. on the law? Yeah. I, I, Mr. Elliott, please, please refrain. I, you know, I, I want to keep roles as witnesses and, and advocates separate. Then, can I have a moment to confer with Mr. McDougall? It's not appropriate for a witness to confer with all those on the stand, but counsel. Yeah. I would agree with that. Okay. Um, Look, I will allow it um, 
I am concerned about it, but the reason I'm willing to allow it is that I don't think, while it may not be part of his report, and I have to be honest, I haven't committed his report to memory, so it's difficult for me to make a, you know, so I take it face value what Mr. Fox is saying. I'm not saying he's mistaken. It's just, you know, I haven't been able to verify it myself. But I'm focused more on the extent to which there's prejudice by having him answer this question. And I think Mr. Fox is able to to deal with it. So I'll and there's at least an argument that the specifics of it come from the hearing and not something he could have known specifically prior to to this. So I'll allow the answer. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Professor Elliott, <clears throat> um, how or why is the point you just made uh, supportive or relevant to the propriety of Mr. Clark's letter? Well, I believe that there was a good deal of testimony, particularly by Mr. Donahue that I did not have available at the time that um, I wrote my expert report, suggesting that Mr. Clark's raising these issues for reconsideration within the department was inappropriate because of Mr. Barr's prior statements. And I think those prior statements have been misconstrued and misinterpreted I think they actually support exactly what Mr. Clark was trying to do. Now, I think he's trying to do it too late in the day to actually get things done. But Mr. Barr suggested, and that's reported later in the AP report, that there needed to be further investigation. I also believe uh, that it's very important that uh, Mr. Barr's quote in this article is to date we have not seen fraud on the level. The words to date, which by the way are deleted from the specification of charges, um, indicate that the investigation was still ongoing um, and that he was suggesting that other means of investigation in addition to the department's investigation into criminal fraud or voting rights violations was necessary and appropriate, but it couldn't be done by the Department of Justice. <clears throat> Do the bar rules of professional responsibility address one way or another what opinions subordinate employees are allowed to advocate internally? I don't believe so. I think they suggest that in a counseling role, which is what I think was involved here, uh, that factual disputes are supposed to be resolved in favor of the client. All right, sir. I'm going I'm to sorry, show I missed you. the last word of your answer. Resolved in favor of a client. The client. Okay. Uh, I'm now going to show you on the screen uh, disciplinary council exhibit number eight. And do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. All right, and the legend at the top of the page, what does it say? It says pre-decisional and deliberative attorney client or legal work product, Georgia proof of concept. All right, sir, and I'm gonna scroll down to the heading on page two. In the uh, header, what does that say? Pre-decisional and deliberative attorney client or legal work product. And that appears on each subsequent page? Yes, it does. In red, bold type? Yes, it does. What, if anything, is the significance of that for your opinions? It means that this letter is what we frequently call in the, uh, in the government and also in private practice, a straw man or a straw person. Um, and it's one of the things that courts often do as well when they say, well, let's see if the opinion will write. And what they mean by that is sometimes you can't uh, decide on something until you see it written up. And the way it's written up shows you the kind of allegations that you would, uh, you would have to make in order to support it. Now, I might add, I would have proposed the letter for other reasons, but I think it's appropriate 
to raise these kinds of issues for discussion with your colleagues. And I understand there was a lot of discussion, including some of which became quite heated. All right, sir, at the very bottom of the letter, uh, which is now on your screen, mm -hmm. uh, it's drafted for three signatures, is it not? Correct. And what, if anything, does that show or mean for your opinion? Well, it means as originally drafted, Jeff was contemplating that um, the acting attorney general and Richard Donahoe would also sign off on the letter. So it was it was subject to their review and revision. I think that's clear. All right, sir. Now, um, you heard testimony from Mr. Donahue and Mr. Rosen about whether Mr. Clark was in his lane or not. I did. And do the bar rules of professional responsibility address the topic of what lane an assistant attorney general of the United States must be in? No, not to my knowledge. <clears throat> Was the, do you have an opinion on whether the draft letter was dishonest because it proposed positions that were different than the Department of Justice's existing positions at that time? Yes, I do. What is that opinion? I do not think it is dishonest to raise issues for consideration inside a government agency. I think we'd have a different situation if the letter had actually been sent. But I think it, if the letter had actually been sent, it would be my opinion that there was adequate evidence to support at least the allegations about possible fraud. I think some of the adjectives about how widespread it was and whether or not it would affect the election, but we don't have a letter that was actually sent. And I think it's important that you have free and open deliberation within government agencies. All right, sir, are you familiar with a, uh... Uh, the legal academic literature, Hart and Sachs, on uh, the difference between adjudicative facts and legislative facts? Yes, I am. And uh, what is that distinction? Well, it was explained to me by one of my teachers, the great, late great Alexander Bickle, as uh, adjudicative facts or questions about who struck John, whether or not a factual event occurred. And legislative facts blend into policy judgments about broader issues. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, I would like to add that the question of whether or not, that there certainly were some instances of irregularities in the election. That I think is an adjudicative fact. And I think there was some support for that. Um, whether those were widespread or whether or not they would have affected the results of the election, I think those are legislative facts and that a different standard applies to them. Those are judgment calls and opinions, in my opinion. All right, that's all the questions I have for Professor Elliott. Mr. Fox? Yes. Emily, could we put up the uh, disciplinary council exhibit eight? And while she's doing that, you do distinguish between opinions and fact, do you not? I do. And you would you agree with uh, Senator uh, Moynihan's statement that everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts? I do. Okay. But I don't. I don't believe that. It well, I doesn't be. ask you that, sir. Okay, you're right. Stand correct. Now you said you would have opposed sending this letter, correct? Yes. Um, and I think you testified a moment ago that um, you, you thought this letter was written to see if it would write. Is that right? Like, quoting you correctly? No, exactly. No. I, I think it was a, a proof of concept letter, okay. uh, which, which meant to see whether or not there was agreement within the department that it was appropriate to send this letter. And, and you have testified that you heard the testimony of uh, 
the witnesses that we called in this case, correct? Correct. And did any of those witnesses say that Mr. Clark had said to them that this, and I'm throwing this out here to see if it, it were right? Yes, I think so. You think so? May, um, I, may I explain my answer? I think the fact that he asked to have a briefing by the Director of National Intelligence shows that he was inquiring further into the facts and conducting what we call due diligence or reasonable investigation. And I understand that to be the standard that applies even to representations to a court, which is a higher standard than, uh, than applies to internal deliberations. Right, we'll come back to the due diligence in a moment, but there are a few preliminary things that I wanna go over. You don't think it was appropriate, let's go to the second page, if you will, Emily, of the uh, exhibit, the, letter, the first page of the letter. You don't think it would have been appropriate to share the status of uh, investigation with state officials, do you? That's correct. All right. And I, I, can I may I elaborate or no? Well, we have redirect examination. Um, well, okay, but I do think in this instance he has answered the question, and you can ask him on redirect. I, I don't want to. Uh, it's unfair to Mr. Fox to have the cross-examination become another direct examination where he has to go through that. He's entitled to to ask questions that have confined answers. Now, I want you to assume that the author of this letter had no involvement in the post-election investigations. All right? Including that. at the Civil Division. Right. Okay. And I want you to assume that that state report that's referred to in the letter had been investigated and that the conclusions had been rejected by the Republican Secretary of State of Georgia. Right. And I want you to assume that the author, Mr. Clark, did not bother to investigate the Secretary of State's conclusions. And then I want you to assume that the, the Department of Justice official most knowledgeable about the factual, excuse me, about the federal post-election investigations had told the author that he was a, a, unaware of any investigations that would impact the outcome of the presidential election. Do you still think it was appropriate for Mr. Clark to advocate to send this letter? Objective question was in the proper hypothetical since facts not enough. Could you use the microphone? Yes, please use the microphone. I object to the question as an improper hypothetical because it assumes facts not on evidence. Namely, that Mr. Clark had not done any investigation. He has not proved that. I'm asking to assume there's no evidence he has done any investigation. And I'm asking him to assume that that's the fact. Those are the facts. Okay. To the extent that, that Mr. Clark did an investigation that affects the, the relevance of the answer, you know, I, 50 years ago, people would have required a hypothetical to include the exact statements that everything has been proven in evidence. If, in fact, that's not, then his answer may not be of value, but I'll allow Mr. Fox to test the limits of, of his testimony by stating he could state. I, I didn't ask for romance here. <laughs> 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 handle right here. Yeah, handle right here. <laughs> Can we fix that? I, I, all right. I, I, Mr. Fox is entitled to, to, to ask even extreme questions. So even if X happened, you'd still say Y in order to test the, the limits of the witness's opinion. So the fact that he is brought it closer, if not entirely, to exactly what you think the evidence may have proven doesn't make it an improper question, is my point. So I'll overrule the objection. So the question was, under those assumptions, did you have, do you think it was appropriate for Mr. Clark to advocate for the sending of this letter? Yes, I do. All right. Um, 
In your opinion, would it be honest for the letter to say the Department of Justice has identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple jurisdictions, including Georgia, based on those assumptions? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know how much the department had or had not, and I don't know what it had uh, what it had seen. Um, I'm relying primarily on the uh, the uh, sources that are cited in the draft letter and the fact that the comments to uh, uh, Rule 3.1, particularly Comment 2, say specifically that the fact that there is contrary evidence does not make a contention frivolous. Have you have you read those sources that are cited in the letter? Yes. And um, you recall the hypothetical that I asked you to assume was that the, for, first of all, the withdrawn. Uh, you would agree with me that the newspaper articles simply cite uh, or, or a report about the uh, legislative report, correct? Yes. All right. So really only talking about one thing here, the That's legislative correct. report. And, but, uh, but lots of lots of factual detail in that one thing. Right. And uh, have you yourself looked at the uh, investigation that the Republican Secretary of State in, in Georgia conducted of those allegations? No. Okay. And so I asked you to assume that he had conducted an investigation and found that the allegations were not borne out and that that occurred before this letter was drafted. Would you then say that there was a factual basis for Mr. Clark to make those statements? I'm having difficulty with the question because I don't think a factual basis is the standard in the ethics rule. I think the standard in the ethics rule is that something is not frivolous and I think the comments say the fact that there is contrary evidence doesn't make something frivolous or the fact that further investigation is required does not make something frivolous. Well, I really appreciate if you ask the question, answer the question that I asked you. Please ask it again and I'll try. All right. But, and and the, the question was, if you assume that this report had been debunked by the Republican Secretary of State in Georgia, would you still believe there was a factual basis for Mr. Clark to make these statements? Yes. All right. And that factual basis would be what? The material that was contained in the original report. The fact that a Republican de debunks it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't some evidence to support it. And as I understand the ethics rules, uh, it is permissible to raise an issue if it's not frivolous. And this, this goes to the question of if the letter had been sent. I think you're asking me whether or not continuing no. to advocate it within the Department of Justice was a violation of the ethics rules, and I don't think it was. Let's just continue. I'm sure this yeah, is I, I have a hard time reading. It's my problem. <laughs> well, that is a problem. Um, uh, do you believe that there was a sufficient basis for Mr. Clark? to say to Mr. Rosen that unless he agreed to send this letter, Mr. Clark would accept the position of acting attorney general and take Mr. Rosen's job? <laughs> That's a good question. And I think it's a hard question. Um, I'm not sure where I'd come out on that. Um, I do not believe that disbarment um, is an appropriate remedy, but a lesser remedy might be. Um, I think that there was no harm in raising the issues internally initially. Um, I don't think that the so-called coup within the Department of Justice or getting out of the uh, uh, getting out of his lane is a uh, is is a ground for professional discipline. And I'm not clear in my own mind as to whether or not. Uh, that was a step too far. I just haven't reached a, a, a conclusion on that. All right. Um, when, when you told us earlier that you yourself would not advocate for sending the letter, had you taken into consideration the consequences on the electoral process of sending this letter on December 28th after the electoral vote had been counted? Yes, but I would have... Uh, I would have come out the same way anyway, but yes, I took that into account. Okay. And that's one of the reasons that you, 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 would it be fair to say that's one of the reasons you thought that the letter should not be sent? 
It's a minor reason. The main reason was I don't think it's appropriate for the Department of Justice to essentially job on a state as to what it should do with its activities. So I would have strongly opposed sending a letter, but on a different ground, right. which was one of the grounds that uh, Mr. Donahue and Mr. Rosen mentioned, and I agree with them on that. Now, um, you, you'll recall, and we can put it up if, if, if you need to see it, but you'll recall that the letter said that uh, recommended that the Georgia General Assembly, and it's on the uh, second page of the letter, Emily, uh, the Georgia uh, General Assembly convene in special session to take additional testimony, receive new evidence, and deliberate. You remember, you, you recall that? Okay. I sure do. And, and you understand that that was advocating for some kind of, what, the assembly to be some sort of tribunal of some sort, taking evidence? Frankly, I wasn't clear exactly what it was advocating. I tended to think it was advocating the kind of further investigation that Mr. Barr had called for. Um, but I don't think it's important. I perhaps have a different uh, view of uh, federalism than uh, Mr. Clark does, but I don't think it's appropriate for the uh, uh, Department of Justice to try to uh, persuade or, or jawbone uh, a state to take that kind of action, particularly extraordinary action, but even if it had been less extraordinary action or hadn't been so late in the day, I would have come out exactly the same way. I would have opposed it very strongly at the meetings in front of the president. I, and, I haven't decided whether I threatened to resign, but I would have opposed it. Okay. And, and, and part of the extraordinary action that they were asking was that George, the Georgia legislature appoint essentially two sets of electors, right? Correct. And um, if that had happened, sometime between December 28th and, and January 6th. Have you, have you, did you factor into your opinion what the effect that that would have been on the electoral process? I think it would have uh, denied uh, a uh, majority in the electoral college and would have thrown the house, would have thrown the election into the house of representative, representatives where the Republican candidate would probably have won. But I'm not an expert in election law, but that's my understanding. And, 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 and would you anticipate that such a drastic action would also throw off multiple lawsuits? Yes. Okay. Um, were you aware that the governor of Georgia had said that there was no authority for the legislature to call itself into special session? I, I learned that by listening to the testimony in, in this hearing, and I uh, have no reason to doubt it. T take a look at... Uh, uh, Disciplinary Council Exhibit 4040. Your Honor, we are far beyond the scope of the direct. Huh. Um, I don't necessarily think it's beyond the scope of testing his opinions. Um, so I'll overrule the objection. Well, well, the witness testified about the propriety of sending the letter and whether there is a sufficient basis for sending the letter. The fact that the witness didn't focus on this statement in the letter as opposed to other statements in the letter, he still expressed a more general opinion than that. And, you know, so if the witness thinks that there are some things that he sh that are inappropriate in the letter, that's certainly relevant to the opinion he's expressed. Or is not charged with having an incorrect legal opinion. Charged with attempted dishonesty, and the direct testimony focused on that question. Well, well, Mr. McDougall, I don't. The issue of whether something, if if Mr. Clark's letter had said there is a case, you know, like like the artificial intelligence case, you know, that don't doesn't exist, right? That supports X. There's an argument that it's dishonest or, you know, meets a standard of dishonesty to send it. Okay. So, so the question is, this makes a statement about the authority of Georgia. And the question is, what was the basis for that statement? The witness said he thought he had sufficient factual basis for, for what was included in this letter. Mr. Fox is entitled to question whether that's true. That's, that's what I understand it to go to. The... Could you use the mic? Yes. <laughs> Pardon me. We'll, we'll get a sign so that 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 Ms. Matthews doesn't have to keep repeating. Well, well, you could just use the mic. Oh, okay. I the would a handle 
Have, do we have a ruling now or not? Yeah, I, I, look, I am over the objection. objection. Okay, when it was so, continue, that's fair. If, if you look at Exhibit 40, and I want to focus on the third paragraph that begins state law is clear. And the last, I think, sentence of that paragraph says, any attempt by the legislature to retroactively change the process for the November 3rd election would be unconstitutional and immediately enjoined by the courts, resulting in a long legal dispute and no short-term resolution. Is that the sort of thing that you think might have resulted and one of the reasons for your opinion this letter should never have been sent? No, because I don't think those kinds of prudential considerations uh, have that factor into the degree of support that an attorney has to have before discussing an option in counseling a client. Um, I confronted a, a similar situation when I was at EPA, and I can describe it now or I can describe it on redirect if you like. But, but let's, I, I think you're not answering the question I asked. You told me earlier that uh, you would have opposed sending this letter at this time, and I think because of the consequences of doing so. And what I'm asking you is whether that highlighted language that we looked at there is the kind of consequences that you would want to avoid and why you would have recommended not sending that letter. No, I would have recommended sending the letter without these consequences. I think these consequences are an added reason for not, for not sending the letter. Okay. Um, and I do believe as a general matter uh, in the statement by uh, Professor Feynman that extraordinary conclusions require extraordinary evidence. Uh, and I would apply that in my own personal life. I just don't see anything in the rules that says that. Okay. Uh, and, um, but you would agree with me that um, uh, had this letter been sent at the particular time it had been sent, or that it was being proposed, uh, it would have resulted in chaos in the election system. I, w I actually wouldn't go that far because I'm not sure, because I'm not an election law expert or an expert in legislative procedure in Georgia, I'm not sure whether or not uh, Governor Kemp's position or Mr. Clark's position about the power of the legislature uh, was, was correct. The fact that there would be a lot of lawsuits, that wouldn't deter me. I do believe that throwing a disputed election into the House of Representatives is part of our constitution. And whether or not it should have been invoked here or not, I don't have an opinion on that because I don't know what the extent of uh, fraud and, and uh, irregularities was. I, I have written an article saying that uh, Trump won fair and square. I mean, sorry, that Biden won fair and square. I wrote an article entitled Why Biden Lost, which is one of the articles cited in my expert report. Okay. Um you would agree normally that a letter that you withdrawn. You, you mentioned a moment ago Mr. Clark's uh, legal theory, which uh, I think is generally called the independent state legislature theory, correct? I'm not an expert in that area. I've never heard of the independent state legislature okay. theory. All right. Then, um, but I, 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 well, let's just leave it at that. Okay. Um, You'll remember in the letter, uh, there was a reference to what happened in Hawaii in 1960? Yes. All right. Uh, do, do you know what happened in Hawaii in 1960? No, only news reports that I've seen. Okay. Um, but I do think it was probably distinguishable from the situation here. But how far this uh, practice of appointing alternative electors goes, that's not an area within my expertise. Okay. Um, but it's your testimony, you think that the 1960 situation was probably distinguishable? From what I've read in the, in the popular press, but I don't think that's a reason not to raise it for discussion within the department. Okay. And the last thing I want to touch on is that you said, I believe, that uh, if Mr. Clark had some doubts about the department's position on whether there was election irregularities that would have affected the outcome, he had a duty to investigate, correct? Correct. 
And your testimony is that consistent with that duty to investigate, he asked to speak with the Director of National Intelligence, correct? Correct. And did you hear the testimony of Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue that they told Mr. Clark to contact the United States Attorney in Atlanta to see, to find out what the investigations were in Atlanta? I did. And do you agree that Mr. Clark had a duty to do that investigation? No, I found the fact that he didn't follow up troubling. But as I understand the, the rule, it is to conduct reasonable investigation. And that does not necessarily mean that you have to follow every lead that somebody gives you. Um, and I, I was disappointed that um, Mr. Clark uh, invoked various privileges and didn't uh, didn't explain why he didn't follow up on that. Um, I, I heard the statement by Mr. Rosen that he thought that it was an excuse and that it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, pass muster. Um, but I did find it troubling that uh, Mr. Clark did not investigate, but ultimately it doesn't change my opinion that he did conduct reasonable investigation, certainly enough investigation to raise the issue with, uh, with regard to sending the letter within the department. I think if the letter had been sent, it would be analyzed differently. Okay. And you think that it was a reasonable investigation not to speak with the person who was in charge of the investigations in Georgia? I think it would have been better to speak with them. I think it still passes muster as not frivolous. And you think that... Uh, and do you think then that it would, what, having not spoken to that person, uh, Mr. Clark was justified in insisting that the letter should be sent? No, I do not. Thank but you. I don't think it's an appropriate subject for discipline. Thank you. Not nothing. Good job. Good job, Mr. Fox. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. Um, do the bar rules permit Mr. Clark to have a different legal opinion on than the governor and the secretary of state? Now, these are leading questions, and I would, uh, he, Mr. McDougal has led consistently, but I, in redirect, I object to leading questions. You were asked a series of questions about determinations. Uh, that were made or were represented to you to have been made by the governor and secretary of state of Georgia. <clears throat> Do the bar rules address one way or the other whether Mr. Clark was obliged by those rules to agree with the governor and the secretary of state? Object to leading. I think it's fair to Mr. Fox to identify, to direct him to the testimony and ask whether the bar rules apply to it. I don't know how Mr. McDougall can be expected to ask a question that doesn't direct him to the testimony. So I'll well, the, the, the way to ask the question is to say what the bar rules say about that, but that's. Well, uh, saying whether the bar rules say anything or do the bar rules say anything one way or the other is, is I think, a, another way of saying exactly those words. Okay. Uh, so the objections are. No, I don't think they do. I think they say the opposite. I think the standard for representation to a court is even higher than the standard for drafting a letter for comment by your colleagues in the government. And the standard for representation to a court is that you have to conduct a reasonable investigation and that it is not frivolous simply because you think it may not prevail. Um, and so the fact that the more likely than not standard was not satisfied doesn't make it a disciplinary offense to raise the issue for consideration and discussion. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much, Professor. Do you have questions? Um, Ms. Smith indicated she's thinking about it. So let me ask one, uh, Professor. I just want to understand. I believe you said on your direct, and maybe I'm just getting the answer mistaken, but I believe you said on direct and again, perhaps on cross, 
that Mr. Clark, if he thought there were allegations, had a duty to investigate them. Do you mean a duty before sending the suggestion or a general duty? I think he had a duty to engage in some investigation. And I think that's clear by uh, comment two to rule 3.1, but it doesn't say has to, con has to conduct a complete investigation. In fact, it says the opposite. It says oh, that- Okay, I think you're answering a different question from the- Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. I don't have a problem with what you're saying, okay? Right. Um, it, it really relates to the in your lane issue to yeah. some extent. I understand your point that the rules don't specify what the lane, the, the ethical rules don't specify what the lanes are. But to give you, you know, sometimes using an absurd example as an indication, you're not telling me that every, you know, that if someone were uh, a first year lawyer in the U.S. Maritime Commission, that they had an obligation to investigate election for, you know, fraud in connection with the 2020 election. No, I'm right. not. Right. But if so, the president asked them to do that, I believe that the Constitution would 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 trump the internal rules of the Department of Justice. Okay, I understand that point. Okay, yeah. but I was trying to find the source for Mr. Clark to investigate this in the first place, because one of the things I understand from Mr. Rosen, and Mr. Donahue, is even before Mr. Clark spoke to the president about this in the time of him, he was looking into this and right. the reaction of Mr. Rosen was, where did this come from? Right. And so, and, and I just want to make, understand, you're not saying that every everyone in every division of the Justice Department had a responsibility to investigate this issue. In the no, I, I understood the testimony in, in this hearing to be that numerous allegations of election irregularities had come to Mr. Clark's attention in his role as head of the civil division. Um, and um, I also believe that even if he were violating the uh, strictures of department policy that he was not supposed to communicate with the White House, um, I, I don't think that this barment is an appropriate remedy for violating an internal Department of Justice guidance document. I don't think it's an ethical violation. It may be a violation of the department's policy, but I had understood Mr. Donahoe and Mr. Rosen and Mr. Barr to all to all say that the uh, uh, that the only investigation that the Department of Justice was appropriately doing was either criminal fraud or civil rights violations, voting rights violations. And Mr. Clark was privy to a whole other line of inquiry that came to him in, in his role as head of the civil division. Well, okay. There were lots and lots of lawsuits that he was aware of were making these allegations. And that was outside the purview of what Donahue was looking at. All right. Um, so I don't think it was a violation of the uh, department policy. But I think even if it had been, it wouldn't have been a violation of the ethics rules, and they would have a it would have a different sanction, not disbarment. And okay, just just to to clarify, the question of sanction is not a, a rule violation does not equate to. Department. I'm aware of that. Oh, so your question jumped from the rule violation to the sanction. Correct. So part of the uh, challenge here is that we have specific allegations of rule violation, which is 8.4 violations. And so I'm trying to focus in on that. Right. And then later on, there would be a question of what sanction. Um, so just getting back to that, you a number of times uh, talked about the importance of an open and free exchange of ideas. Yes. Um, 
is it part of that open and free exchange of ideas to say, if you send this letter, then I won't take the position of acting attorney general. Yes, I think it is, but I think it's an inappropriate threat. I, I would I would counsel lawyers under my supervision not to make threats, but I do think that the testimony in this case is that um, the discussions became quite heated on both sides. And uh, I've seen that in government. I think it's unfortunate. I think that maintaining civility is an important, uh, an important thing. Um, and if I had been in that meeting, I would have said to Mr. Clark, now let's not, let's not get involved in threats. Um, the reason I think this is an important question is that what we're looking at is the factual, the, the honesty, the right, honesty right. issue. And so this communication, which was focused on the substance of that letter, and then saying, but if you sign the letter, you will keep your job. How does that, how is that consistent with an open and free debate? I think it's entirely inappropriate to have made that comment but I don't think it shows that the uh, that the state that the statements in the letter were knowingly false or frivolous. So I don't think it's an appropriate um, occasion for any for any bar discipline for a violation of the DC bar rules. That I'm not aware of anything saying that lawyers can't raise their voice and make threats and uh, of what they're going to do. Um, I think that. What Mr. Clark was saying is he wanted it to be unanimous and that if uh, it was unanimous and they sent the letter, he wouldn't accept the uh, wouldn't accept the position. But do I think it was appropriate for him to say that? No. All right. <laughs> uh, a couple of times. Um, you you were addressed the addressing the counseling situation. And you said in counseling, we should take the factual, if, if there are disputes, factual sure. disputes, we should take the factual claims of the client at face value. That's what I heard. Yes. In this instance, who was the client? Yeah, I disagree with Mr. Clark on that. I think the client is the Department of Justice and the American people, not necessarily the, the occupant of the uh, office of, uh, of president. I understand that the president is the head of the executive branch. I also understand this is a very controversial and unsettled issue. There's a lot of debate about it in administrative law and constitutional law. But uh, I, I think it's also troubling where the incumbent president is also a candidate for, for office. And well, I, I I think I, I understand the complexity of it, yeah. but I wanted to focus in on that. Um, in this instance, then, the Department of Justice as the client, and here you had Rosen, who is the acting attorney general, disagreeing. Why and and seeing factual the factual right. issues differently? Why would that not resolve the question? Um, because the, the provision that I quoted. Um, well, first of all, I don't agree that the Department of Justice was the client. Okay, I think the client was the executive branch of the government okay. as a whole. But I don't necessarily think that the uh, conclusions that Mr. Rosen and Mr. Donahue uh, had had reached based on what they described as a limited investigation, limited to particular issues, foreclosed Mr. Clark from raising the issue that there's other evidence that you haven't considered that indicates the opposite. But I thought that I thought this point went to 
when there's been a disagreement about the facts, how is it resolved? Right. And I thought you said that it would be in favor of the client. Right. If if I indicated that uh, I I was incorrect because I believe that Mr. Rosen, as acting attorney general, is is not the final authority on this, that the president is the final authority as head of the executive branch. So that's the difference between my view that the Department of Justice, at a minimum, uh, the client for the Department of Justice is the executive branch, which is headed by the president. Um, and, and that I don't believe, I believe very strongly that what was referred to repeatedly as the Department of Justice consensus is not binding on an official within the Department of Justice, particularly when he is asked, he or she is asked to look into it by the president. But I would agree that who the client is when you're in government is a very tough issue. Okay. Wanna, are you done? Yeah, for now. Okay. Ms. Matthews. Professor Elliott, when did you first see the letter? I don't remember. I believe it was sent to me by Mr. McDougall after I had uh, McDougald. Uh, after I had agreed to be an expert witness. But I may have seen references to it in the press prior to that time, but I didn't actually see the full letter until that uh, until that time in preparation for my expert testimony. So it would have been prior to my expert report, but after I had agreed to be uh, an expert witness in this matter. Thanks. Is there anything else, Ms. Smith? Okay, is there anything else? <laughs> No, 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 I have a couple of follow-up. Okay. There's actually two. Um, are you aware of what the D.C. rules of professional conduct say as to who is the client of a government lawyer? Not as I sit here, no. Okay. I, have, I have known that, but I don't know it right now. Right. And then the second thing is, did I understand you to say in response to Mr. Hirsch's statement, that you believe that Mr. Clark had become aware of a number of allegations of which Mr. Donahue may not have been aware because of Mr. Clark's position in the civil division. Is that right? Yes, but could I add something to my previous answer or no? Well, let me finish this. this sure, finish, sure. And then we could go back. Um, so the answer to my question is yes, you thought he had learned of these allegations because of his position in the civil division? In part. Okay. And um, you're aware that most of these allegations arose in suits, lawsuits, in which the Department of Justice would not have participated? Correct. Okay. Uh, that's, that's all I have. Can I go back and add to my previous if, if, answer? Sure. Um, I, with regard to who the client is, um, I think that um, advisory opinion uh, 323 is highly relevant because um, I think it makes it clear that the um, DC bar rules do not trump statutory requirements for government lawyers. Um, much less constitutional requirements for government lawyers. And I would uh, certainly suggest that the uh, panel take a look at that. That's an opinion that is under 8.4 that uh, specifically deals with whether or not dishonesty uh, on behalf of the um, uh, uh, of agencies like the CIA and the FBI is permissible. But I think the principle that statutory obligations uh, trump the DC bar rules is, is correct. That's the opinion that says that lawyers for the CIA may be exempt from the uh, requirements of honesty if they need to, for operational purposes, claim to be something other than what they are. That's correct. what you're talking about. Correct. Thank you. 
no further questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Elliott. You are excused. Thank you. Appreciate your time. All right. Um, what's coming up next, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> John, Dr. John R. Locke, okay. an expert witness. All right. Well, that would be the subject of a Rule 26 objection by Mr. Fox. Okay. Um, why don't we take a lunch break and then address the objection after we get back? Okay. Okay. It's now 12 15, 1 15. Very good. Back. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. Time did you say? 1 15.
Yeah. 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 <laughs> you didn't know. I didn't know how lucky you are. <laughs> Complaining about my breath. I can take subtle hints. What? All right, are we ready to proceed? Um, Mr. McDougall. Yes, uh, Chair, Chair Hirsch. Let me wait until I said it. Okay. Uh, before we turn to the Rule 26 uh, issue with uh, Dr. Lott, um, we would like to raise with the Chairman, again, the question of our uh, Appointments Clause threshold motion that was briefly discussed yesterday, and Mr. Clark would like to be heard on that very briefly. I, I really do think this should be taken up at the end. Okay, at this point, we've already gone through half the hearing, all right? And, and you know, where I left this was that we're going to brief this and that, that it was going to be included in the briefing at the, at the end of the hearing. And so it hasn't been briefed, and you want to argue it in advance of the brief. Now, if you want to, at closing argument, lay out what this what this is as part of other discussion of law, I'll certainly allow you to do it. But I don't want to interrupt the hearing to do it. I didn't quite catch the But I don't want to interrupt the hearing to do it. I want to continue to go through our evidence. It's difficult enough to schedule witnesses, and you know, believe me, it has been very difficult. But I, I don't want to. Uh, it's just a very brief uh, request proposal, not to argue the issue right now. Uh, but, but if if I give time to your side to argue it, I have to give time to Mr. Fox's side to argue it. I can't just say, "Oh well, just hear from us and don't listen to the other side." I would really right. like to continue the hearing. So here, continue the process of comparing. So why don't we get to the Rule Twenty Six issue that we do need to resolve? Uh, Chair. For the record, you are denying my request to just make a procedural proposal. It's not going to be a substantive argument. And I, you changed course on this. Initially, you, you told Mr. Fox to file a response to the Right. And I'm saying that the response of the brief will be in the post hearing briefing. And, and Mr. Mr. Clark, okay, I fooled. Okay, so that's your ruling. Well, my ruling, my ruling is that. That the way we're handling this motion, which you filed on the on you know the morning of the of the hearing, is that we'll have further briefing on it in connection with the with post hearing briefs, and that's how we'll handle it. Um, so I don't see that this requires anything earlier. And and honestly, you know, one of the difficulties with the motion is Rule 7.22 required that motion to be filed seven days before so the hearing in the first place. Well, okay, that's one of the things you can argue when you brief it, but I don't want to take the time that, that we're scheduling witnesses to use it right now, Mr. Clark. Okay. Um, since it is, uh, Mr. Fox's objection, um, I suppose he should go first. Okay. <clears throat> well, my objection is that we didn't receive an expert report. <clears throat> we received a three-page or two-page letter that uh, Mr. Lott wrote to Mr. McDougall, set forth, I guess, three types of, of evidence is what he says, and then a bunch of other things. Yesterday, when I met with Mr. McDougal, he told me that uh, an, a document which has got the RX of 500 on it uh, was, in effect, Mr. Lott's report. It's an undated, I guess it's an article, I don't know, uh, uh, has an abstract at the beginning and so forth, that relates to stuff other than Jordan. It does concern Georgia, but it also had Pennsylvania and some other stuff. And, it, it, you know, the first I knew it was the expert report was yesterday, but I, you know, it, it is not a standard expert report. 
He's done that. They've done that consistently. And we objected back in December to the absence of real expert reports. Now, you 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 took me to task this morning for referring to the experts as sketchy. But the reason that I do that is because I think one of the ways that you hide the inadequacies of your experts is by doing something like this instead of giving us an expert report. And so I don't know. I mean, I, I'll stumble through a cross-examination if, if I have to go forward, but I do not have the normal preparation uh, that I would have for an, an expert cross-examination. I've cross-examined lots of experts, and I have never had such an insufficient basis as I, I have in this case. And so I object to these people testifying. You, you get issued an order that they comply with the rule. It's not a suggestion. It was an order, and we objected to it, and they didn't do anything about it. So I think they ought to be bound by their conduct. Mr. McTougall. Thank you, Chair Hirsch. Uh, <clears throat> the objection that uh, the Senator Council filed and the argument just made uh, is that it is insufficient because it, and the, the, but the insufficiency that's alleged is as to form only the substance of everything that is required by Rule 26 was provided uh, to disciplinary counsel back on December the 5th. With respect to Mr. Lott, we provide, well, I do have one caveat on that slot, which I will come to in just a second. But we provided uh, a CV, which is uh, very, very long. We provided a cover letter. We provided two research papers, one called Simple Tests for the Extent of Vote Fraud with Absentee and Provisional Ballots in the 2020 U.S. Presidential Election, which uh, focuses in part on Georgia. The part that uh, that's the testimony I would elicit would be the extent that his report talks about Georgia. I'm not going to cover the other states that are discussed in this report. There was a second report that we provided to them, and this is before the chair's ruling on post-January 3rd evidence. Uh, we're not going to go into that. So what we're talking about is whether the document that we provided him which has got to be at least 40 or 45 pages, which is Dr. Lott's paper, complies along with the CV with the disclosure requirements of Rule 26. The paper is thorough and complete in describing <clears throat> the research design, the data, the methods and analysis employed down to the regression equations that were used, uh, data tables, uh, showing the results are provided. He's had this since December the 5th. And uh, the one uh, caveat is that Mr. Dr. Lott's cover letter uh, does not include the Rule 26 certification. But the witness will swear to his testimony. His testimony will be sworn, but it will be about what this research paper uh, Provides Now, the average expert disclosure report doesn't provide anywhere near as thorough and comprehensive a disclosure of what the expert looked at and analyzed as this paper does. And so we, the rules of evidence are not intended to exalt form over substance. They're designed to get to the truth in a reliable way. And his uh, critiques of the uh, analysis, he can bring those up on cross. Uh, he had an opportunity to have his own expert look at Dr. Lott's report and bring them into court to testify in rebuttal. Uh, and he could still do that in his rebuttal case. Uh, but he's had one, two, so he's had four months to get ready for Dr. Lott. Okay. Look. So the objection... Uh, you know, wrote an eliminated article. He'll testify about the date and time. At the time, he also testified that when he began work on this paper, he was a consultant to the Justice Department. And he will describe his interactions with Justice Department officials about his findings, and it'll be directly relevant to uh, what we've been hearing so far. Was that before or after January 3rd? Oh, before. Okay. 
Now, I, to be fair and to be candid, the paper was revised after that, but he can talk about that. He can explain the part that was on the table before that. All right, I'll allow the testimony. All right. Uh, is the witness in the waiting room? We have someone as Zoom user. I assume that's him. Do you want me to let him in? Can you hear me? Um, yes, I assume let him in, Ms. Barasas. Okay, thank you. Or, uh, so is he coming in now? Someone was, called Zoom user is, I assume it's him. I don't know. That's how they're named. Was Can we let him in and see if that's him? Yeah, if that's what we're doing, okay. I believe. Yeah, I let that person in. I'm just waiting for them to connect their audio and start their video. Is he a Zoom user? I believe so. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> they just started their camera. Can okay. you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Great. Uh, are, are you Dr. Roth? I am. Hi, uh, Doctor. My name is Meryl Hirsch. I'm the hearing committee chair. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm going to be swearing you in. Do you want to swear or affirm? Happy to swear. Okay. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear, swear that the testimony you're going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. Could you state your full name for the record? My name is John R. Lott, Jr. Okay. Uh, and, and Dr. Lott, uh, if it's possible, can you update your your you see how you're referred to a Zoom user uh, on your your name on the Zoom? Would it be possible? I, for you? I'm about to do it for him. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. Thank you. All right. Ms. Barasas will will correct that so someone watching the proceeding will know who you are. Um, All right. Thank you. Please proceed, Mr. McDougall. Thank you, Chairman Hirsch. Uh, doc, uh, how are you employed, sir? I'm uh, currently president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. And what is that? The Crime Prevention Research Center is a group of academics uh, who do research on crime issues, everything from policing to vote fraud to gun control issues. Uh, we have uh, our academic board of advisor includes people from Harvard, uh, University of Chicago, University of Michigan, uh, the Wharton Business School, Emory. Uh, and our research director is Carl Moody, who is a professor at uh, William & Mary. But uh, we put out academic quality research, published a number of peer-reviewed articles under the center and, uh, and do other types of educational activities. All right, sir. Um... What is your educational background? I have a PhD in economics from UCLA. I got all my degrees, my BA, MA, and PhD, all from UCLA in economics. And uh, what is your professional background? I've been an academic most of my life, uh, but I've held positions uh, in the federal government. Uh, I was chief economist for the United States Sentencing Commission. And then I was a senior advisor for research and statistics uh, in the Department of Justice for both the Office of Justice Programs and the Office of Legal Policy. Um, I've had research and teaching positions at places like Stanford, Yale, University of Chicago, the Wharton Business School, uh, UCLA, and Rice. Um, you mentioned uh, Office of Justice policy and office of legal policy when office of justice programs and office of legal policy thank you i will never be able to keep uh all these acronyms straight there are a lot of them there are uh and when when was that work with 
OJP and OLP. Uh, well, it was uh, during 2020 and uh, the beginning of 2021. All right, sir. Have you ever taught at the university or graduate level? Yes, I've taught in economics departments, I've taught in business schools, and I've taught in law school. Uh, I've taught, as I mentioned, uh, I've taught graduate classes and MBA classes and at uh, the Wharton Business School. Uh, I've taught uh, law school classes at the University of Chicago. I taught uh, business school at uh, UCLA. And I've taught uh, economics at a number of schools. Have you uh, published any research papers in scientific or professional journals? Uh, yes. About how many? Uh, over 100 peer-reviewed articles. Uh, and then if you include book chapters and other things, probably another 30 or so. <clears throat> Do you give talks or present your papers at professional conferences? Yes. And uh, can you estimate how many times you've done that? Uh, well, uh, for professional conferences and invited uh, talks at universities other than my home institution over 400 times. I can't, you know, it's something over 400. All right, sir. And uh, what are the primary areas of your focus or expertise in your work? Well, I'm an economist uh, by training, but uh, I do statistics. Uh, I'm known for my work in what's called public choice, which is applying economics to the political markets, from voting to the behavior of politicians and government agencies. And I'm also known for my research on crime. So uh, things like vote fraud uh, and voting uh, falls many times into both public choice and crime related topics. And does your academic, uh, you know, your educational background in economics uh, provide any foundation for the statistical analysis that you've described? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, <clears throat> the notion for economics is a pretty simple one. is if something becomes more costly, people will do less of it. Uh, if the price of apples go up, people buy fewer apples. But also, if you make it riskier for people to go and commit crime of different types, they're going to commit uh, less crime. Uh, you know, with regard to political markets, you know, I've studied lots of different issues there. You know, for example, uh, what's the drop off rate in voting as people go down the ballot? And I've looked at things like uh, uh, the types of voting machines, whether you have different types of drop off rates and voting rates uh, as people go down the ballot based on the type of uh, uh, machine that's used. Uh, I've looked at a number of different types of issues. I've looked at uh, vote fraud, for example, um, and uh, things like uh, secret ballots. I mean, most people don't know the history of things like secret ballots in the United States, but secret ballots are relatively recent. Uh, the first state to adopt secret ballots was Kentucky in 1880. The last state to adopt secret ballots uh, was in South Carolina in 1950. And... Uh, uh, one of the things you see is that when states moved to secret ballots, there was about a 10 percent drop in the rate at which people voted. And the reason is actually pretty simple. And that is what used to happen is you'd have a ballot box up in the front of the room and uh, you'd have the representatives of parties stand on either side and people would drop in colored pieces of paper based on which party they were voting for. And the representatives of the parties would go and kind of monitor uh, what colored piece of paper you're putting in and then pay people based on whether they voted for the right party or not. Um, and when they were no longer getting paid because with secret ballots, you couldn't tell how they had voted, uh, a number of people decided not to vote when they weren't getting paid. Um, and, you know, so afterwards you had uh, bans on things like absentee ballots in many places or very restrictive because things like absentee ballots allowed you to show somebody how you were voting. And, uh, and 
the reason why we moved to secret ballots or a major reason why we moved to secret ballots was try to prevent the massive fraud uh, that was occurring in elections up until that point. Okay, and so uh, let me interrupt you there, Dr. Walker, just a second. Sure. Um, and just to make, be clear, I think you've already said this, but is it fair to say that you have uh, published research relating to elections in voting? Yes, I've published a number of papers on a number of different aspects of uh, of elections and, and voting. And how far uh, back did you begin uh, researching and publishing on that topic? Uh, the 1980s. Um, <clears throat> I am going to put up on the screen a document which has been marked as Exhibit uh, R-498. Do you recognize that document? Uh, yes. And you had indicated to, uh, tell us what it is. What's well, my, my CV, my, my resume. And you had indicated to me that there uh, needed to be an update to this document. Uh, yeah, there's a, a slight mistake in it, and so I fixed it. All right. Unfortunately, I, that's not exhibit number R-498, uh, and I, I can pull that off of your email, but can you just tell us what the correction is? Well, there was a paper that was uh, that was uh, shouldn't have been included on there, so... Did you uh, carry out a any type of, before you tell me what your findings were, did you carry out a study of any types of potential vote fraud in Fulton County, Georgia, in the November 2020 presidential election? Yeah, I mean, I looked at uh, a number of different issues with regard to vote fraud in the 2020 election. All right, sir, and on the screen, can you uh, identify the document marked respond, uh, Exhibit R-500? Right, well, that's, that's the paper that I did while I, was, uh, while I was at the Department of Justice, originally did there. All right, and how did it come about that you did this work? Well, uh, it came about because uh, I was... At, originally at the Office of Justice Programs. And uh, Kathleen Sullivan, who was the uh, uh, acting assistant attorney general, uh, had asked me to, uh, I had talked to her. She knew my background. Uh, I mean, I, my position was senior advisor for research and statistics. Uh, she knew uh, because of stuff that I'd done, I think, when I had work, uh, done work for the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, I had, uh, uh, I had done uh, some research on the 20, 2000 election for, for the Civil Rights Commission. And she was familiar with some of the other things that I had done. And she had talked to me about uh, looking into uh, the issues of vote fraud in the 2020 election. Now, is this a government study or government document? I mean, I did it while I was senior advisor for research and statistics. It was never put out officially as a working document by the Department of Justice, but uh, both my uh, supervisors at both the Office of Justice Programs and the Office of Legal Policy had encouraged me to do work on that. And uh, and that's where I was when I did the work. Um, and without, again, going into the conclusions of the paper, can you describe the subject matter of the paper? Right. Well, I mean, it was trying to provide a test uh, for whether there was irregularities that were occurring in the uh, in the 2020 uh, election in November of that year. And uh, and so there's about four different tests that I have in the paper there uh, to try to look at that issue. All right, sir. Um, and 
how does this paper fit within your areas of expertise? Well, as I say, the reason why I was asked to do this uh, to begin with was because of my background in uh, in doing statistics on uh, on on elections, and uh, you know, so uh, there are a number of issues there about voting, uh, trying to get a measure of uh, fraud that might be occurring there uh, during the election, and so um, you know, that's that's what I was doing. All right, sir. Have you ever testified in court as an expert? Yes, I have. About how many times? Oh, I don't know, about 10 times, I guess. It's uh, yeah. The list is in my my CV that you had there. Uh, can you tell us some of the courts you testified to as an expert? I've testified in both federal and state court. Uh, a number of the, I suppose most of the time I've testified has been with regard to campaign finance. Uh, type uh, regulations and the impact that it has on on voting, the rate that people vote, uh, uh, how they vote, uh, you know, how it affects incumbents versus challengers. Um, I've also testified on voting machines and uh, and the impact that different types of voting machines have on the rates that people vote. Uh, and uh, and I've also testified on crime uh, related issues. Have you ever been excluded as an expert witness? No. Chairman Murch, I tender Dr. John R. Lott as an expert in statistics, economics, and public choice. We discuss his analysis of voter fraud as set forth in Exhibit R500. Mr. Fox. Where do I find the witness here? Ah, oh, there we are. Uh, I can't see the witness on my screen. Oh, there it is. Sorry, Dr. Lott. I'm, uh, Hello. My name's Alan Fox. Um, Dr. Lott, just a couple of questions. Who, who sure. worked for the Department of Justice in 2020? Do what now? What did you for, say? For whom did you work at the Department of Justice in 2020? Uh, I worked initially uh, for the Office of Justice Programs uh, as Senior Advisor for Research and Statistics, and then I worked for the Office of Legal Policy uh, with the same title. And, and it was uh, Catherine Sullivan was the Acting Assistant Attorney General uh, in the Office of Justice Programs, so I directly reported to her. And then Theo Wald uh, was the acting uh, assistant attorney general for the Office of Legal Policy, and I reported directly to Theo. Um, you, you you told us that one of the areas that you were, uh, I'm sorry, Crime Prevention Research Center, do I have the name right? That's correct. That one of the areas of interest was voting fraud. Um, right. And I looked through your CV, um, and I didn't see any um, articles about voting fraud until the 2020 election. Is that was I did I miss something? Uh, well, I mean, uh, there's issues earlier on. I mean, my I have a paper in the Journal of Political Economy, which is probably considered the top uh, economics journal. Uh, you know, the title deals with uh, women's suffrage. But in order to try to look at the impact of women's suffrage, uh, you have to go and account for many types of voting changing rules. And among the types of rules were things like uh, whether you had secret ballots or what have you. And that obviously, as I was trying to explain earlier, brings up issues about vote fraud that are there. And so there are other papers there that uh, whatever the title is, uh, you know, you have to account you know, you, if, you, if you want to go and look at turnout rates, you just can't look at uh, women's suffrage. You have to look at all the other types of voting rules that are there. And so there's a number of papers there uh, that account for different things that would be related to vote fraud. But vote fraud as the primary subject of, the, of these papers, I, I didn't see anything about that before 2020. Did I miss anything? I mean, again, I don't know 
you say primary. I mean, you have, uh, you know, the paper on women's suffrage, for example, probably has, I don't know, uh, a quarter, maybe a little bit less, 20% of the paper or so that uh, deals with issues that would be directly related to vote fraud type stuff. So, you know, you got to account for these things. It's in the paper. If the journals didn't think that it was relevant, then they would have asked me to cut it out. Uh, you know, because space is at a premium in, in journals. And so, you know, as I say, I'm not just because it's not in the title doesn't mean that it's not something that's uh, important to the paper. Uh, Mr. McDougall showed you um, what was been marked as uh, uh, Exhibit 500, which is that person is an abstract and so forth. I guess this is the thing. It's entitled Simple Tests for the Extent of Vote Fraud with Absentee and Provisional Ballots in the 2020 U.S. Presidential Election. Yeah, that, that, there it is. Thank you. Um, yeah. did, did you, ha, had you ever analyzed any tests for vote fraud prior to uh, this writing this document? Uh, it, well, as I mentioned, I mean, again, I can point to different papers, but probably my best known work on this is uh, my paper in the journal Political Economy that I've gone through, and uh, that was published in 1999. So it's been an issue that I've been interested in. Uh, there are issues, I have a paper also on the 2000 election, and I was involved in, uh, I wrote the statistical appendix uh, if for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission on the 2000 election. Uh, there were issues in there dealing with vote fraud uh, type issues. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so, I mean, I've written on this topic previously. Is this the first paper you've written that discusses tests for, for vote fraud? No. I mean, look... <clears throat> You know, again, just because it's my best known one, uh, just mentioned the JPE paper. Uh, you know, the issue there was uh, you had about a 10 percentage point drop in the rate that people voted when you went from uh, non-secret ballots to secret ballots. And there's a reason for that drop. And that was previously people were getting paid for voting. And when they no longer got paid, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to count uh, paying people, illegally paying people for voting as vote fraud. I would. But um, uh, what you find is that uh, there's a big drop off, uh, a, a huge drop off that would have affected many of races uh, when people were no longer being paid to vote. Now, continue to look at this document, which is RX 500. Uh, do I understand that this was not... Uh, published by the government? It was not published by the government. It was uh, my understanding from both uh, Katie Sullivan and from Leo Wald that they had shown it to uh, people higher up in the government. Uh, I know Theo pushed very hard uh, for people uh, at the top of DOJ to take it seriously. Uh, but, you know, the decision high up was uh, that it was better not to publish it as an official DOJ uh, report. Well, you know, Theo, Theo wanted to have it published, and, I, and uh, I know he felt very strongly about that, but you'd have to talk to Theo. But where was it published? Uh, it wasn't published by the Department of Justice. But was it published at all? Uh, no, it hasn't been published. It was accepted uh, for publication by the journal Public Choice. Um, uh, it had gone through the refereeing process. The referees liked the paper. But when it was announced uh, that it was uh, going to be published, uh, you have to, I, I suppose you can understand what academia is like to some extent. There were a couple of professors, one at Stanford, uh, Justin Grimmer, who has been an expert for Democrats in, uh, in their election cases uh, in court, who basically, I don't know, better word other than threatened uh, the editor of the journal Public Choice saying that uh, they would uh, 
uh, trash the journal if they publish the paper and uh, and the journal backed down and decided that it was better given how uh, hotly contested this issue was not to publish the paper. Uh, has this uh, paper been peer reviewed? It was peer reviewed. It went through the refereeing process. It had multiple referees. Uh, the referees accepted the paper. Uh, the editor accepted the paper. And then there was this uh, academic backlash that occurred. Uh, I, have no, I have no questions. I'm not going to object to this witness. Okay. In that case, uh, Dr. Lott will be admitted as an expert for the purposes that Mr. McDougall described. And just for sake of the records, I do have the updated CV, uh, which I would label R563. and just now emailed it to the opposing counsel. And I'd like to move that into evidence. I don't think an expert's resume is appropriate to be moved into evidence. It's not testimonial. He's, he can testify about it, but I, I, I don't move experts' resumes into evidence and, and I offer expert testimony. Well, uh, I think the I'm going to admit it and consider it <clears throat> value worth. I don't consider it a testimonial document in the sense that if there's something in the name of an article that's listed there, I'm going to accept it as being a true statement or something like that. But as evidence of the witness's qualifications, sure. So, uh, I'm sorry, you told me the number five? R-563. 563. To be clear, Chair Hurst, that's a new exhibit. Yeah, which I don't have in front of me. Do you, you don't have a problem with the content of the exhibit? No, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what this new paper is, but I'm assuming it has nothing to do with the issues in front of us, or we, Mr. McDougall would have brought that out. It's, it's the CV. It's the updated CV. Yeah, I understand. I think what Mr. Fox is asking is, does the change to the CV involve something that's relevant to this case, or is it just... Um, Dr. Lott, does the update to your CV relate to uh, any of the issues in your paper, a simple test, or the uh, subjects that you're going to testify on? Yeah, well, basically it had to do with the issue of public choice that... Uh, uh, the paper was initially accepted, and the earlier version of the uh, of the CV noted that. But then, as I said, that there was a backlash, and they never published the paper. So that was what was fixed. Okay, so, so it uh, took off the reference that it was going to be published. Is that okay? Is that so what I, right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. With that, uh, our exhibit R five sixty three will be admitted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I'd also like to move into evidence Exhibit R500, Dr. Lott's paper. Again, I, I object. I think the testimony is what uh, of the expert is what comes in, not this isn't an expert report. There's no place in there it sets forth its opinions and so forth. But I don't think, um, you know, I've put on experts before who have written papers. You don't admit the papers. You admit the expert testimony. So I object to this. It's here today for one right. Uh -huh. I'll admit it for whatever value it's worth. I don't consider it, again, testimonial, but it reflects it and may save time in, in giving details. All right. Uh, referring to this paper, when did you first begin work on it? I first began work on it, uh, excuse me, the middle of November 2020. And are you able to tell from looking at our R500 um, whether this is the uh, final version of that paper? Yes. And it, it is the final version? Yes. All right, sir. <clears throat> Did this paper, though it was not published, in the Journal of Public Choice, was that the name of it? Correct. And though it was not published as a Department of Justice publication, did it, never, right. did it nevertheless circulate? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, I'd shown uh, the original idea and some very preliminary work uh, to uh, uh, Katie Sullivan when I was at the Office of Justice Programs. Uh, as I mentioned, I talked to her about initially working on this uh, topic, 
And, uh, and then uh, when I was moved over to the Office of Legal Policy, uh, it was one of my primary responsibilities, according to Theo Wold, uh, when I was working there. Now, uh, Dr. Lott, if you could explain to the committee, uh, as best you can in layman's terms, what is the basic idea behind uh, this paper? All right. Well, there, there are a few different tests that are here, actually four different tests that I have. Uh, with regard to Georgia, there's basically two tests. Um, and so, you know, the idea is there are certain counties where fraud was alleged uh, to have occurred during the election with regard to absentee ballots. And so what I wanted to do was compare Fulton County, where there were allegations, to counties next to it. There were four counties, Carroll, Cherokee, uh, Coweta, and Forsyth where there were no allegations of, uh, of fraud with regard to uh, absentee ballots. Fulton County has 384 precincts. Cherokee County, for example, has 42. So precincts are small, home, fairly homogeneous districts. And what I wanted to do was to compare the voting behavior in two precincts that bordered each other on opposite sides of, of the county lines that were there. Uh, since they are small and similar geographically, uh, demographically, um, I wanted to go and see how Trump's share of the absentee ballots in the adjacent precincts on opposite sides of these borders compared with differences in the in-person voting. Uh, I did that for both 2016 and 2020. And what you find is that um, uh, in 2016, the shares, the relative shares that Trump got in these two adjacent uh, uh, precincts across, you know, the street and different counties uh, were essentially the same in terms of their in-person voting and in terms of the absentee ballots that were there. Now, the thing you have to understand is that uh, the in-person voting is counted at the precinct level. The absentee ballots were counted at the county level that was there. And that's where issues arose in terms of whether there were, you know, ballots were double counted or what have you. Uh, those allegations deal with the absentee ballots. So I looked at the same difference in uh, 2020 as I looked in 2016. And unlike 2016, uh, there was a large gap in the county in which the fraud was alleged to have occurred with regard to the absentee ballots, they couldn't be explained by the difference between in in-person voting between these two small adjacent precincts that were on opposite sides uh, of these county uh, lines. And that, that difference continued to occur even when you accounted for demographics, for example, that were may be slightly different in these two adjacent small precincts. So that's one test that I had. The other test that I had was just to look at the voter turnout rate in counties uh, in swing states uh, where fraud was alleged to have occurred versus uh, counties where there was no allegation of fraud. And what you found was that including Fulton County, uh, there was uh, an unusual increase in, in turnout in counties where fraud was alleged, even after accounting for demographics and you know the percentage of the vote that the different parties got, you know, all sorts of other factors that you could think of with income and poverty and what have you, just in those counties where fraud was alleged uh, to have occurred. And so, uh, is it fair to say then that you considered possible non-fraud reasons for the differences that you observed? Yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously you always try to think of what the alternative explanations are. It's one reason why I compared uh, the voting in 2016 uh, to 2020 uh, to see whether there were any pre-existing differences in how people voted absentee versus in-person uh, between those places. Uh, 
you know, the thing is, you know, so let's say there is an effort in advertising or whatever to get a higher turnout. Well, you know, if you have two precincts that are on opposite sides of a county line, uh, it's not obvious why just, you know, people on one side of the road versus another side of the road are going to turn out at uh, very different rates. Uh, and I looked at other types of things that may be occurring in terms of activities for the parties and what have you. And it didn't seem like there was anything like that that could explain the differences that were there. So, uh, really? go ahead. Are you finished? Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt your answer, though. No, that's fine. Go ahead. <clears throat> so, uh, overall, uh, what is your assessment of whether your simple test paper tells us anything meaningful about whether there was fraud in absentee balloting in Fulton County? Right. Well, I think there was something very unusual that happened with regard to the counting of absentee ballots uh, in counties where fraud was alleged, which would include uh, Fulton County. Uh, and also uh, very different in the precincts across the street in Fulton County. Uh, you know, again, noting that the absentee ballots, unlike the uh, in-person votes, were counted at the county level uh, in Fulton County versus the precincts that were just across the street in Carroll, Cherokee, uh, Coweta, and Forsyth counties. All right, sir. Uh, in your opinion, was the question of absentee ballot fraud worthy of further investigation? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, that's basically what I was asked to try to look at, whether there was, you know, <clears throat> so the issue was, should they go and devote resources to go and look into this? And so if one could provide a statistical test to at least indicate that something was going on that warranted further investigation, that was that was the point. That was what I was asked to look at, and that's what I looked at. And is that what you found? Yes. And you testified earlier that you informed your superiors uh, at OJC and OLP? Uh, well, yeah. Office of Justice Programs and Office of Legal Policy, right. The uh, So it's OJP and OLP. But the, uh, right. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, Katie uh, Sullivan uh, knew of my past research in this area and given my title, you know, Senior Advisor for Research and Statistics. She asked me, uh, and I talked to me about looking into this, and so I did. And uh, and uh, and Theo Wold, well, I was moved over to his division, uh, in part I think because uh, Katie thought that Theo would have more influence in getting people higher up to uh, investigate this further. Uh, and I know uh, Theo. Uh, you know, shared the research and and talked to the higher ups at uh, the DOJ about the research that I did. Do you know who Theo reported to? Uh, no, I mean you'd have to talk to Theo about that. All I know is uh, my impression was Theo took it as far up the food chain as was possible. I think he went. I think you know. I know he was in regular meetings with uh, AG or acting AG. And uh, and my impression, because Office of Legal Policy is kind of the legal advisor for the Department of Justice, um, and uh, and it was my understanding that he took it up as up to the top. But uh, you know, I other than just kind of him saying that he had pushed it up, you know, and pushed it hard, uh, you know, I don't know the specifics all. All I know is that he had pushed it and, uh, you know, done his best and tried to get it published as a DOJ uh, official study, uh, but that wasn't the outcome. And who was the acting attorney general at the time? Well, I, I think it would be Jeff Clark. Well, another Jeff, maybe? 
Pardon? Uh, Mr. Clark was never Attorney General, acting Attorney General. Okay, okay, okay. Well, my guess, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, objection, uh, sir. Would you like to correct your testimony on that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, look, uh, I, I think it was, uh, I'm just drawing a senior moment here, just trying to remember the names of everybody who was there. But it's just, uh, um, uh, I know before the acting attorney general, I think uh, whatever his name was, uh, I know I should remember it. Uh, the guy who was uh, actually attorney general, uh, I believe it was brought up to his attention. And then, uh, and then the acting attorney general afterwards, it's my impression. But again, I wasn't involved in those conversations. I turned these things over to Theo and, uh, and Theo uh, and Katie earlier. Uh, you know, it was up to them to, uh, to push it forward. All right, sir. <clears throat> Last question. Are you being compensated for your testimony in this case? Yes, I am. Uh, does that affect your testimony at all? No, I mean, I'd done all this work long before uh, you contacted me about uh, being an expert in the case. All right. That's all the questions I have for you, Dr. Watt. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Just a moment. Uh, sure. Uh, Dr. Lott, when was this uh, publication we've been looking at uh, response to 500 completed? Uh, well, I think uh, the December 21st, 2020. December 21st, 2020. Right. Okay. Um, did you ever discuss it with Jeffrey Clark? Nope. Have you ever, uh, and when I say ever discuss it, either in 2020 or since 2020? Well, I mean, I, I met uh, Mr. Clark for the first time about a month or so ago uh, down in Florida. And uh, we briefly, very briefly talked about it at the time. He mentioned to me that he had seen the report uh, and that uh, he found it interesting. Uh, you know, he's not a statistician, uh, he indicated, but he thought it at least indicated that uh, people should look at this topic. Uh, and uh, he said that he had known of my research, uh, my statistical research generally, and uh, thought, you know, at least it warranted further questions. Um, had, when you finished it in... Did you say December 20th, 2020? Did I have is that the date? I, I believe it was December 21st. Uh, I mean, I, I had earlier versions that I had been giving to Katie and to uh, and to Theo. Uh, but uh, kind of the final version of it, as far as the Department of Justice was concerned, uh, was probably um, was probably December 21st, uh, 2020. Um, as I understood what you said, there were two tests that you uh, performed. One of them was on precincts that were adjacent to each other, correct? Right, on opposite sides of county lines. Uh, right, go ahead. How many such precincts were there that you compared? I'd have to look. I mean, it's basically, there are a lot of them. Uh, because you have four counties that border uh, 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 Fulton County. And so, you know, they basically cover all the sides of Fulton County. And so, uh, uh, you know, you have a lot of precincts that kind of match up against each other. How many is a lot? I don't know. I mean, it probably, I, I'd have to look exactly, but I probably think a couple hundred. Oh, there were, so you compared a couple hundred precincts uh, on the opposite side of Fulton County line. Is that right? Correct. And um, as I understand what you found, um, 
was that uh, in the Fulton County side, there were more absentee voters for Biden in 2020 than there had been for Clinton in 2016. Is that, is that right? What, what I found was that uh, if you compare the absentee ballots, let's say that uh, the percent of the absentee ballots that Biden got in 2020 in the in the precincts where there was no uh, alleged fraud to occur, uh, it was less than the percent of the absentee ballots that uh, Biden got in the precincts across the street in Fulton County. Uh, and that difference didn't exist uh, in 2016 uh, between the absentee share of the absentee ballots that uh, Hillary Clinton got and those same two precincts, you know, that you're comparing uh, across the street from each other in 2016. And that's even after you've accounted for, uh, uh, you know, the in, the percentage of the votes that the candidates got in the in the two adjacent, the difference in the share of the votes that the candidates got in uh, in 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 person voting in those two elections. Incidentally, you said you compared with the counties in which there was alleged fraud. Who alleged? Right. Well, the Republicans obviously alleged fraud. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, uh, no one seems to have alleged fraud, neither Democrats nor Republicans in uh, in the other counties. Now. Just one thing to be clear, um, I, I'm making a relative comparison. So it could be that, and what I try to make clear in the paper, is it could be that there's fraud in Fulton County, or it could be that there's something nefarious going on in the uh, adjacent counties that are there. All I can say is that there's something nefarious that seems to be happening in terms of how these are counted. But I can only make a relative comparison. And And the other point that I would make is, as far as I could tell, nobody was alleging anything nefarious had occurred in the comparison counties. So at least that indicated that most more likely than not that the issue was going on in Fulton County compared to the other counties. Did you test this out on any counties in the United States in which there was an allegation that there had been election fraud committed by Republicans? No, there was none that I found that were there. I mean, the, the other county that I looked at was uh, was Allegheny County in Pennsylvania and comparing it to the counties that surrounded it. Um, you know, uh, Philadelphia County would have been another county to go and do it in that state. But the problem was is that the adjacent counties there, like Delaware and uh, Bucks and other ones had allegations of fraud that were occurring. So it wasn't possible to kind of make a comparison between a, one county where fraud was occurring versus another one where there wasn't. Um, yeah. My question but, was, did you make any comparison in any counties in the United States where it was alleged that the Republicans had committed election fraud? Is the answer yeah, I thought I... I thought I answered that at the beginning of my response, and I said no because I didn't know I didn't see anything that and Democrats. What I tried to do is, is, is it, to look at places. Is, is it your thing, sir? I would ask if the witness be allowed to finish his answer. The witness is not finishing; he's filibustering. <laughs> I only gave like three sentences response. How is that filibustering? Uh, hold on, my turn. <laughs> okay, look. I want everybody to refrain from the characterizations. It doesn't help, okay? And and the, the issue is, at what point did the witness respond to the question? I think he gave uh, an extended answer to the question that began with an answer and an explanation. And if there's a further explanation, I'll allow Mr. McDougal to ask, ask and, and redirect. I don't want you to editorialize, um, Mr. Fox, about you know the witness and describe it. Just make your state your position, okay? So I'm going to to overrule Mr. McDougal's objection. I'm going to ask that the you know Mr. Fox, you can ask your next question. Is it your testimony, Doctor Lott, that there is no there was no county in the United States of America in 2020 in which there are allegations of election fraud committed by Republicans? 
I used cases that were filed in court to go and identify those cases. And I know of no case, if I missed it, you know, I apologize, but I know of no cases where Democrats filed court cases uh, alleging that Republicans had engaged in vote fraud during the 2020 presidential election. Now, with, with respect to your findings with respect to absentee ballots, there was a considerable difference between the use of absentee ballots in 2016 than in 2020. Is that not so? That's exactly right. And uh, because in 2020, we had a pandemic, correct? Exactly right. And in addition to that, President Trump discouraged Republican voters from voting absentee, correct? Yes. Now, let's go to your, and, and, and if, if we can go to your report on page, I mean, your conclusions are a little different than the conclusions you testified to, but at the, and the pages are not numbered, but at the penultimate page of the text, uh, where you were comparing uh, Georgia and Pennsylvania, you said, however, combining Georgia and Pennsylvania samples implies additional mail-in absentee ba votes were valid, Biden, but the results are not statistically significant, correct? Correct. All right. Um, now- But I we, thought I wasn't supposed to testify about Pennsylvania. <laughs> the problem is you're going to, the, the, the absence of exit report, but anyhow. Um, your second test didn't compare precincts, but it compared counties, correct? That's correct. And uh, so you compared counties which in which there had been a that fraud had been alleged by Republicans, correct? Right. To other counties in which fraud had not been alleged by Republicans, correct? Fraud had not been alleged by anybody. By anybody. There hadn't been, there hadn't been any court cases that I know of that were filed by either party uh, with regard to those other counties. And the cases in which fraud had been, sorry, withdrawn, let me try again. The counties in which fraud had been alleged were counties that went heavily for President Biden, correct? Yeah, but there were also counties that went heavily for Biden where fraud was not alleged. And so you're essentially comparing you know, so he wants to instead of answering my question. Yeah, Doctor Lott. Okay, I, I think your answer to the question is that he he didn't ask you about other counties, and you can explain your answer later. He asked you whether the counties in which uh, fraud was alleged in court cases were counties that went heavily for President Biden. And yes, would you answer? But, okay, right. But can I? Can I explain briefly just how statistics works? Well, you can do that on redirect. Uh, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I think. All right, it's your call. Ask his questions, and and it'll be more orderly if I hear the the you know explanations that if you want to give them on redirect, than to have it interrupted in that way. And it's your call. You would expect, would you not, Doctor? that the counties in which fraud was alleged were the counties that turned out most heavily for Biden. And this gets to the answer I was just trying to give a minute ago, and that is you're comparing counties that voted heavily for Biden. Some of those had fraud alleged and other ones that went heavily for Biden didn't have fraud alleged. OK, and so if you're going to go and say some, the points that you were raising earlier about the fact that, you know, did Democrats use absentee ballots at relatively high rates? Yeah. But as I tried to show, you have that occurring in both the counties where fraud was alleged and Biden did well, as well as counties uh, where fraud was not alleged and Biden did well. And so the question is, 
after you've accounted for that, do you see a relatively higher rate uh, in, uh, in turnout in the counties where fraud was alleged after controlling for things like the percentage of the vote that Biden got uh, in, in the ones where fraud was alleged relative to ones where it wasn't? Let me try to get the answer. You finish your explanation because I'd now like to have you answer my questions. Okay, go ahead. You compared the, the counties that you used the, that you looked at were the counties yes. that fraud was alleged, were counties that had turned out heavily for Biden. There are other counties that turned out heavily for Biden as well, but the ones that right. you on for fraud were, were by definition counties that turned out heavily for Biden, correct? Yes. All right. And you compare those with some counties that had voted that had, that had voted for Trump, correct? Right. And I also compared it to counties that voted heavily for Biden. I'm coming back. I'm coming to that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you found that in the county, comparing to the counties that voted for Trump, there was a heavier turnout than had been in 2016 in those counties that went for Biden and in which fraud was alleged, correct? Right. Now, if you compared the other counties that went for Biden, where there was no fraud alleged, right. with counties that went for Trump, you would have also found that there was a heavier turnout, would you not? Okay. Okay. You don't understand statistics. The basic point was I'm accounting for one of the variables that's in there is the percent of the vote that Biden got. And so you're really accounting, you know, the comparison then, since you've controlled for that, is really between the counties that, you know, two counties that Biden got, uh, you know, an equally high percentage vote score for. And the difference then is where you have uh, uh, vote fraud alleged versus not. So it's not just, I mean, you're, you're, you're accounting for all sorts of different counties because you're trying to get kind of ideas about the standard deviation there so you can get measures of statistical significance. But, the, but since you're accounting for, you're, you know, you're controlling for the percentage of the vote that Trump or Biden got in those counties, all right, you've already taken into account the thing that you're getting at here. OK, you're already that's pulling out. That's pulling out the fact that, you know, you have these Trump counties and they're different because Trump did relatively well in those counties. That's what that variable is pulling out. Dr. Lott, can I have a, just an answer to my question? My answer to my question is, if you compare the Democratic counties. Where no fraud was alleged to the counties that went for Trump you would have found a heavier turnout in those Democratic counties. And I already answered yes. I said yes. That's that's the question I asked. Thank you, sir. But it's, but you don't understand statistics, I guess, is the point. I don't believe I have any further questions for this witness, Mr. Hirsch. Um. I do have one question, um, but do you want to ask questions first? I, hmm. I do have a question, and um, and you may say I don't understand statistics, and I may not. So this goes to the absentee ballots. Sure. And 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 I understand that you identified uh, the differences comparing right. 16 and 2020. And then you said something, what that told you is something nefarious is going on. How, how do you, I understand that you identify differences um, and you sought to account for factors that you thought would would account for differences. But is there anything that you know that would cause you to say something nefarious is going on? Well, it's obvious that there was a, a, 
a big increase in the difference across the street for two counties. Okay, so you have you're trying to account for, you know, the differences in in-person voting. You know, you have to realize these are very small precincts. There's 384 of these precincts in Fulton County. Uh, so they're small, fairly homogeneous places, and they're right across the street from another small place that's also homogeneous and very similar in terms of demographics, in terms of political composition, in terms of how they vote, uh, in terms of the percent of Democrats and Republicans that are uh, registered to vote uh, in these counties. And even beyond that, I tried to account for other demographic differences even though they were very small. I mean, you're talking about like a percentage point or so difference in terms of like the percent black males or other, uh, uh, you know, racial and, and sex differences that were there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can look at it and you can see, well, uh, in 2016, uh, not only was the uh, votes for how they voted in person uh, essentially the same, in these two adjacent precincts across the street from each other. But the absentee votes were essentially the same. These are, except for a street between these two small geographical areas, they're right next to each other. Uh, you know, you'd be hard pressed uh, to see very much of a difference at all in terms of voting in 2016 in either absentee ballots or in-person voting. And then all of a sudden in 2020, they continue to be extremely similar in terms of in-person voting. In fact, the difference was essentially the same as it was in 2016. But all of a sudden, you've seen this big gap that occurs in terms of absentee vote uh, between those places. It just is strange, okay? Right. Uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to explain uh, and Unfortunately, it seems to be consistent with the claims uh, that were being made in terms of how the absentee ballots were counted, because that's the difference between these precincts. The in-person votes are counted at the precinct level. The absentee ballots were counted at the county level that was there. But in and so, go, go ahead. ahead. We'll finish. Go no, go ahead. Well, in terms of your analysis, what you can do is you can look at the patterns and you right. can identify the variables that you've accounted for. And so right. you can conclude that I've accounted for all of these variables. There doesn't seem to be a difference. And yet there is a difference. And I don't have an explanation. Is that a fair conclusion? Well, <clears throat> I guess I would go a little bit farther than that. I would say, well, look, here's the ultimate bottom line. The ultimate bottom line is, there, it ra if I phrase it in the way you just were saying, it raises a question that definitely seems to be look need to be looked at, all right? That's kind of the simplest thing that seems least controversial to me to be able to make. There's something that changed that cannot be explained by these, you know, that what you would think in terms of normal voting patterns for these things. You know, the fact that the in-person voting, you know, the breakdown, the difference between these two places is, you know, the difference between these two adjacent uh, precincts on opposite sides of the street are the same as the differences in 2016. Um, you know, and yet you just see this huge jump in the difference in the difference between these two virtually identical precincts uh, in 2020. Um, it's something that deserves further investigation. I think that's the most conservative way of phrasing it. Okay. Um, one other question on the paper that you prepared. Right. What, what was the purpose of your doing this? The title, Simple Tests, for the extent, extent of vote fraud and absentee provisional ballots. Was this the idea to identify simple tests that could be used? Was that right. your assignment? Right, right. Well, the assignment was basically, you know, 
it's costly to go and do a big investigation for things. And so uh, they wanted to have kind of a bird's eye view of whether it would be worthwhile going and looking at these things more closely. And, uh, and uh, no one prior to this paper had come up with a measure of uh, this type of vote problems or fraud uh, uh, in the US. I mean, as I said, I've done other stuff that had looked at vote fraud issues for things like secret ballots or voting machines or whatever. But uh, this was a different uh, animal here. And, uh, and I was asked to look at this so that, uh, you know, they could know whether there would be a reason to go further. So what I'm not clear on is whether you were being asked to develop tests that could be used or were you being asked to do an analysis that would identify right. which? Right. So, I mean, okay, so I get called into Katie's office uh, and I'm talking to her. She says, look, I know you've done a lot of work on elections in the past. Uh, she was familiar with some of my work that I had done. I believe she was familiar with the work that I'd done for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights after the 2000 election. And she was saying that there was a discussion going on about whether or not, you know, there might be, uh, you know, strange things that happened in the election. I think that was the word that she had used. And they wanted to know whether there were some anomalies that just needed to be looked at more carefully. And so it was kind of a back and forth uh that I had with her about uh, uh, what could be looked at. I had already kind of, in my own mind, just because I do this anyway, kind of sketched out what might be some possible tests. I told her about uh, my initial thoughts on that. She thought that they were interesting. and uh, But it was basically a preliminary look to see whether or not it would be it would provide guidance for whether more should be done in this area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Matthews. Okay. Um, Dr. Lott, you said that you met Mr. Clark, I believe you said approximately a month ago, and he said at that point that he had read your your article that you've exhibit 500 that right. you're passing. Did any when he read it? Uh, I don't know. I had the impression. I mean, it was. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. I don't know. He he had read it early on in the process. I think. Um, uh, my I had the impression that somehow it was probably in December. Okay, December of 2020. Right. Okay. Um. I think that's my only question. Anything else? Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Lott, you referred several times to accounting for non-fraud variables. How do you do that? How do you do that? How does a statistician do that? Well, you try to. <clears throat> so I'm. I mean, there's lots of different types of controls that I have here. One is, uh, I'm trying to compare uh, precincts across. I mean, in one of these tests. I mean, obviously, as we've talked about, I have multiple tests. But let's say in the precinct level one that I have, you're trying to compare two small areas, two precincts that are across the street from each other that are very similar uh, in terms of their voting patterns, uh, very similar in terms of their demographics, very similar in terms of the percentage of their populations that are registered as Democrats or Republicans, uh, and in terms of how they vote uh, for Democrats and Republicans. And uh, you compare that over a previous election where there wasn't any fraud alleged versus a later one where there is, you see whether there are differences in terms of the in-person vote in the 
earlier election versus the later election. You see whether there are differences uh, in terms of uh, absentee ballot uh, percentages that go to the different candidates. And you see whether you know, you have some gap that occurs there that's consistent with the types of allegations that people are making with regard to, uh, you know, how votes, absentee votes were being counted in one county versus another. As I say before, I can't really say whether or not uh, there was a problem in Fulton versus the other neighboring counties, or was a something strange, unusual going on in the neighboring counties versus Fulton. All I can say is that there's something strange going in on at least one side of this. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, so uh, that's, go ahead. Dr. Watt, <clears throat> is there a mathematical technique or methodology for identifying the relative effect of one variable compared to another? Yeah, it's called multiple regression analysis. So you have many variables that are kind of picked up at the same time uh, that are there. And, and, uh, yeah, you and to get your attention to the screen, uh, this is a page in your paper, which unfortunately doesn't have page numbers. It's going to be page one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. What is that highlighted text on your screen, sir? That's a that's essentially the simple form of the regression analysis that's there. It's comparing the difference, essentially the share of uh, absentee ballots that Trump got in the the difference between the two adjacent precincts versus uh, the difference in vote share that he got in terms of in person voting in those two adjacent precincts, as well as the the you know, other variables that are there, the D that is there as uh, other factors that were being accounted for. All right, sir. And is this type of regression analysis a standard technique in the field of statistics and economics? Yes. All right. Those are my questions. Mr. Fox. But I think in response to the Smith's question, maybe, maybe take that down so yeah, I can see the witness. Thank there you. you. Uh, I think in response to the Smith, Smith's question, you said that these precincts were very tiny. Can you give us an idea about the total number of voters in these precincts? Oh, I have to look it up. I don't remember. What I can say is... Uh, uh, as I mentioned, you have 384 of these precincts in uh, in uh, in uh, Fulton County, uh, so you get an idea. Uh, you know, you're talking about thousands of people uh, in it. You know, maybe it might be 10,000 people or something, probably less than that on average. Uh, in uh, Cherokee County, I think there was like 84. Uh, or it could be 48, I can't remember, but there's a large number of uh, precincts there. Uh, you know, other places that I looked at, like Allegheny County, you have 1,300 and, and some uh, precincts. So you can imagine how tiny uh, those places are. And I did similar tests for that. What I'm, what I'm trying to get a feel for is in a typical precinct that you compared, how many total voters would there be in that precinct? Right. I thought I'd try to answer that. I mean, you're talking about in the thousands probably less than 10,000, probably closer to maybe 5,000 or something like that, people there. But they're relatively small geographically, and so they're relatively homogeneous. Okay. Um, and so the, the differences between the number of absentee voters in 2016 and in 2020 would be approximately how many in in, in in a typical county, in uh, uh, actual numbers, not percentages, but actual numbers. I mean, you may be talking about a thousand or a couple thousand. And and of that, a couple of thousand. So so, so there'd be a couple of thousand, or are you saying a couple of thousand more in uh, absentee voters in twenty twenty than in twenty sixteen? 
again, I'd have to look at that. I don't have it memorized. It's been a while since I've been into the minutia uh, completely in the paper, but you're probably talking about, uh, you know, uh, maybe a couple thousand total. Couple thousand more in 2020 than in, in in 2016. A couple thousand total absentee votes in 2020. So you may be talking about in the hundreds in 2016, and and uh, thousands, uh, you know, a couple thousand or so in 2020. So in in absolute numbers, the difference would be somewhere in the nature of a thousand more absentee votes in 2020 than 2016? Yeah, something like that, roughly. And, um, okay, that's all I have, thanks. Anything, anything else? Nothing all right, thank you very much, Dr. Locke, for your time. You're excused, I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much. All right, take care. Ms. Um, I do have, I think, another witness in the waiting room, but I was going to ask if the chairman would like to have a break now or proceed by the witness. Um, I could go either way. Uh, how long do you anticipate the witness being? Uh, he's an expert, and I don't quite know how long the cost would be. Uh, I'm thinking that the entire testimony would be 30 20 to 45 minutes, and then I, I can't be more precise because I, you know, I just don't know how it's going to roll. Okay. And I think there'll be a Rule 26 objection at the outset as well. All right. So we'll have have <laughs> one of our little discussions. <laughs> just bring in the joy, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hirsch, if I could just make one suggestion. Compare what was supposed to be the expert report in this case, that paper, with the testimony that you just heard. And I mean, maybe it's in there, but the paper is about Pennsylvania and Georgia, and it's all mixed in. There's no statement of his of his opinions. It it is not an adequate expert report, and it is simply unfair to make us examine these witnesses when you ordered an expert report and we didn't get one. All right, Mr. Fox, I will take that into account in evaluating the testimony. And, and, you know, um, I appreciate the concern, and I'm kind of hoping to some extent, since we have a long weekend, that we can mitigate against this to some extent um, in how we handle any other expert information that you'll have more warning about it. Um, because it's a reasonable concern, and I recognize that the question is, well, what should I do about this concern? Um, so, and I don't want to prevent Mr. Clark from putting on his case, although I'm sensitive to the fact that they did, you know, in differing degrees, and you disagree about the extent of it, so I appreciate that too. Um, and to be honest, I haven't read all of Exhibit 500 yet, and I may read it and have a different conclusion after reading it than I might think just listening to counsel's arguments. So I do appreciate that. We have to, you know, operate at some practical level. I, I need to make decisions so we can decide what's happening. Um, so, okay. Um, I do have one thing that I, I need to correct a statement that I made. Okay. To the witness. Uh, the witness didn't say it. I, uh, well, I corrected the witness on something, and I said Mr. Clark was never attorney, acting attorney general. And there was a period uh, on January 3rd where he was the acting attorney general uh, until the president changed his mind later that day. So, okay. Uh, I apologize for the error. Okay. But, uh, would you like me? To, well, I guess Mr. Fox is a Do you want to go right into that? Or uh, All right. Look, why don't we, why don't we take a break until three o'clock and because it sounds like we'll be able to get through the witness and have a little uh, some time left for any any you know housekeeping types of things and scheduling. We can talk about what work. What I'm anticipating then, just so you can prepare for it, is that we'll talk about what we anticipate next week and what's going to happen on Monday, and and you know what you can suggest to make sure that Mr. Fox has notice not just of a collection of stuff, but what exactly the witnesses 
you know, meets and bounds are going to be. And uh, it, it's going to be shorter than than we thought, you know, 10 days ago. Uh -huh. um, so I, I hope that will be greeted as good news. Mm -hmm. um, the order of witnesses and so forth has been very fluid because I didn't know what was going to happen with the Rule 26 objections. I have uh, this next witness is an expert. I have a some fact witnesses lined up to fill the rest of the day, I believe, one of whom is Mr. Wingate, who I spoke to the chairman about yesterday. Mm -hmm. He's available after three, and so my intention would be to put Mr. Wingate up after Dr. Young, and then if we've still got time on the clock for the day and you still want to hear more witnesses, then I put up a couple of more fact witnesses I'm sorry. Uh, after that. Who's the next witness? When, uh, Dr. Young. Oh, Young, okay. Yes, no, I may have misspoken, I apologize. Uh, the, the yeah, so it's Dr. Young, then Mr. Wingate, then perhaps... Then perhaps um, Heidi Stirrup. And then if we still have time uh, after that, um, Andrew Kloster. And if we still have time after that, uh, Representative Matt Gates. Okay. All right, let's see where we go. Okay. All right, we're in recess till three o'clock.
on. Great. Mr. McDougall. Uh, I would call Dr. Samuel Young, but I believe my one of the public has to be 26 of the Okay. Letting him in the room now. Or it does that, could I? Excuse me? Could I make an objection before he does that? Yes, you can oh, make it. I already moved him, brought him in. Do you want me to kick him back out? Uh, yes, why don't you keep him out while we're discussing the objection? Thank you, Ms. Morasas. I don't want to belabor this because you've ruled once, but, but it's the same as last time. I have a half-page expert disclosure. And then attached to that, there was, again, the usual mixture of papers. And yesterday, it was identified to me that two of these were the report. One is R520... I think nine. Um, 20, okay. All right. Uh, 24, I right, said. And uh, it is a declaration that was introduced by Mr. Young and another person, Mr. Quinnell, in another litigation. It does not, you know, you, you can pick through here and maybe try to find something but it does not clearly state what his opinions are going to be in this case. The second thing that they could be was from the same case. It was a supplemental declaration of the two individuals, Mr. Quinnell, Q-U-I-N-N-E-L-L, -L, and Mr. Young. And it's a response to some statement that somebody else made, which I don't have. That's what I got for an expert report for somebody who's going to testify as a statistician. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th th this is just not fair. Uh, the, 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 we're dealing with sophisticated lawyers here. Their client, who's pretty obviously active in this litigation, is the former head of the uh, civil division. They know what an expert report looks like. This is not an expert report, and it is simply not fair. It was produced in, in those papers that were brought to you this morning. So I object to testify. Um, Mr. McDougall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the original production on December 5th anticipated we would be able to present analyses from the post-January 3rd timeframe. So there was a lot more included with the uh, expert disclosure exhibits and you know, sub supporting data. Now, because of the ruling, we're now limiting <clears throat> the subject matter of his testimony to what's set out in these two declarations, which were provided to them in December. <clears throat> and in particular, the first declaration in particular, it identifies the qualifications of Dr. Young and his collaborator, Dr. Cornell. It identifies the data sources, provides hyperlinks to the data sources, describes their methodology, provides uh, 10, 11, 12 different figures or charts to illustrate the analysis and states their opinions and states the limitations of their opinions. And so everything that Rule 26 disclosure requires is contained in those declarations. And he, he could have hired a statistician to uh, prepare him to cross-examine or to rebut the analysis. The analysis is pretty limited, but in my view, it's relevant uh, to what we've been talking about and, you know, what exactly is missing compared to Rule 26 when you read these declarations. I'm going to, over, over, right. I'm going to overrule the objection before next week. We're going to take a break, but I want to, want you with respect to any expert to provide Mr. Fox with a Rule 26 statement, okay? A statement meeting the form of Superior Court Rule 26 that says, here's what the witness is going to testify about and all the other elements of that, so that it is in a form. I sense that part of the problem is that it may not be obvious what pieces go together. I understand some of that may be because because the original plan for these witnesses was limited by the ruling that was made later in the case. And 
it's not a matter you know of assigning fault here it's a matter of getting fair fair warning to to mr fox and i'll take up whether he needs you know time or whatever and as i mentioned i will also take that into account you know as, as, as so far as the panel is concerned in evaluating the testimony and if you know different preparation might have affected that it affects the credibility of the conclusions to some extent so it's in your interest to get to him what you know we what there is it. okay so it just i just want to make one thing clear for the record there is no nothing in these two declarations which says my opinion is a b c d which you would normally expect i don't know what the opinions are that this man is going to give when he gets on the stand yeah i i understand and that's a serious problem i mean I, it, it's not a small problem i look I, I understand i haven't read these things because i haven't seen them yet actually or i haven't focused on them yet been able to focus on them yet so i'm just going on what you folks are telling me and you know we'll go back and we'll look at it and if mr fox is misstating it or you are misstating it we'll see it then right or and I don't mean the stating being intentional lie. I just mean people say things and maybe it's not the way we read it or whatever. Okay. I'm just saying, you know, we feel differently on reading it. But I want to make sure that you've made every good faith effort recognizing that what you really should have done is attached to what all this stuff, a cover thing that complied with Rule 26 in the first place, because that's what the order did require. Okay. All right. Uh, let's proceed with, with Dr. Young then. Thank you, uh, Mr. Letting Chair. Him, letting him in now. Thank you very much, Ms. Barassas. I'm waiting for him to connect to audio. Can you hear us, Dr. Young? He's still not connected to audio. I'm sending him a message. Okay. Oh. Dr. Young, can you hear us? No, I think he canceled that a bit. Ah. Oh. Do I need to send him a text? Uh, um, I just sent him a chat message. I think he saw it with, when he put his hands up. So I'm going to suggest that he can call in if he can't can connect his computer. Nope, he's trying again. Is it that he does not have his mic on? Nope, there he goes. He just connected. Can you hear us now? Uh, he's not on mute now. Dr. Young, are you on mute? He's on mute. Yeah. I just sent him a prompt to unmute. There we go. Can you hear us? We cannot hear you. Dr. Young, uh, I don't think we can hear you. Wait. Ah, I'm hearing something. Well, how about me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you, Dr. Young. Dr. Young, uh, my name is Meryl Hirsch. I'm the air chair of this hearing panel, and I'm going to be the one swearing you in. I appreciate your time um, today. Um, do you want to swear or affirm the truth? Either, either one is fine with me. Okay. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so you got? I do. All right. Could you please? Your full name for the record. Dr. Young, could you please state your full name for the record? Sydney Stanley Young. All right. Thank you, Dr. Young. Please proceed, Mr. McDougall. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Young, uh, how are you employed? Uh, right now, I am uh, self-employed, a consultant. 
and what do you consult on? I consult on statistics and other matters related to statistics. Tell us your educational background. I have a bachelor's degree in science, uh, master of experimental statistics, and a PhD with a joint major in statistics and genetics. From uh, what school? Uh, North Carolina State University. <clears throat> Tell us your professional background. Um, I first went to work at a drug company, Eli Lilly, and then subsequently worked at GlaxoSmithKline, then worked for four or five years at the Institute of uh, National Statistics uh, here in the Research Triangle. And uh, how long have you been engaged in uh, private consulting? Uh, probably since uh, 2004, 2005, somewhere along in there. Have you published any scholarly works in the field of statistics? Uh, yes, I publish fairly widely. I probably have over 60 publications and I have a uh, highly cited book. The title of the book is Resampling Based Multiple Testing, over 3,000 citations. And when you say citations, what, what are you referring to? Uh, well, if you go to Google Scholar and put in S. Stanley Young and then the title of the book, it will come back and it will tell you how many people have cited my book in their papers. It's a sort of a scientist popularity contest or utility contest. All right, sir. And the publications, uh, the 60 or more publications that you refer to, are those in peer-reviewed journals? Uh, most of them are in peer-reviewed journals. Occasionally I write book chapters and things like that, and those are not peer-reviewed. And about how many book chapters do you say you have written? Uh, that broke up. Say it again, please. Uh, how many book chapters have you written? Oh, I don't know, three or four, maybe as many as six or so. I don't keep track of publications that well. All right. Are you a member of any professional or scientific societies? I'm a current member of two societies, uh, the American Statistical Association, where I've been elected to be a fellow, and I'm also a member of the AAAS, uh, and I'm a, elected a fellow there as well. For those that, uh, of us that don't travel in the AAAS circles, what is that? Association for the Advancement of Science, or letters to those affected. It usually goes by triple S. American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in what field are you a member of that society? I was elected in as a statistician, uh, so but I am a general member to the whole to the whole thing. All right. Have you ever taught statistics in at the college or postgraduate level? Uh, yes, I early in my career I taught a course in introductory statistics. Uh, later on, I worked mainly in industry, and then starting about the year 2000, uh, I mentored, co-led uh, uh, thesis work by statisticians at three or four different universities and five or six PhDs. I uh, I mentored, co-managed. Um, did you have occasion to perform any statistical analyses of absentee ballot voting in Fulton County in the November 2020 presidential election? Uh, yes, I did. I worked with Dr. Eric Quinlan, um, and we had a good time trying to figure things out. And did you prepare uh, any declarations or affidavits in connection with that work? Yes, I prepared two, and you've sent me copies of them. Uh, I could read off the. Uh, uh, well, let me. Yeah, go ahead. 
Let me put them on the screen. Dr. Young, let me put them on the screen. Okay, that's fine. And everyone can see them. Okay, uh, I'm now showing a document marked Exhibit R524. Uh, yes, I've seen that, and that's one that I worked on. All right, sir. And you... Signed, is that your signature on page 15? Yes, that is indeed my signature. And you signed the penalty of perjury? Yes. All right. My... I'm now going to show you a document marked Exhibit R-538 and ask if you can identify that document. Uh, yes, I worked on that. That was a response to people that had criticized the first document that you showed. And so... Uh, Eric and I worked on the response to the criticism. All right, sir. And uh, on the page that's on your screen now, is that your signature very faintly above your name? Yes, that's my signature. Okay, thank you. At this point, Your Honor, I will tender Dr. S. Stanley Young as an expert on the statistical analysis uh, represented in exhibits R524 and 538. Mr. Fox. Uh, Dr. Young, my name is Hamilton Fox. Uh, a couple of questions. As a statistician, you work primarily for pharmaceutical companies doing toxicology studies, is that correct? I did, uh, I had uh, corporate wide data access in two pharmaceutical companies. Part of my work was toxicology, but I also worked on drug discovery and I also worked on industrial things. Okay. Uh, I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, could, you, could you repeat the last part of your answer? I couldn't. Uh, you, you're a little muffled, Dr. Uh, Young. Uh, well, uh, I worked on all kinds of things inside pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I worked on toxicology, as you mentioned. I worked on uh, drug discovery. I worked on industrial uh, manufacturing. Uh, as I went through my career, I was given wider and wider access to data. At Eli Lilly, I had access to any data I wanted to look at. And the same at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. I was considered an internal expert and worked in all kinds of areas. Well, I'll pause one second, Mr. Fox. Um, Dr. Young, you, we can hear you, but your voice is kind of muffled. I don't know whether maybe you're using a laptop with a, that's closed so the microphone is covered, or but if it's possible for you to get closer to a microphone, I think it would be easier for all of us to hear you. I was going to make a suggestion. Do you see next to the mute button, there's a little arrow going up on your yep. You click that and go to the audio settings. I want to make sure your microphone is turned all the way up. Uh, so the little arrow, arrow the first option is audio settings. Yeah. So when, when I test my microphone, I see the little blue line going far to the right. Oh, yes. Is it, all, is it all the way to the right, the volume line that's underneath the uh, input level? Your Honor, um, would Mike be better if he dialed dialed in? in yes. Yeah, uh, Ms. Barasas, is yes. it possible to talk Dr. Young through dialing in and not using the computer audio so we don't get an echo that you know breaks down the walls? Okay. But uh, uh, and try to use it, do it that way, because I think have, easier. Yeah. Hearing. Do you have a phone nearby? I have a cell phone here and I'm ready to dial in. Great. So if you choose that same arrow, the second option up says leave computer audio and then switch to phone audio. You can click that and it will give you the phone number to dial in.
mir das dann in der Chat message Uh, I think we can go off the record for working with him. While we're doing that, uh, Mr. McDougall, did you give us any of these hard copy exhibits? Yeah. Okay. There. Um, oh, is in that. Yeah. Okay. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So it's uh, only two out of that giant body. Okay. Uh, five and five thirty-three. Okay, I wanted to make sure what it is I have in front of me because there yeah. tends to be a fair amount. Those are black and white. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're yeah, we're all okay. It's all the black and white, the figures and the uh, 524. Mm -hmm. To really get them, you need to see them in color. And um, what I would propose. Is that I substitute color copy uh, in my first opportunity uh, for your for your violence. Uh, I I think that makes sense. You have any problem, Mr. Fox, with having a color copy? No, I'm going to object to being moved in. I, I think I've seen that this is cool. Okay, but uh, but but, uh, but uh, no. yeah, the, the ability to see the document helps to rule the motion too. <laughs> Ms. Barassas, when Dr. Young has called in, will it come up as a box with a phone number on it so he can tell he's... Yeah, it will come up as a phone and I can actually link his video with the cell phone. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm just sending him the um, talent information in the chat box. Actually, something we could do on the record while we're waiting. I believe that that right before we did this, if I'm incorrect, Mr. McDougall had moved him to be considered as an expert. Um, we could go back on the record and see if there's an objection to that or whatever. Or do you you still have additional questions yes. on your board here? Okay, he, he's joining now. Okay, fine. Thanks. And I'm going to link him together. I'm sorry. Then can you hear us? Hello, can you hear us, Mr. Young? Uh, yes, I can hear you, but I've got to move things around just a second. Okay. Okay, we can hear you better now than before, Dr. Young. I'm trying to figure out how to put you on speakerphone, just a second. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Why don't we continue the questioning? Okay. Uh, Dr. Young, I, I, I don't okay. myself, but is it fair to say that a lot of what you did when you were employed by these pharmaceutical companies were statistical analyses of experiments to evaluate safety of products in animals? Uh, it included that. You have never prior to... Uh, 2020 been involved in analyzing election data. Is that correct? Uh, correct. And you have never qualified to testify as an expert before, except at the Eastman uh, disciplinary proceedings in California, correct? 
Uh, that's not correct. I was hired by the state of North Carolina to look at uh, jury selection procedures. I've been qualified as an expert any time that I've uh, been called to do that. When I say qualified, I mean, I, and I apologize for the confusion, qualified by a court to testify as an expert. Well, in the North Carolina uh, jury selection procedure, uh, I was first employed by the uh, state of North Carolina, and the judge decided he would take me over and uh, call, qualify me as an, elect, uh, as an expert working essentially for him, I guess. Didn't you testify in the Eastman proceedings that you had never been qualified before by a court as an expert? I did. I was qualified in the Eastman thing, but I didn't get all of your thing. I'm having some trouble with your audio. So please repeat your question. I, I know you're qualified in Eastman, and we're going to come to that in a moment. But did you not tell the uh, judge in the Eastman court that you were never offered you never offered expert testimony in any case before as a witness? Uh, the That's correct. I, uh, in the North Carolina situation with the jury selection, the state legislator inter, in, legislature intervened and uh, my testimony was moved at that point. Now in the California proceedings concerning Mr. Eastman, the judge qualified you as an expert in statistics, but would not permit you to offer opinions as to how the statistics relate to election issues. Is that not true? No, that is correct. And that's basically what I'm doing here. So you're not going to testify uh, as to how these uh, how the statistics relate to election issues? Well, I'm looking at election numbers and I'm displaying what I see as a statistician in those numbers. Uh, I worked in a committee uh, of non-paid experts and the, uh, the general rules of the committee were to go down the middle of the road, see what was going on, uh, make comments on what was going on, and then that would be passed on to people that would make decisions. With respect to the 2020 election, uh, you performed something called a contrast analysis. Is that not correct? No, that is correct, but that's not a question here. Uh, you compare the results of the 2016 and 2020 elections? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, Mr. Carter, that's not going to be the subject matter of Dr. Moore's testimony in this case. Now, see, that's the problem. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a fair concern. Uh, at this point, though, we're... Um, Jim, what was the con look, was the contrast analysis to which you refer, Mr. Fox, part of Exhibit 524 or 538? I have no idea. Uh, okay. When you, when you look at those exhibits, uh, uh, you will see why. Uh, okay. Because I'm trying to figure out the, the proffer of the witness was as an expert to testify on what's in, in these two exhibits. So that's how I'm trying to connect the dots. If he's not going to testify as an expert on some of that, then the proffers are broad. That's... I'm not offering him to testify about any contrast analysis. Yeah. That's what it... And these declarations... Could you use the mic? Yes. That's the course I thought. <clears throat> I'm not offering the witness to testify about contrast analysis. The exhibits 528 and 534 do not reflect contrast analysis. Those exhibits have been in Mr. Fox's hands since December the 5th. Uh, okay, I think you yes. switched the numbers when you described the two exhibits. It's 524 and 538, not the opposite. But uh, Thank you for correcting me. But, okay. Uh, you were answering my question. I just get and obviously, I'm basing these questions off this testimony in California. Um, okay. And it's the only thing I've got. Um, let me ask you this. When did you first begin to work on analyzing the 20, results of the 2020 election? Almost immediately thereafter. And when did you complete your analysis? Uh continues to be ongoing. There's chatter back and forth, and I look at things as they come up. Um, did you not 
first public publisher analysis in March of 2021? Uh, you'll have to refresh my memory as to any sort of publication. I've not, I don't have any uh, official science publication, so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, and, and that's my fault because I used the wrong word. Did you first make your uh, final analysis public on, I think, actually St. Patrick's Day in 2021? <laughs> well, I like St. Patrick's Day, but I don't remember if it was that day or not. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, let, I'm going to show you what's been marked as disciplinary council exhibit 54. I'll have your copy. All right. Do I get a copy? Yeah, he's providing you. I'm sorry. Um, and I want to refer you to page 140 and 142. <clears throat> First of all, you let, take a look at this and confirm to me this is your testimony that you gave in California in the Eastman proceedings. I did I did uh, testify in the Eastman proceedings, and I probably participated in this, but I don't see enough here to know whether I had anything to do with it or not. If you'll show him the uh, second page, uh, the, actually the third page. Uh, and you'll see here that you're listed as a witness at the top of the page. Uh, yes, I see that. Okay. And now I, I just want to refer you, and I, I will do this if you want me to put it up, Mr. Hirsch. I would not normally do that. I just refresh the witness, but... I guess I have to put it up. Um, yeah. let, me, let me refer you to page 141. I don't know how the witness could see it if you didn't, so that's also a problem. Did you want 141 at the top or at the bottom? Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to read at, at the top, I want uh, on the first page 140. So we're talking two pages down from where we are. There we go. Okay. So we're at 137. I, mean, yeah. I think it's, uh, so it's page number one, which is probably a little different than the basement. I apologize. Three pages. Okay. May we enlarge it? Yes. We, we can certainly, I mean, I assume it's great for me to say, since I don't have to do it, but I, assuming we have the technology to enlarge it. Uh, I, I just wanted to, what I really want you to do, uh, uh, Dr. Young, is to read the questions and answers that begin at line 16 on 140 and go over to line 8 on the following page and see if that refreshes your number that your report was final, that you made a report on these things on. March 17, 2021. The um, report was an ongoing report. I looked at uh, essentially all states in the United States, except two, I think Maine and Alaska. And uh, the final uh, reports were issued to the committee that I was working with uh, as the work went forward. Uh, the date here is probably uh, correct for the report at that time, but it was an active report uh, and continued. Uh, it, it started immediately after the election and uh, went uh, into 2021. Well, uh, th those are all the questions I have. I don't object uh, to this gentleman being qualified as an expert in statistics. I do object to him being often give opinions that how the statistics relate to election issues. That's what the judge will in California. He's, and I think that ought to be the rule here as well. So, a couple of things, Your Honor. <clears throat> Exhibits five, Exhibit 524. was signed on November 29th of 2020. I can get him to say that, but that's what it shows. And the file stamp at the top, where it was filed into court, is dated December the 3rd, 2020. And Exhibit 538 
was signed December the 6th of 2020 and filed into court the same day. The testimony to which uh, Mr. Fox called Mr. Young's attention is about a different report than these two declarations. This testimony is about the contrast analysis report. And if you look at page 138, don't put that on the screen for us, page 138. 138 of what? Uh, that transcript that he was showing. Oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. And I think that's going to be up to uh, his paralegal. Or maybe, is it Ms. Ford has that? It, his, okay. his co-counsel, I think, is being... Oh, is it co-counsel? No. Okay. Yeah. But, but uh, all right. So He's you want the, troops the page, page that says 138 at the top of right. ex exhibit uh, disciplinary council's exhibit 54. And uh, in the middle of the page, uh, line 10, any other data or sources that you looked at as a part of your preparation of the contrast analysis other than what we've already talked about, Dr. Young? No. Then if you go forward to page 140, Line four. Okay. And was this the only report that she prepared with respect to the 2020 election? Answer, no. I worked with Eric Cornell on some county data. And so the premise of the objection. I think it's going to be qualified as Okay. Look, honestly, at this point, I don't know precisely what, what he's going to talk about, okay? What I've heard from the parties is that in the California proceeding um, involving Mr. Eastman, the, Ms. Dr. Young testified as an expert in some way limited to statistics, but not its application to elections. I'm not sure whether you're offering him in some broader way here. And, which is an issue that doesn't go to what he testified there, but it goes to what his qualifications are to testify here, I think. So if you could clarify, are you offering him for a broader purpose than he was accepted as an expert in the California proceeding, recognizing he was talking about something different in California is what I get. I'm offering him for a narrow scope of testimony, which is going to be limited what is set forth in R5.4 and 538, okay. which is it, it does not include anything about a contrast analysis. Hey, the, for my question, contrast analysis is a distractor. Okay. okay. Put that to one side. Okay. I'm trying, you have a motion that I approve him as an expert. What is the scope of the expertise that you're asking me to to approve him as an expert of? I'm going to. I know it's heading for a proposition. <laughs> he is going to testify to his opinions derived from his analysis of absolute vote data in Fulton County in the 2012 election, and the uh, testimony that I expect he will give is that the data uh, is extremely. A aberrant, extremely abnormal, extremely improbable, and that it uh, is a uh, a result that mathematically and statistically is so abnormal that it cannot be true. And the um, and that will support their uh, the additional opinion that the question of absentee ballot. So integrity in Fulton County was worth further investigation. And that will be the nature of this testimony. Okay. And then, all right. So, Mr. Fox, identified in that way, do you object to Dr. Young being called as an expert? Okay. I, I'm not sure what, I mean, if I had an expert report, I, I could give you a, a a straight answer. Um, the what it sounded like Mr. McDougal was uh, suggesting was that he was going to be making assumptions about what the normal voting patterns would be and why these were different. And I don't think he qualified in that regard. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, oh, hold, up, up, hold up, Doctor. Yeah. Huh. Continue. Uh, that, that, that's that's essentially what we want. So. All right. Look, I will. I, I will provisionally approve uh, his testimony as an expert. If it turns out that what he testifies to, I don't know what he's going to say in support of your point. Okay, and one of them could be be you know I voted twelve times and I and here's what I think how I think an election works and maybe that's beyond his expertise. Okay, I don't know. I, I don't assume that's what he's going to say. I assume from your statement he's going to say I'm a statistician and here's here's what a what statistical analysis I did and this is how this works. Um, and as I understand Mr. Fox's position, he doesn't object to him being used as a statistician. He does uh, object to the extent it's involving some particular election related expertise and I don't know whether his testimony crosses that line or not so provisionally I'll approve him on right. that basis um, thank you Mr. Chair <clears throat> Dr. Young as a general yeah. matter, as a general matter what benefits or insights the statistical analysis provide um Statistical analysis is usually used uh, looking at data and trying to decide whether what you're looking at is uh, likely to replicate real in a, in a sense or whether it's likely due to chance and unlikely to replicate. So statisticians help scientists and all kinds of people try and discern uh, the reliability of data. Is statistical analysis applicable to more than one field? It's broadly applicable. I have a t-shirt and it has 30 different fields under it on the back of the t-shirt and I wear it around proudly. These are all the different fields that statistical analysis has uh, been used in. Everything, essentially. Your cell phone was designed using statistical methods. Your food is produced using statistical methods. Uh, it's basically everywhere. In the history of statistics, does it have any relationship to the production of beer? Uh, yeah, one of the first uses of statistics was uh, at a brewery. Uh, and a very famous statistician had to slap a name uh, student on his paper. Uh, and it's variably uh, argued that he put that name on so that people wouldn't know that he was helping in the production of beer, giving away a trade secret. Or it was thought that uh, a mere statistician working at a brewery was not worthy of going into a scientific paper. There's a footnote on that. I got called in on a special project at Eli Lilly. Uh, they were working on fermentation. And so I worked with a series of engineers and ultimately using statistical methods, we were able to double the yield of penicillin production in a fermentation vat. Uh, and this fermentation was a process that had been going on for 20 years. And in one uh, particularly noteworthy experiment, uh, designed statistically, we were able to double the production. Uh, it got me gold stars and clusters. Uh, Dr. Young, is this type of statistical analysis limited to just one type of data? No, virtually all kinds of data can be used. Uh, cell phone data, tracking data, um, really, the use of statistics uh, with numerical data is only limited by your imagination and occasionally by computing power. Is there anything to be learned by the application of statistical analysis to election or voting data? There certainly is, and uh, I'll speak to that, and the work that Eric Quinlan and I did. All right, sir. Uh, have you done any statistical analysis of absentee voting in the Fulton? Yes. 
I have, let me finish the question. You, Thank you. Let me finish. Go ahead. Uh, have you done any statistical analysis of absentee balloting in the 2020 presidential election in Fulton County? Yes. All right, sir. And earlier I asked you to identify Exhibit R528, 524, I keep making that mistake, R524. Is this, uh, does this declaration describe the analysis that you did of absentee balloting in Fulton County in the November 2020 presidential election? Yes, that is the first report of our work. And does it describe the sources of data? Uh, yes, we used public data. And I think on uh, item 11 or so, we used, uh, uh, where is it? We used uh, two or three different sources of data. All the data was public. And we made the point later in the uh, in the declaration or the report that anyone could replicate our work by going and fetching the data and then following the uh, directions that we did in our analysis. All right, and on the screen now, you see paragraph 17 and 18. Well, this has been moved into evidence. So I don't think we already published it, at least until it is. Well, if I have to do that, I move it into evidence now. And I object because I don't think actually this isn't an expert report, but I don't think expert reports should be admitted either. Okay, it's well, their ears. I'm trying to get the witness to say what the data sources were and according to the document to the precious recollection. So, I'll admit the exhibit um, okay. for whatever it's worth, recognizing that what it, you know, what it appears to be is an affidavit that summarizes various things related to some type of analysis that he's in the process of describing. I wasn't originally intending to tender the document into evidence. Um, okay. Well, I don't want to force you to do that. Look, I don't want to get overly formalistic okay. here. I, okay. It's possible the witness unaided, you know, technically speaking, the witness should first profess an inability to answer the question before you show him a document, which in effect leads him to, to what the answer is. Okay. okay. Um, and we can go through that route and, you know, from the way the witness is handling it, I don't know that he professes any lack of, you know, recollection okay. of what he looked at. So, so, you know, we can proceed that way and I'm okay with it. And if you don't want to offer the exhibit, you know, I, I think we could just start with this unaided recollection and see whether there really is any need to take it through it. Dr. Young, uh, can you describe the data that you and Mr. Dr. Fornell used for the analysis that you performed of the Fulton County absentee ballot voting. Can you describe? Repeat the question. Can you identify? Repeat the question, please. Yeah. Can you identify the data and data sources that were used in your analysis? Yes, those are the data sources. All right, sir. What was the date that you signed Exhibit 524? Uh, 524 was uh, absentee ballot data, and uh, that was uh, collected from those sources, and the absentee ballot data was the focus of the uh, analysis in, in this particular report. And when did you sign that report, R524? Uh, we found several interesting things. Uh, the data was reported. Uh, yeah, hold on. You asked a very specific question. When did you sign the document? That's the question you, you're asked. So that's what you should uh, want to. I signed the document November 29th, 2020. And uh, looking up at the top of each page, do you see some text that has a, a date 
uh, indicating the date of filing? Uh, yes. The what file date? date was 12. The file date was 12 03 20. 20. Right, sir. What methods of analysis did you apply to the data that you collected? Uh, we used several forms of analysis uh, simple counting, examining distributions. And occasionally we used uh, other simple methods, regression analysis, things like that. Uh, all of the analysis was pretty, the actual uh, form of the analysis was pretty simple. And uh, you said something about distributions. What does that mean? Um, election data, as many forms of data, if you look at a distribution, it forms uh, what's called the bell-shaped curve. So low going up, peaking, coming down, and then going off to the right. Looks like a bell if you look at it. Uh, many forms of data, uh, if you look at their distribution, uh, exhibits a bell-shaped curve. So we used uh, that method of looking at the data. All right, sir. And as a result of the analyses that you performed, on the Fulton County absentee balloting data from the November 2020 election, did you make any notable observations? Uh, yes. Uh, our first observation was just the timestamps of the data itself. The data, this was absentee data, so people sent in their absentee ballots to the election people. Then uh, on November 4th, uh, there was a report from the election people on part of the data. And then on uh, November 5th, there was another large uh, drop of data. And then there were dribs and drabs of data that went on for another 10 days or so. But the two main drops of data were on November 4th and on November 5th. Um, we found those interesting in and of themselves. And why were they interesting in and of themselves? The first interesting question was that the number of records, number of uh, absentee ballots that came out on those two days were very, very similar. Uh, over 70,000 ballots, the two drops of data uh, differed by only just 50 or so ballots. So it was a bit curious to us as to um, why there were two drops of data. Uh, and then subsequently, we learned uh, from other people criticizing in this area. Uh, the presumption was that essentially all of the absentee ballot data was in the hands of the uh, ballot counters on November 3rd. And then looking at the two drops of data, uh, the Trump data was dropped on November 4th, and on November 5th, the absentee ballots for the uh, Biden, for Biden were, were dropped. Um, the two drops of data were essentially segregated, Trump and Biden, uh, rather than, and um, we puzzled about why they didn't just release both drops of data on the fourth, uh, presuming that they had them uh, in hand, but they did not. They they dropped November fourth. They dropped Trump, and on November fifth, they dropped uh, Biden. All right. Sir. Any other notable observations? Uh, yes, we uh, then looked at the uh, the data in the two pieces of data. We looked at the Trump data and did a distribution of that and saw what looked like roughly a bell-shaped curve, data uh, normality, a normal distribution. And that was exactly what we expected. There are little idiosyncrasies here and there, but it looked pretty normal. We did standard tests for normality and it was pretty close. Uh, then we looked at the Biden data 
and we applied the same test and the same visual inspection. And the Biden data was not normally distributed. It was uh, very anomalous uh, relative to a normal distribution. That we found odd because the data came into the uh, Georgia vote counting area uh, in a stream as people would mail things in. And so uh, we found it very odd that part of the data was following a normal distribution and part of the data was not following a normal distribution. And that's segmented by Trump versus Biden. And when you say it's unusual to have the uh, November 4th absentee ballots have a normal distribution and the November 5th ballots to not have a normal distribution, what is the significance of that? Well, you imagine if there is a data generating process, absentee ballots, uh, coming through a procedure, uh, you would expect the data coming out of that procedure um, to be the same. So at one level, you would, uh, whatever the distribution was, you would expect the distribution to be the same both for Biden and for Trump. Objection. Uh, now the this testimony is based on some assumptions he's making about how absentee ballots are collected, uh, counted, distributed, and released in Georgia. And that's not a subject on which he's an expert. Well, so he says you would expect, that's the assumption that, we're, that, that he's making. Um, Mr. Fox, I think your point may be correct, uh, but I think that's something either Mr. McDougall can backfill on or you can ask him about what assumptions go to, to, to his statement. Um, but since we sort of, well, all right, and anyway, why don't you continue, Mr. McDougall? I think I was asking you about the significance of the normal distribution in the first half of the data and the abnormal distribution in the second half of the data. What is the significance of that, if any, Dr. Young? We would normally expect both sets of data to follow the normal distribution. The first, the Trump data did. The second, the Biden data did not. That's just an observation. Why would you expect it to have a normal distribution? Um, the voting process is much like many processes. It is based on lots of small effects pushing things here and there. Under those assumptions, you expect to see a normal distribution. Um, height of individuals follows the normal distribution. IQ of individuals follows the normal distribution. All kinds of things follow a normal distribution, including um, voting. So if the process is following a normal, uh, procedurally uh, common way of things coming in, uh, one would expect a normal distribution. Did you form an opinion as to the validity of the data based on the difference in the distribution between the normal, the November 4th ballots and the November 5th ballots? And the objection, same objection. He's not qualified to make that assumption or that give that opinion because he's not an expert on how this information or how these votes are counted, accumulated, distributed. It's, uh, first of all, what, I'm going to overrule the objection. Bas basically the same, you know, it's the same point I made in response to your last objection. The witness is saying his conclusion. It's not unusual to say, did you conclude something? And then ask what the basis is for the conclusion. 
if the basis doesn't support the conclusion, the conclusion's invalid. But but saying, you know, he may not have a reason, he may have a reason, or he may have been you know, told stuff by other experts. There's a lot of possibilities. I just don't know what's, where it goes. I'll rephrase the question. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll solve the problem. The uh, difference, does the difference in the distribution between the November 4th ballots and the November 5th ballots tell us anything about the validity of the data? The uh, data generating process on the other side, uh, inside the data collection, so forth, uh, one would expect, and I expect, that the date, you know, how data was processed by the counters uh, would be similar in both situations. And uh, in looking at uh, the two distributions are vastly different from each other. Uh, Eric is an expert in uh, production statistics. I am also. Uh, the two distributions were so dramatically different from one another. Uh, we would have closed down production and we would have done a search for the error process that had been introduced. Um, 50 years ago, people just looked at data uh, manufacturing data, and if the widget was not very good, they'd simply throw it away. Uh, Deming uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s created a revolution in industrial statistics. He said producing a bad widget is just as expensive as producing a good widget. So he recommended shutting production down and going and find the cause of the error. And uh, Eric is involved in uh, producing semiconductor things. Uh, his comment was, we would close it down and find out what went wrong. So the two distributions were so dramatically different from each other. Uh, in an industrial situation, you would say something has gone wrong. We need to find the problem and fix it. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying what went wrong, but the two distributions were dramatically different from each other, sufficiently different uh, that they did not come from the same data generating process. Now, Dr. Young, do you claim that the analyses that you performed prove there was absentee ballot fraud? I did not make that claim, and uh, our process in the group that I was working with was to uh, figure out what we think is going on. Here we see uh, what looks to be a serious problem. We then pass that up to the leader of the group, uh, John Droz. And John Droz was in contact with other people outside of our group. I would say that what we discovered was sufficiently disturbing that anyone reading our report and following John Droz uh, should have been upset. So what, if anything, does it prove? Repeat, please. Yes, what, thing, what, if anything, does your analysis show if it doesn't prove fraud? Um. Proving fraud would require uh, going back and doing a forensic examination of the whole process. Just as in industrial work, you would go back and look at all the steps in the production process. So the results are sufficiently dire that something is going wrong, and a forensic audit would be uh, appropriate in a, in a voting situation, checking voter signatures, checking uh, uh, how the ballots were carried through, how they were generated, registrations. There are all kinds of things that they could check that I'm not an expert in. But in industrial work, we would go back through the entire industrial process, checking machines, checking raw materials, things like that, and we would fix it as 
uh, Edwards Deming said, and then start producing good widgets. All right, sir, did you uh, have occasion to prepare a supplemental declaration in this same case? Uh, yes, our first report was evaluated by a uh, PhD and one of his graduate students, I presume, and they raised various objections. And so um, we were tipped off in their um, um, attack on what we were doing. Uh, they noted that uh, essentially all the absentee ballots were in place with the counters before the election day. And that fits with the fact that we saw essentially in two days, we essentially saw all of the absentee ballots, all by Trump on day four, November 4th, and Biden on uh, November 5th. All right, sir. And is exhibit R538 the supplemental declaration to which you were just referring? Uh, yes, it is. And uh, you see the, do you remember what date that was filed in court? It was filed pretty close to my birthday, I think, uh, November 19th or so. Let me look. Well, uh, if I could ask you to look at the top of the page on R-538 and see if that was... Oh, filed. Oh, yeah, you're filing. It was on 12-6-2020. Uh, I'm sorry. Say again, Dr. Young. The, uh, it was filed on 12-06-2020. And, and, so, and this was in response to uh, opposition experts? Uh, yes, it was. Did <clears throat> anything that was presented by the opposition experts cause you to change your conclusions? Uh, no. We, uh, in fact, it reinforced our conclusions, as we said in our report. They... Uh, provided some facts, and when we considered those facts, it made our conclusions even stronger. Your Honor, at this point, I will tender into evidence exhibits R524 and R538. No, I, I thought you weren't intending to offer I, them, which is... I'm changing my mind. Okay. I'm I judging. I understand. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll allow them for what they're worth in explaining the testimony. <laughs> All right, you're going to switch Dr. Young, um, yeah, I need to take that Oh, I'm sorry. Here you go. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Young, what was the litigation in, in, in connection to which you filed these two uh, declarations? Um. These were reports that we were doing based on looking at the data. I don't know that there was any litigation at the time. There may have been, but we were simply uh, going through lots of data, and this uh, turned up as a project that Eric and I worked on. The, the, the captions at the top of the pages that Mr. McDougall had you look at, I believe, indicate they were filed in court. Is that not the case? Uh, repeat your last sentence, please. Uh, I said that the, the, the captions at the top of the pages of your declaration that Mr. McDougall discussed with you, uh, I believe, are an, yeah, are an indication they're filed in court. You see here it says case 1.20 CV. as generally means it's a civil case filed in 2020. You aware of that? I do not remember. I do not remember the particular case. Who asked you? To, thank you. Who asked you to uh, to write these? Um, there were a team of about six to ten, varying over time, looking at various aspects of the uh, election, twenty twenty election, and. Uh, we would look at one thing or another depending upon what seemed uh, a fruitful thing to look at. No, no, I, I, you may have misunderstood my question. I'm asking, so this is a formal declaration used in court. Who asked you 
put it together. Um, the direction to me came from John Droz, the leader of the team, and I don't know who asked him or who talked to him. Did you uh, ever testify in this proceeding? No, I did not testify in this. Do you know the names of any of the lawyers who were representing? Do you know where your, your declaration was submitted for the prospect for the uh, plaintiff for the defendant? Uh, beyond the direction from John Droz to me and the work that I did with uh, Eric, I do not who know who instituted, and I do not know if there was a, a case. You indicate that there is a case. Uh, you have the numbers, I presume. You can follow it up and find out what the case was. Uh, I can do that, but my question is, do you know what case it was that you were following this declaration? And I take it your answer is no. I do not know what the case was. I know what the numbers were. Okay. And um, you never talked to any lawyers for either side about this case? I talked to some lawyers in the Eastman case. Uh, but I talked to very few lawyers during this whole process. I'm not that was outside the committee. Uh, talking to lawyers was largely outside of the committee. The John Droz and other people would would uh, interface with all kinds of people, but I don't know who they interfaced with and didn't care very much about it one way or the other. When you talk about a committee, this was a group of people organized by John Rose to uh statistically attack the results of the 2020 election is that not the case uh we did various things we had uh computer scientists we had uh, retired uh government analysts that looked at all kinds of secrety sort of stuff uh, we had uh several statisticians uh, i was just a sort of an ad hoc group uh formed together to, to look at the election. And, and this group was put together shortly after the election uh, because the members were disappointed in the result, correct? Well, I was sort of surprised more than disappointed. Uh, there was a lot of chatter on both sides. Uh, and so we said, well, uh, and John was hard driving of that. We needed to argue from data and analysis, not emotion. And so uh, several people got together and looked at it. There were things that we looked at that we finally decided, well, that was okay. And there were other things that we looked at and we said, well, that's not okay. And were all the members of this committee supporters of President Trump? What? Were all the members of this committee that Mr. Rose put together supporters of President Trump? I don't know. I didn't ask them. You were the most, correct? I voted for Trump. Uh, 70 million people voted for Trump. In fact, Mr. Trump appointed you to a position, did he not? I was appointed uh, to a position uh, on the environment, at the Environmental uh, Protection Agency. I am an expert in air pollution statistical analysis. And I was one of 45 people appointed to that committee, included right. statisticians, toxicologists, and so forth and so on. By President Trump. What? And, and that was by President Trump. He's the person appointed. Well, I was, uh, I assume, well, I don't even assume that Trump knew what was going on. Uh, I was appointed by the head of the EPA. And uh, when Biden was elected, what happened? Um, when Biden what? Uh, Biden uh, was a very interesting sort of thing. Uh, the committee had 15 members appointed each year, and it was a rolling thing. So the next year, another 15 would go on and another 15 would go off. Uh, when Biden came in, uh, the whole committee was summarily fired. Now, do you live in Georgia? Do I what? Live in Georgia. 
I'm sorry, it's breaking up. I can't. Um, uh, do you live in the state of Georgia? Uh, no, sir, I do not. And are you familiar with the election procedures in the state of Georgia? Only what I read in the newspapers. Well, for example, if an absentee ballot was dated before the election but not received until, until after the election, would it be counted in Georgia? Uh, the voting rules change from state to state. Uh, the thing that I do know is virtually all of the absentee ballots were in place on uh, November 3rd, and that's by the expert witnesses on the other people that were, were chattering with us about it. So, so uh, if there... I'm sorry. Yes? It is the answer to my question that you don't know whether a ballot that was dated or postmarked before November 3, but received after November 3 would be counted? I do not know. Now, um, do you know that in Georgia, even though the absentee ballots are mailed in to central location, they are attributed to the precinct in which the voter is registered to vote? You know that? That is my understanding. Okay. That is my understanding. And so... Because it, when, we, when, we, when we looked at the data, we could ascribe votes to particular precincts, although they called them counties for reasons I don't understand. And so it is likely, is it not, that these absentee ballots were segregated in some fashion by precincts? Uh, depends on the computer science. I don't know that. Uh, do you know whether it's like, do you know whether precincts were counted in clumps? My understanding was that all of the counting of absentee ballots was done centrally and the count, the, the ballots were assigned to precincts. That could be done uh, just by hand or it could be done by computer. And I don't know which way it was done. And, and um, do you know whether ballots that were received from a particular oh, withdrawn? You're aware that there were some drop boxes that were used in Georgia, correct? Um, drop boxes were used in various states. I do not know whether they were used in uh, Georgia or not. So you don't know whether all the votes that were deposited in one drop box were counted at the same time, correct? I don't think it makes any difference if you see the count. I don't know whether, how they were done. Not asking whether you think it makes a difference. Do you know the answer to my question? No, of course not. Um, I will add, I will add, the people counting the ballots assigned each ballot to a particular precinct or county, as they call it. And I saw the numbers and how they got into their little cubby holes. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, you are aware that uh, party affiliation is not randomly distributed across the geographically across Georgia, right? We're looking at uh, Fulton County. We're not looking across Georgia. All right. Do you know whether uh, party affiliation is randomly distributed across Fulton County? The people in Fulton County uh, vote in particular precincts. If they're doing absentee, they put their absentee ballot in an envelope sign the envelope, and send it in. That's not the question I asked you, sir. I'm asking you whether party affiliation is randomly distributed geographically across Holden County. Uh, no, it's not. Of course not. It is Buckhead part of Holden County? Uh, 
Repeat that again, please. Is Buckhead part of Fulton County? I'm sorry. I'm, I assume you're hearing me, but I'm not hearing you distinctly. I, I, so let me try it again. Is Buckhead, B U C K H E A D, one word, part of Fulton County? There are several counties in and around Atlanta. We looked at uh, only Fulton County. Not the question I asked. Is Buckhead part of Fulton County? Was it part of one of those other counties? Not that I know of. You don't know which county it's part. We were looking at the precincts of the county, and the votes were assigned to precinct. That gave us our numbers, and which particular city or anything uh, beyond the precinct, uh, we had no 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 knowledge of. We could look it up, but we didn't. There were 384 precincts in Fulton County, is that correct? I thought it was 373, but I don't remember exact numbers. And is it is it a fact that six went for Trump? Again, repeat. Is it a fact that six of the precincts in, in Fulton County voted for Trump? Uh, we did look at the distribution of votes within precincts. Uh, and there was a uh, distribution. Uh, there were some uh, precincts that uh, voted entirely for Trump, very few, and some precincts that voted entirely for uh, Biden, again, relatively few. There was a distribution of um, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the different precincts, and we could look at that. My, my question was, is it, is it true that only six precincts voted for Trump? I don't know. And um, with respect to the mechanics of how absentee ballots are assembled, do you know how that, what that was in Fulton County? Uh, beyond mailing the ballots in and then the ballot ballot handlers taking care of it. No, I don't know. Yeah, but what, once the ballots are received, what's the process for how they're given to the people who are going to count? Do you know what that process is? I do not know what the process is. I do know the numbers were assigned to precincts, and I looked at that data. Do you know... Um, what the process was in Fulton County for tallying the ballots. Uh, I am told that uh, the envelope had a signature on it and the signature was supposed to be checked and, and validated. And then once validated, it was supposed to be tallied into its appropriate box. Uh, and that's that what I understand. Go on. And it's really let, 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 let me finish his answer. He was discussing what he knew about the process yeah. of tallying. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were finished. Dr. Young, do you want to, you were saying uh, the process of tallying, you discussed signature check, and then you said something like once once that was done, and I didn't hear the rest of your answer. So. Okay. Uh, I presume the person would fill out their ballot, they would sign their ballot, they would put their ballot in an envelope, the envelope would be mailed in, and then the people processing the envelope would check the signature for verification, they would take the ballot out, and then it would be tallied either by hand or by electronics, and the ballot would then be assigned to their precinct. And that would then create a data file, which ultimately was disclosed on the fourth and the fifth, and then I could look at the uh, the data. And you you said in, in in that answer you presumed that to be the case. Do you know, in fact, if that was the case? Uh, I do not know if the procedures that I just described were followed or not. Uh, I saw the data. 
assigned to precincts coming out on the 4th and the 5th. Uh, the procedure before that, uh, I assume the state of Georgia is maintaining a good process. And so what went on in that process, I did not need to know. Because once they put the data out publicly, uh, I'm working with the data that I see. Uh, and you don't know, for example, when the ballots are received, if they are assigned to a precinct before they are open to count. I do not know that. Okay. I assume they assign the data to the correct precinct. Um, and if they were clumped by a precinct, you would expect when the ballots assigned to that particular precinct were counted, if they were heavily Democratic, that would be what an upsurge in Democratic votes to count, correct? Uh, the procedures for challenging ballots, uh, I did not uh, have anything to do with. The uh, people running the election in Georgia have a responsibility to follow good procedures. They have a, a responsibility to assign the data to the proper place. And that's where my analysis started. And um, so the answer to my question is that you don't know what the process is as to how these ballots are segregated and how they are counted, correct? That's correct. Now, do you know how soon after the ballots are counted, the results are reported? The ballots are counted over a, a couple of weeks. They're, held, they're counted before the election, and they are ready to be posted. Um, and two tranches were, were posted. One was uh, posted the absentee ballots for uh, Trump were posted on the 4th, and the absentee ballots for uh, Biden were posted on the 5th. And my understanding, both from looking at the data and looking at the expert witnesses that criticized, or experts that criticized what we were doing, that virtually all of the uh, absentee ballots were in place and in the hands of the election counters on November 3rd. Is, is, did I hear you? Did, I may have misheard you, but were, are you saying that some absentee ballots were counted before the close of the polls on the 3rd? From reading uh, the literature, that is my understanding. That is, in fact, what the experts uh, wrote that were criticizing our work. They said counting could occur as the ballots were received and then uh, based on data that was posted it was pretty obvious that uh, if you can post everything on the fourth and the fifth uh, they must have done some processing before before that um, and and the final thing i point i want to make is that you do understand that there is a difference between the time when the ballots are counted and the time when the results are posted. You understand that? Please say that again, please. I'm sorry. You understand there's a difference between when the time the time when the ballots are counted and the time when the results are posted. Yes, my understanding, based on uh, experts uh, in the area, was uh, the ballot counting could occur as the ballot ballots were received within a window of time. And then um, the ballots were, most of the absentee ballots were posted either on the 4th or the 5th. A very small number were not posted, or they were posted later. Thanks, those are all the questions. Dr. Young. You mentioned at one point a bell curve and at another point a normal distribution. 
Is there any difference between those two? Uh, I object. This is not, nothing about this was going into a cross examination. It is beyond the scope of cross, but I'll allow it. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Yu. Dr. Young, is there any difference between uh, a bell curve distribution and a normal distribution? The bell curve name is the common vernacular for a normal distribution. They're typically one and the same. All right. That's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Uh, none of us had any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Young. Really appreciate your time and sorry about the technical difficulties. Yes, I'm uh, sorry too. I'm, my hand is getting tired from holding the cell phone. Good, it's a light one. Yeah. I enjoyed the, uh, the interaction. Thank you. Okay. What's next? I believe uh, Mr. Andrew Kloster is in the waiting room. All right. Yep. Ready for me to let him in? Yeah. Uh, yes, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. He's joining now. While Mr. Kloster is coming in, are there specific exhibits we ought to have no. around for this? Okay. Hello, Mr. Kloster, can you hear me? Okay. Can you speak so we can make sure we can hear you? Yep, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Meryl Hirsch. I'm the chair of this hearing committee, and I'm going to swear you in. Would you like to swear or affirm the, the truth of your testimony? I do. I, what, would you, which would you prefer is the question. I haven't yet. Oh, I swear. Okay. okay. All right. Raise your right hand again. I appreciate it. All right. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? I do. All right. Could you please state your full name for the record? Andrew Richard Kloster, A L O S T E R. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kloster. Please proceed, Mr. McDougall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kloster, how are you currently employed? I'm currently employed as the general counsel for Representative Matt Gates in the House of, Empl uh, House of Representatives. Uh, does that mean that you are a lawyer? Yes, I am. I'm a barred attorney in the state of New York. And how long have you been a lawyer? I've been barred since 2011 with no adverse uh, record of any kind. <clears throat> and were you ever in private practice or government practice other than your current position? Yes, I have been. Uh, take us through your professional work history, if you will. Okay. I've spent... Uh, you know, upon being barred, um, I served as a legal fellow at the uh, then uh, a nonprofit uh, foundation for individual rights and education based out of Philadelphia. I was there on a term fellowship. I then spent four years as a, a legal fellow, largely doing policy work at the Heritage Foundation in D.C. I then clerked on the Seventh Circuit uh, Federal United States Court of Appeals. Uh, for a year for Judge Mannion in uh, Chicago. I then served in a variety of positions um, in the executive branch, beginning as the Associate General Counsel at the U.S. Department of Transportation from 2017 to 2019. Uh, I then taught at George Mason's Law School in Northern Virginia for a year before going back into the executive branch um, in the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency as the Deputy Associate Administrator for Policy. 
I then served in the White House on a detail to the White House Office of Presidential Personnel. I then served, let's see, uh, and then beginning in 2020, I uh, served until the end of the last administration as the Deputy General Counsel and then Acting General Counsel at the United States Office of Personnel Management while maintaining my White House duties as Associate Director of that office. Um, I then entered private practice in 2020. Um, for a time, I was associated with a firm that does nonprofit and tax work, Compass Legal Group. And then I started work with uh, in the House uh, in, let's see, February of 2023. And I've been there continuously. All right, sir. Uh, while you were serving in the White House, uh, that was under President Trump? That's correct. And in that role, did you have any contact with issues relating to the November 2020 presidential election and whether there were any problems? I did. Um, really, I would say there were election integrity issues that crossed my desk you know, beginning earlier in the year, say March or April of 2020. Um, but it began in earnest, I would say, in October of 2020. All right, sir. And did that continue into the post-election period? It did. <clears throat> and did you have occasion to report any election integrity issues to anyone at the Department of Justice? I did. I had a variety of contacts there, um, including in the Civil Rights Division. And I'm forgetting what the name of the election unit is within the CRD. Um, but I did have uh, a few contacts there. I also had contacts in the front office, the Office of the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General. Um, I had been hired. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, what was the nature of your contacts with those officials in the post-election period? What was the subject matter of those contacts? Well, you know, um, you find, you know, political appointees, particularly senior ones, have uh, sort of not, it's not really within their position description, but they receive a lot of information from a variety of people you know, whistleblowing or raising issues across the country in a variety of program areas. A large part of what the job of the political appointee to, is to do is to, you know, lightly vet those folks and then forward them as appropriate to other other officials within the government. This is, I mean, it's really the same between career and non-career, but uh, non-careers have a bit more flexibility. So uh, my, the nature of my uh, communications would be I might receive some sort of um, you know, whether it's a donor or, or trusted political operative or, you know, state representative or someone, I would receive information uh, about some allegation and then, you know, to the extent possible, run some, do some preliminary rundown on vetting and then package and forward that material as appropriate. All right. And I believe you said you sent it to the civil CRD as well. Um, I mean, if it was election related, I did have a particular contact there. Um, a few, actually. Tell the panel what CRD is. The Civil Rights Division within the, the Department of Justice. One subcomponent of that component of DOJ does have um, primary jurisdiction over election-related issues, uh, specific statutes. All right, sir. And uh, were the matters that, and you referred matters then over to the Civil Rights Division and the subunit that handles election matters that you're talking about? Um, yeah, as 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 appropriate. Yes, some of that now uh, due to certain political sensitivities. Um, you know, I I was relatively insulated within my job, but due to certain political sensitivities, you know, occasionally people would get would have would be turf conscious or get upset or not want someone putting something additional onto their plate. Um, so I would try to be sensitive to how I would how I would send things in. You know, uh, and, and the you know level of intensity. All right, sir. And uh, you said you also uh, referred election integrity matters over to the 
attorney general's office or the deputy attorney general's office? I did have a contact on one occasion, I mean, that I alerted probably on more than one occasion, but relevant to the 2020 election on one occasion, I did I did raise uh, an issue to the to the to the chief of staff for the attorney general at the time, whom I knew from my time at Heritage. He had at the time been, I believe, Senator Lee's counsel. That would be Will Levy. And what was the uh, election integrity matter he reported over to Mr. Levy? Well, one in particular comes to mind that I think is 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 relevant, which would be, you know, in about late October of 2020, um, through the grapevine, I had forwarded to me um, an incident coming out of Muskegon, Michigan. Um, there had been, um, and this was all. This is now all publicly available. There was, you know, the fact of the arrest, the press release by the Muskegon County. Department and a variety of public reportings available on this incident, but I, in real time, was alerted to an arrest in Muskegon County, Michigan, that a woman had been idling outside of a drop box um, for ballots that she'd been picked up on that basis. I can continue. Please do. Yeah, um, I I was told uh, by an intermediary and later spoke and texted with the uh, the uh, officer in charge at the time. That the woman had been picked up for with you know a large amount of what were said to be uh ballots that she was dropping off at this one location she was arrested on that basis the uh she was then released there was a junior officer who had done the arrest the senior officer who was like a 20-year vet or something like that of the force when he gets back in the office said why did you release her because we had a lot of information on her they then did a fairly routine inter intrastate extradition request to Detroit, is my understanding. Detroit refused to extradite this woman. She had some connection to a particular party. Um, at that point, the senior officer in charge reported to me that he began getting a lot of blowback. He was very concerned, and he believed that there was some sort of political pressure being brought to bear to cover this up. The Incident, as it was publicly reported, I think said that they may have been blank voter registration forms, but at the time, and the officer maintained they were ballots and that this was some sort of cover-up going on. So he said, please have someone contact me from DOJ uh, because this might be a public integrity issue. That's a separate component within DOJ related to political corruption, and it might be an election law issue. All right, and so that's the matter you referred over to Mr. Levy? Yes, I also referred it to a, 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 an appointee within the Civil Rights Division, um, Maureen Riordan. She um, later reported to me that nothing would be done on the matter and that they didn't want to hear it. And was, to your knowledge, uh, did you ever hear back from Mr. Levy? I did not. <clears throat> to your knowledge, did DOJ do anything to look into that matter? I know that Maureen texted to me that she had put in a request to interview the officer in charge, and to my recollection, may have been declined um, by leadership there whether that was Eric Dryband, who was the CRD chief at the time, or someone from the DAG or the AG's office, I'm not sure. All right, sir. Um, and what was your reaction to uh, the outcome well, of the bill? Well, I uh, was not surprised. Um, actually, a few days later, I did get an angry, I was told by my boss, who was the assistant to the president at the time, John McEntee, that a uh, he had fielded an angry phone call from the White House counsel um, that uh, someone was someone was mad about even even porting over this information for a look -see. Um So he was just alerting that to me. We kind of chuckled about it because you know I wasn't going to get fired over it. It was more like we both were sort of I guess the word is jaded. Um, kind of knew that they didn't have any interest um, through a variety of of other other matters that gave us that impression, um, and there was very little that we could do. So our job was merely we raised it, 
you know, someone declined it, got mad about it, and we move on. All right, sir. That's all the questions I have for you. No questions. Question. I have no questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Foster. We really appreciate your time. All right, thank you. Uh, at this point, I call Representative Matt Gates, who I believe is waiting. Letting him in now. I think this will be my last witness for the day. Think we're okay. talking about. Okay. Might run a little bit over. We'll see. Mr. Gates, can you hear us? Uh, I can hear you, yes. Okay, we still waiting to see your video. It looks like, there we go. See you now. Oh, thank you. Um, Representative Gates, can you hear me? I can. Um, I'm Meryl Hirsch, I'm the chair of this hearing committee, and I'm going to swear you in. Would you like to swear or affirm the truth of your testimony? I'll swear it. All right. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are going to give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Could you please state your full name for the record? Matthew Lewis Gates II. Thank you very much, Representative Gates. Uh, please proceed. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, Representative Gates, were you a member of Congress during the November 2020 presidential election? I was. And what part of the world do you represent as a member of Congress? Florida's first congressional district in the northwestern panhandle of Florida. And in your capacity as a member of Congress, uh, did you have occasion to uh, become aware of election integrity issues in the 2020 presidential election? Yes, in the summer of 2020, uh, as I was out and about kind of in Tallahassee, I continued to hear the persistent drumbeat that uh, supervisor of, uh, of elections in Leon County, I believe it was Ian Sancho, a Democrat, um, had uh, grave concerns about a political group that was started by Andrew Gillum, uh, having uh, been involved in the request of vote by mail ballots in the absence of actual human beings making those requests, but but instead um, that they were fraudulent. And that the, the talk was that Gillum would be in trouble because this, uh, this Leon County Supervisor of Elections had sought assistance from investigative authorities on this. Um, that's when, uh, that's when I, I learned that and I, I later confronted um, the U.S. Attorney Larry Keefe uh, about that point, but I, I can pause there if you have a more specific question. There and uh, do you happen to know Mr. Keefe personally? Yes, Mr. Keefe and I uh, practiced law at the same law firm in Fort Walton Beach, uh, and I was uh, I was uh, an advocate for his appointment as the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Florida. Would be fair to say that you two were friends, or was that too much? No, we we were indeed friends and former colleagues. All right, sir. And um, so you uh, confronted uh, Mr. Keefe about this? Yes, I, I said that I'd, I'd heard that that there was this um, concern on the part of of, I, or of the su supervisor of elections in Leon County, and I wanted to know kind of what the U.S. Attorney's Office and Department of Justice were doing proactively um, on the election integrity front. You know, we've been briefed many times in Congress about the importance of being proactive, um, whether it's election interference, election integrity issues, rather than being reactive. And so I, I saw it, you know, uh, really an understanding as to what was going on. And, and Mr. Mr. Keefe, you know, would not go into any detail about, um, uh, you know, uh, 
about any pending matter, but he said to me, uh, you know, in very clear terms that it was the attorney general, Bill Barr, who was standing in the way of resourcing investigations around election integrity, that uh, the Department of Justice was not able to be as proactive in uh, in the Northern District of Florida as Mr. Keefe wanted to be, because every time he saw it resourcing to develop evidence, track down leads, that Bill Barr himself was involved in, in prohibiting that work. And uh, did you have any similar exchanges uh, in the post-election period? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Yes, sir. Did you have any similar exchanges during the post-election period? Uh, I did, yeah. A after the election, um, you know, I was, I was frequently complaining when I heard Bill Barr in public statements assert that the election was that there was no fraud and that there was no um, real need for the Department of Justice to perform additional labor when I, in fact, knew that it was Barr who was in the way of that. And so I often complained to my colleagues on the floor of the House, uh, including Scott Perry and others, that <laughs> Bill Barr couldn't possibly be uh, truthful in what he was saying in the media because he was inhibiting the work that would disprove the statements that he was making, potentially. Uh, and you make public statements about that? Um, I, I made I, I know I I know I made statements about it a, a great deal to my uh, to my colleagues in Congress. I as I sit here now, I'm probably speaking uh, with more precision with you than than I did uh, publicly at the time. All right, sir. Uh, did you uh, take this issue up with any representatives of the Department of Justice? Either one of these two issues. Well, I, I took it up directly with President Trump. I, I told President Trump before the election that I was concerned that the attorney general was not allowing important investigative work to proceed. And I, I was hoping, frankly, that that President Trump would would kick Bill Barr in the ass and just it, get him to at least resource the investigations so we could determine whether or not there was a, was any threat to the election or any violation of federal criminal law rather than just limiting the ability to do factual development. And, and I, I can recall these three occasions when I made, made that plea um, directly to, to President Trump. All right, that's all the questions I have for you, Representative Gates. Thank you very much. No questions. Okay, you have no questions, Mr. No. Um, I, I have a question related that, um, that, that you shared the concern that Barr was not allowing important invest investigations to go forward. Uh, you related in that you earlier had a conversation with the U.S. attorney where he made that comment. Did you have any other information as to that? Uh, yeah. Let me give that. Let me give that thought. Um, <laughs> The, so I understand the question. The question is, was there anything else other than my conversations with the U.S. attorney that that served as the basis for my belief that Mr. Barr was was um, interfering with the normal factual development you would see in, in a matter like this? Was that your question? My question is that you related a conversation with the U.S. attorney that was uh, prior to the election period. That's he, correct. He related that Barr was standing in the way and not resourcing. Yes. He then said that you shared with a number of people, including then President Trump, that Barr was inhibiting the work. And my question is, was that based on the conversation with the U.S. Attorney? That's correct. Yes, it, it was. And that was the only basis. Um, well, I guess the other basis would be that I didn't see the work occurring, right? Um, it, it was my expectation upon, uh, you know, hearing uh, in and about kind of Florida political circles that, that the supervisor of elections had concerns regarding Andrew Gillum and then I, I didn't see that organization that Gillum 
was running subjected to any scrutiny. I didn't see them slowing down their efforts. And so I guess my own observations of the activity also served as a basis for my belief, but the principal basis was, was indeed my, my conversation with the U.S. Attorney. Thank you. Ms. Matthews? I do not have any questions, but I do want to thank you, Representative Gates, for your time. We really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Just one final thing. Did this stimulate any questions from, from anyone no, else? Me. I didn't want to tell them to go and then find out you wanted Mr. McDougal. Uh, I have no additional questions. All right. Um, okay. And I believe I heard that from Mr. Fox also. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much, Representative Gates. You're excused. Thank you. Okay, so we're remarkably close to five in the afternoon. Um, why don't we talk about some housekeeping things? Um, does that make sense? Oh, of course. All right. And what can we expect on Monday, uh, Mr. McDougall? Um, I have scrambled so much today to fill the day. Mr. That I, McDougall? <laughs> we're going to have object, you know, but. The, the Matthews objection up. number one. Okay. I need a shot call and I'm giving control to Ms. Matthews. Uh, I have scrambled so much today to fill the day that I cannot tell you exactly what my lineup is going to be Monday, but I will uh, get that squared away as soon as I'm able and I will let Mr. Fox know. But I believe we'll have witnesses to fill the day on Monday and uh, can go into Tuesday. Um, and we might be finished on Wednesday, but, uh, you know, but part of the uncertainty is the objections to my witnesses, I, so I don't know if they're going to fall off, uh, and so that's kind of what I'm struggling with, but I will do my best to uh, let Mr. Fox know who, who remains and roughly what the order was, and I want to thank Mr. Fox for indulging me today because there was some juggling. Uh, today in the order that I gave you yesterday. Okay. And when you do have a list, could you also file it so we, sure. we sure. the panel knows knows what to expect? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. All right. And the other thing I had asked you to do is if you're going to be calling experts, um, you know, I, I, you're arguing this is form, is the substance. Give a, you know, uh, give something that respond, that responds to Mr. Fox's concerns about identifying what the opinions were going to be expressed in the other elements of Rule 26 um, and pulls together what part of this you're presenting. And if there are parts that um, you know, you're not going to present and use as a proffer or something else that he knows what it is, he can expect to, to cross-examine about. I already had to do that from the prior order, you know, what? Okay. Are there additional things we ought to address right now? No, other than um, if, in fact, we're going to finish up on Wednesday, I think Wednesday today we may only have half a day, if I'm correct. Um, but if we are going to finish up on Wednesday, um, in the, the last several of these that I've tried, and this, I sit because I could speak into the mic, it's not... It's, it's 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 not my nature, and normally I get up. But uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm afraid Miss Matthews would uh, would have my head. Uh, the uh, I uh, uh, I think we ought to discuss how you want to conduct, if you want to conduct closing, and how you want to conduct closing. All right. The first question is: Are there going to be any rebuttal witnesses? Uh, uh, and I know that may not be possible to predict because you haven't heard all the testimony, but right. in a sense. At, at this point, I don't think so. Uh, somebody gave me a name, actually, uh, while uh, I was sitting here today, but I haven't looked into that. But uh, uh, at this point, I don't anticipate it. Okay. So, um, and this is a, a, a trickier question to ask, but it's an important one for scheduling. And let me sort of explain what I know you already know about the process, but just how we operate so people understand it. Okay. Our job at the close of testimony concerning potential violation, the, the, this is essentially a bifurcated proceeding. The parties are not supposed to put on whatever evidence they might want to put on on sanction until we make 
a preliminary non-binding, the rule says is determination, which is kind of a, uh, I always think of it as, as not really the right word. I mean, where's the, the process is that the panel recesses and under the rules will make an initial, do we think today at this point, recognizing we haven't even made our own decision yet and we don't make the final decision at the end of the day, um, a reason to think there's at least one violation at which point. And the reason for doing that is a protection for the, for the respondents in these types of proceedings because it doesn't, it, they don't have to simultaneously say, I didn't do anything wrong. And by the way, if I did, I shouldn't be punished very much. That those two are kind of a tension at each other and can be at extreme tension in each other if in circumstances where there's mitigation involving, you know, somebody was an alcoholic and that's the reason, which, you know, I don't have any reason to think that's this proceeding, but in other proceedings that can be very important. Um, so our process calls for that. And then in the event, we make that determination, that preliminary non-binding determination that we could change our mind on after we read the briefs, then there's a sanction phase and the parties could potentially put on evidence concerning sanctions or make arguments concerning sanctions. Um, we have talked a little bit about, okay, how to work that process here. I think we would all benefit when both sides have rested on the presentation of evidence concerning um, concerning potential violation, that we hear argument on whether there's a violation and hear from both sides about that before we recess to make that preliminary determination. So we've both felt, and obviously it depends a little bit on the timing when that happens, but that we will do that. Um, on the hypothetical that we do make the determination, is there any sense of how long a sanction proceeding would be so that we can just work that logic into scheduling, recognizing we haven't even reached the point of deciding what would be preliminary even when we decided it? But, uh, from my perspective, there's, we're, we're not going to have anything to do, uh, any testimony in the sanction phase. All right. So it's basically argument from your side? Right. And, 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 I mean, we can argue sanction uh, if you want, but my uh, practice in the past is generally, I mean, I haven't ever done this uh, that way. I've, the way I've always done it is we did the closing argument. The preliminary decision is either made or not made. If there's any evidence of sanction, it's offered, and then the discussion tends to be in briefs, but if you want argument on it. No, I, I think I probably would like some live argument on, on sanction. It would be very helpful to make sure the issues are joined in the briefs. Now, uh, are, would you anticipate uh, Mr. McDougal having evidence to present in, you know, in the scenario you don't want to have happen, but you prepare for whatever, in the event that we make a preliminary determination and you have the opportunity to put on evidence concerning sanction, would you anticipate calling witnesses and for how long? As of this particular minute, yes. Okay. Uh, any sense of how much time the witnesses would take? And I'm not going to ask you uh, who they are or exactly the subject. Uh, it would be less than a day, I believe, if I'm being I half a day, but that's very rough. Okay. Now, I appreciate it, and I appreciate that it's a necessity rough, but I appreciate that you, you've made the effort to do it. Okay. So I will keep that in mind. Um, if, if it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. Uh, if... if um, it would assist Mr. McDougall. Uh, I can tell you my general practice is not a written in blood promise, but my general practice is not to cross-examine character witnesses. Okay. Um, all right. So that helps us a little bit so far as the, the scheduling process at least gives us some orientation. If we get to it, we can understand it in the specifics of how much we set aside for this argument let's talk about it i think next week but at least you know it's coming so you can start preparing and figuring out uh, two two questions to make sure i know where we're going okay. uh, following argument on whether there's a violation the committee will recess and make a, a determination then and there about whether they believe there's a basis for a violation will we can we commence the other we will make a preliminary right. non-binding yeah. It's very difficult to misunderstand what this is, okay? Um, and and 
So I want to make it clear because it's very easy to misunderstand. And it's important because this affects, you know, how people perceive what decisions we've made concerning Mr. Clark. And I consider it extremely. OK, first of all, we don't make the final decision. We are going to issue a report and recommendation. That report will say, here's what we think the evidence showed. And here's what we think that means as to whether he violated the, the the, you know, whether the charge has been sustained, whether he committed the violations, and what we think the appropriate sanction would be if we do find that he violates it. It then goes to the board, and the board can say, while the board gives some deference to our factual, you know, that we've listened to the evidence, it can say, boy, you've got the law wrong, we think your sanction is completely wrong, we don't think this is a violation. It can say any number of things, and so it's not even a final a quote unquote, we don't make any final determination as a committee, we make a recommendation. Uh -oh. The other thing to understand is we don't even make our recommendation until we give you the opportunity to brief this, make arguments, and discuss it. And I can't profess, and you've heard me say, I haven't committed to memory all of the exhibits that have been offered. So some of the evidence isn't even stuff I've physically seen. So it has to be preliminary based on our sense. And it's fair game for people to say, well, when you look at all of this stuff, you, know, you might have preliminarily thought there was a violation, but, but there really isn't one, and that can happen too. So I don't want it to, to, to suggest that at that moment we recess and yes. that, that's the decision, okay? Right. And I, thank you. And uh, I, I knew that I misspoke in the yeah. way I asked the question, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> the, uh, what I'm what I'm curious about, uh, or trying to get clarified in my head, is the timing the sequence. Uh, once the argument is completed on the whether there's a violation, uh, does the committee then assess to consider its preliminary non body? Right. And then once that's made, depending on how it goes, do we then immediately commence? If, if we say we preliminarily determine that there's at least one violation, and that also doesn't mean that all of the charge violations right. are things we we might have preliminary determined, many of them we don't buy at all or whatever. In this case, there are two main ones, but you know, in some cases there are seven or something. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at that point, then we commence and, you okay. know, immediately thereafter, it could be the end of the day and it's tomorrow okay. that that happens, but that's the okay. that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay. And then my next question was going to be how long will we get for argument uh, in the uh, in first phase? Um, well, I, I wanted to get a sense of what people wanted. Um, I'd say that with some trepidation because I, you know, well, at least in the 18th century, these things could go for days. Oh, so. I, know. <laughs> I, I learned about that. That's like, oh, that's hard to believe. Yeah. Um, but, you know, do you have a sense of how much time you would want for closing both both the future? Fox, go first. Um, I always father, uh, follow my grandfather's uh, recommendation. He was a preacher. He said, no souls are saved after the first 10 minutes. Uh, I, uh, I'd probably be a little longer than that, but I, you know, uh, uh, one of the reasons I would, I, I can't fully respond to the question is that of recent, the closing arguments that I've participated in have been more like oral arguments in the sense that the, there's been a hot bench that yeah. asked me questions. And that, of course, that of course adds to it. And I was, it's a good point to raise. Okay. Yeah. The point of this is not uh, a lecture. Okay. You know, I'm anticipating we will have questions. Um, I will, you probably know, because you've heard this speech before in other, you know, other settings. Okay. I try very hard to ask questions I care about. Okay. I, I don't think any of us on the panel ask questions just for show or for some ulterior purpose. Yeah, the fact that I care about the answer to a question, don't read anything into it, okay? I mean, I care about the answer. I could care about it because I'm agreeing with you, but I want to understand the limits of it. I could care about it because I'm skeptical about what you're doing. But part of what I'm trying to do is give people the opportunity to address what I think matters and also, frankly, to focus the brief so you can hear where, where our head is at so that, that you can make the briefs both useful and joint because sometimes you don't do that and they're saying a b and c and you're arguing vociferously about x y and c and the question right. is what we are supposed to okay. do about 
all the letters in the middle. <laughs> um, and so, so the goal, I, you can expect we will be active at some level, we'll try to ask questions that we care about, and that obviously factors into the government. And so I'm going to guesstimate uh, that I would like to have between 30 and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all right. So, you know, obviously, you know, we start asking questions. I, I, I did have an argument that worked this way once, uh, where uh, DC Circuit, you prepare for an argument, and this case involved um, the Title VIII, the Fair Housing Act. Um, and one of the judges asked me, well, how would this work under Title VII? And Title VII was this, the, is the you know, employment discrimination. It was a statute passed four years before. And I'm trying to figure out while I'm standing there how this other statute operates, because I don't remember exactly how the yeah. matters work. Entire argument was spent discussing how the matters work under Title VII. So, so, you know, I know it's a problem. So, you know, if we start asking questions, this, I, I don't expect we're going to have, you know, a, a chess clock kind of thing or a, or a, you know, moment on this. We want to get the answers to our questions more than we want to hold you to a specific time. It just helps me understand the schedule to know, okay, that's, you're not expecting four hours. You're expecting this to be your basic base. Okay. Very good. Uh, that's what my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great weekend, and those of you who are celebrating, have a very happy Easter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.